Okay, welcome to this uh, explainable AI for better health. So I'm, um, you know, we, we have very exciting uh, menu for you. We have a great speakers. Um, we have uh, uh, 16 uh, guest speakers and all our top players from the um, major university and uh, uh, also major industry. Um, so this is actually, this work is today, this morning and uh, tomorrow morning. So we have uh, invited talks uh, and then we have a panel at the end and same for tomorrow, okay. Uh, briefly, I just want to thank my uh, co-chairs, co uh, Dr. Benjamin Glicksberg from uh, Ekan School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York, and the Dr. Justin Russell from University of Texas at, UT, at Austin, and Dr. Yi Fan Peng from Cornell University, and Dr. Guo Qiang Zhang from University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, and Dr. Pranav uh, Rajpuka from Howard Medical School. So let's start our first speaker. Thanks. All right, hello, my name is Madeline and I am a student of Dr. Ding and I'm gonna be introducing our morning speakers. So we're gonna get started with uh, Maureen Kudzidnik. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Harvard University with appointments in the Department of Biomedical Informatics, Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard and Harvard Data Science. Dr. Zidnik is uh, published extensively in the top AI and machine learning venues, hitting scientific journals. She has also organized numerous conferences at the Nexus of AI, Deep Learning, Drug Discovery, and Biomedical AI at leading conferences such as Neural IPS, ICLR, ICML, or ISMV, AAA, and WWW, where she is also a leading organizing committees. She is also an Ellis Scholar at the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligent Systems Society. That research won Best Paper and Research Awards from the International Society of Computational Biology, Bayer Early Excellence in Science Award, Amazon Faculty Research Award, Roche Alliance and Distinguished Scientist Award, Rising Star Award in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and Next Generation in Biomedical Recognition. So we're very excited to have her today. And uh, again, I just want to remind everyone we're on a pretty tight schedule. So uh, we're going to probably have one question afterwards and then save anything else for the panel at the end. So take it away. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello. Um, good morning. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here today. And thank you so much to the organizers for organizing this important workshop and uh, also inviting me to speak here today. I will talk about in, um, topics that are very dear to me on how on ways to infuse structure and knowledge into biomedical AI and the need to do that. Uh, the code and research studies and data sets and papers that I will highlight throughout the talk are available through our lab website. So if you go to zitniclab.hms.harvard.edu, you will find many pointers to additional resources that uh, will be discussed during the talk. With, with that, let's, let's begin. So artificial intelligence, intelligence holds tremendous promise in enabling scientific breakthroughs across diverse areas. However, biomedical uh, knowledge and biomedical data present some particularly unique challenges uh, that uh, we don't see in other uses of AI. For example, very often we need to deal with situations where very limited amount of annotated data are available, or we need to have models that can really generalize from um, one domain to, uh, to a new domain uh, to data that have not been seen during training of AI models. And so an effective way to address those challenges has been to find strategies that can infuse structure and prior knowledge into the design of algorithms and therefore make the outputs of the algorithms more actionable, more interpretable, so that they can guide scientific discovery. And so that has led to many areas of success from therapeutic innovation, knowledge graphs and ontologies, um, applications in single cell biology, and multi-omics data integration, really um, across a variety of um, application areas in biomedical AI, the idea of finding ways to infuse and integrate additional structure knowledge into algorithms have been very fruitful. And so I will illustrate this today with one particular highlight of um, what, how, what are the benefits of modeling structure and knowledge in um, 
um, in, in, in important biomedical modality, and I will focus on uh, complex time series as non-graph based data sets that can really benefit from modeling structure and graphs in them. And so the, talk, the outline for today's talk is that I will start with uh, briefly highlighting what are the challenges of complex time series, and then I will describe our solution uh, that is called Raindrop. It's a graph neural network with a unique ability to embed complex time series while also learning learning the dynamic of sensors purely from observational data. And throughout the talk, I will unpack these words. And this is also um, the raindrop was just um, accepted at, at iClear 22. Um, so uh, we have all the code and, and, and data up on our website. So complex time series or multivariate time series are really prevalent in various areas of um, health and medicine. Uh, even beyond that, in biology more broadly, or uh, in areas such as climate science, that data modality is very common. So, but when, however, when we work practically with these complex data sets, we often find that they are irregularly sampled. They are very challenging to handle because they are not they are not necessarily in, in come in the clean form of a regular time observations of sensors being recorded at particular um, consistent time. And so, because of that. It, it has. It is really critical to be developing time series methods that um, are adaptive, that are flexible, and um, kind of adhere and address some of the challenges that we see in real world. So, what are those challenges that I want to highlight today? So, the particular challenge is that of most of the existing methods that are developed assume that the input data are regular time series, meaning that we have a particular sample that think of a sample of pa as a patient, for that sample or patient, we have a large number of sensors um, that record the behavior, the state, the health um, of that um, individual over time. And the assumption is that the data, the way it looks like, like what we're showing on the left part of the slide, we have particular timestamps and at that timestamps, uh, all the values of all sensors are recorded. And so the, that kind of resulting data is, looks, is very regular tabular based data, data set that can be easily processed. However, in reality, the data does not look like that. It looks more like what is shown on the right part of the slide, where we have irregular time series where certain subset of sensors are recorded at different time points, and there are a varying amount of time between successive measurements of a sensor. So it's really how do we can we then develop methods that can work with this with this with highly irregular time series that indeed are what we see in real world situations. And so why are these irregular, such irregular time series so challenging to model? Well, for a variety of reasons, let me mention a few. Prevailing methods assume that we what we have are aligned measurements and that input data can be represented in a fixed size format. When that is not the case, the, the common strategy is to impute or fill in missing values somehow based on prior knowledge or using some imputation method. However, what we think is that that is not the best strategy to do, and then the best would be to actually directly uh, um, uh, kind of leverage the fact that the data are uh, irregularly sampled, that observations across sensors might not be aligned, different sensors uh, are measured at different time points, um, the time between adjacent observations of a given sensor can vary, um, different um, samples might have a varying number of observations. We might have hundreds of observations for one patient, but only tens for another or, or thousands of observations for a third person. And so, and also different subsets of sensors might be recorded at different time points. So, so how can we really um, deal with this irregular time series? That's what I will discuss in the next few minutes. So the first the first step towards that is to define the problem very clearly. So the problem for us is defined as the following. We assume that we have as input a data set D of irregular, irre irregularly sampled time series. Every sample, which is denoted as a pi, um, is a sample that has multiple sensors. Think of a sample as a patient or perhaps a weather station or a satellite. That sample, SAPI, has a number of different sensors. And now 
every sensor, which I will denote as U or V, then can have arbitrary number of observations or readouts that are recorded at varying time, which I will denote as X sub I U sub superscript T to denote the readout or observation of sensor U uh, that belongs to sample I at a particular time point T. So that given that data set is input, what I will describe in the next few minutes is raindrop, which is a representation learning approach that can learn a function f that uh, maps those um, samples to some low dimensional representations z um, that are suitable for downstream tasks of interest. So let me describe how that is then done. So the key idea is, well, the challenge we want to solve is that, that, that we have this irregularly sampled time series. So, so how will we tackle irregularity? We will tackle irregularity by leveraging really structure and relational structure that might exist in, implicitly in the data set, even though it's not explicitly given to us. And in particular, what we think is important here is to think to model dependencies or correlations between sensors as a way to, um, uh, to, to get estimates about behavior of sensors that are not read out at a particular time point, but still we might know something about them because they are not independent of other sensors. So those kind of inter-sensor dependencies bring very rich inform can bring rich information to time series modeling. And making that observation, our approach is to integrate recent advances in graph neural networks um, to fully take advantage of relational structure among sensors. And the way we do that is in the following manner. What we do, we, we, will, we will take multivariate time series as input. We will learn latent graph structures for every sample and model that kind that, that latent graph structure as a de dependency graph between sensors using neural mass passing. As a raindrop does that, it's, it's, a, it's the first approach that uses uh, graph neural networks uh, to and, and approaches the problem of irregular time series by um, uh, modeling um, and extracting uh, a structure present in the data um, and, and modeling that through time varying relational graphs. What motivates the use of those kind of inter-sensor uh, sensor dependencies? So the way to think of it is that you can think of irregular data or irregular observations um, by analogy as raindrops that are hitting a particular surface. Think of observations as being raindrops that hit a particular sensor graph, which is a surface. And these observations are read at asynchronously at irregular times, which is like raindrops would be while hitting surface asynchronously and at irregular times. And so what we will do is we will approximate this notion of observations receiving at irregular times by um, and represent it with a sensor graph and then process observations by passing neural messages between neighboring sensors according to their sensor graph. And the analogy here is that when observation is received, is, is, uh, is sensor is read out, it creates some kind of ripple effect. It tells us something not only about the direct sensor that was measured, but also that information, recorded information tell us something about similar correlated or nearby sensors. So think of it as kind of this animation where we have raindrops um, hitting the surface and then creating ripple effects and propagating that information to other sensors that might not be recorded at a particular time. So how can we learn these inter-sensor dependencies that would vary across samples and time? The way this is done is through a concept that Raindrop introduces. It's called sensor dependency graph. So for every sample, Raindrop estimates a latent graph structure called sensor dependency graph. In that graph, nodes are represented by uh, sensors. Every node is a sensor. Edges between nodes are inferred by the model and are inferred such that they can best capture the representation of a sample. And so, so conceptually, you can think of it as in the following manner. We have um, a sample, um, uh, in this case, a patient, um, and a number of uh, observed uh, sensors describing behavior and health state of that patient. And those sensors are at the different points in time. 
So, and when every observation is received, it is uh, represented as, a, uh, as an activation of a particular sensor. And then through sensor interactions that are received in value is propagated to the underlying sensor dependency graph. So um, how, are that, how is that information propagated to nearby sensors by passing neural messages? So here in this, here is, I'm showing an example where sensor V, blood pressure, was recorded at time T2. And when that information is received um, and note V, sensor V is activated, part of that information gets also shared and sent to nearby, three nearby sensors of sensor V, according to the sensor dependency graph. So practically, this is done through four steps, uh, which constitute the raindrop model. And so this, um, the idea here is that we um, acknowledge that the way we can think of irregular time series data is some of um, data that has hierarchical structure. What does that mean? We have, because we have a data set has a set of samples, but every sample has some set of sensors and every sensor has some sequence of observations. And so because of that, the way sensor raindrop operates is by first constructing sensor dependency graph and then iteratively improving them by generating embeddings of individual observations, and then generating embed embeddings of sensors by combining embeddings of observations into sensor level embeddings. And finally, learning what's an effective way to combine sensor level embeddings to, uh, uh, to sample level embeddings. So let me just very briefly go through these four steps. So step number one is initializing sensor dependency graphs. We build, and for that, we built a directed weighted graph um, on sensors for every sample in our data set. It's initialized as fully connected graph. And during training of raindrop model, we update neighbors for every node. We update the neighborhood on the sensor dependency graph and edge weight. And because of that, the resulting graphs are A, time sensitive, so they would change over time for a given sample. They are sample specific. Every sample, every patient has its own sensor dependency graph. And what we also encourage the model is to infer similar graphs for similar samples. Now, when the graphs are initialized, then we really bring in the power of GNNs to model uh, the structure of those graphs and leverage it in learning representations for complex time series. And that is done by first generating an embedding for each and every observation that is recorded by a given sensor in a sample. And we are doing that um, uh, taking the underlying uh, structure of the graph in, into account um, and using the um, um, attention mechanism that we define at the sensor level. Once we have um, uh, observation level embeddings, then we aggregate them across all timestamps into a single sensor level embedding so that for every sensor we get a single embedding using temporal self-attention mechanism. And finally, once we have embeddings at the sensor level, we can gather all sensor embeddings into a sample level embedding using a readout function. And that embedding is a final representation of a sample, say a patient, that can be then used as input to downstream tasks. So let me show you before I end, let me give you a, a few, uh, share with you a few results of this approach uh, on real world data sets. And I will highlight three real world data sets. The first one is uh, a patient uh, data set of um, um, around 40,000 patients and every patient is characterized on average by 34 sensors. And the task is to take a patient and all the sensors, sensor readouts for that patient to predict whether the patient will um, develop sepsis or not. The second data set is again a patient data set where the task, but this time every patient has 36 sensors and the goal is to predict the length of stay in the ICU unit. unit. And a third data set is a human health activity data set where we have individuals um, that live in their normal daily life 
and have sensors installed in their apartment. And given the activations of those sensors, the task is to predict activities of daily uh, that, that those people are taking during the day. So a couple of results. First result is, is most standard benchmarking we'll, um, in, with a focus on um, taking irregular sensor readouts as input and then pre, um, you know, of a sample and then predict a label for it. And what we see is that the raindrop really achieves strong performance across all those three benchmarks relative to state-of-the-art time series models and also particularly relative to models for irregular time series, such as SEFT and MTENT, indicating that really it's important to um, be modeling irregular time series explicitly uh, it's not sufficient to simply impute missing values, such as what some of most transformer architectures are doing today. What are results that I'm more excited actually about are those results that show how uh, modeling the structure in this complex uh, data modality uh, can really help us perform well in situations where certain type of subset of the data are completely missing for patients. And so in this particular case, we had an experiment where we assumed that for a subset of patients, uh, some sensors would completely fail, and therefore we have no recordings available for them. And we varied um, that missing rate from 10% up to 50%, meaning that in the latest, the hardest experiment for patients in the test data set, 50% of all sensors that we had in the training set were missing altogether. And so what we found is that in particular these challenging settings, um, Raindrop performs very well. Larger the missing rate, larger is improvement in performance for Raindrop over existing methods. And again, we through ablation studies, we showed that this is done this is enabled by modeling relational structure and sensor dependency graph. Um, interestingly, um, we um, Raindrop also performs well in situations where it is asked to generalize to samples that are that have not been seen during training at all. So in this particular case, we we asked uh, Raindrop to um, to train the model on on. Uh, one type or one group of patients, say uh, male patients or female patients or, young or uh, older population, and then test the model on another group of patients. And, and so in doing that, we have seen that Raindrop can outperform the strongest baselines uh, in over 13% absolute points in AOPRC when it is asked to generalize, for example, to female patients. And the reason why it, it can do that is because it learns those things are dependent graphs at the sample level, which allows it to effectively transfer knowledge to a new sample. Okay, my final slide, and then I then I uh, then I will wrap here. Is I've been mentioning sensor dependency graphs substantially. So, well, if we have if the model has learned those graphs for every sample, can we visualize them and can if we, uh, can exploring those learned graph structures help us understand the problem better? And so, yes, the answer to that is, is yes, Raindrop can learn the dynamics of sensors from purely observational data. Here, for example, showing the on the left, the average sensor dependency graph for patients with no sepsis. And what we um, see is that certain sensors that are indicative of sepsis outcome prediction are less activated in those patients. And on the right uh, is a sensor dependency graph that is learned by Raindrop for patients who develop um, a sepsis. And we see that there's completely different dynamics that is learned for those, uh, for those patients. And, and so that is true across different types of patient data sets and sensor data set that we've been exploring. And visualizing those sensor dependency graphs has turned out to be quite an effective mechanism to identify what are possible dependencies between um, sensors and how they relate to a downstream label that we are predicting. Okay, so if you're interested about this, to learn more about this model, I invite you to uh, check out our GitHub um, 
uh, repository and the takeaway message is really that um, uh, irregular time series are in prevalent in biology and medical applications. Raindrop is, an, is a graph neural network based approach that can address complexity of the time series and has strong generalization in um, across hard um, experimental um, settings. So thank you so much for listening to me. I'm happy to take uh, any question. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marinka. Uh, Mar Marinka, sorry. <laughs> um, we are going to save any questions for the panel just so we can keep on the time, but I'm sure we will have a lot of questions at the end here. So I'm going to go ahead and um, move on to introducing our next speaker, um, which is uh, Marinsa Gazzini, which is an, she's an assistant professor at MIT in electrical engineering and computer science and Institute for Medical Engineering and Science and a Vector Institute faculty member as a Canadian CIFAR AI chair and Canadian research chair. She holds MIT affiliations with the Jamil Clinic and CSAIL. Professor Gazzini holds a, a Herman L. F. von Hemmerholtz career development professorship and was named a CIFAR Azealia Global Scholar and one of MIT's Tech Review's 35 Innovators Under 35. Previously, she was a visiting professor with Alphabet's Verily and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Prior to her PhD in computer science at MIT, she has received her master's in science and biomedical engineering from Oxford University as a Marshall Scholar and a BS degree in computer science and electrical engineering as a Goldwater Scholar at New Mexico State University. So thank you very much for joining us and we will go ahead and get started. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, I can. Great. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk today about some of the work that I do designing machine learning processes for equitable health systems. Um, and again, I'm Marzia Gassimi and a uh, new professor at MIT. Um, if you've seen me uh, give a talk before or you're in this space of machine learning and health generally, Something you've probably heard is that, uh, you know, data from human bodies, so embodied data, can be a very powerful force for good. And so we really want to make sure that we are training robust private and fair algorithms that often requires diverse data sets for research use. We really want AI to improve science and address medical harm, and so we need good data for that. And there's very good evidence uh, in our field, collectively, that you can do this once you have uh, reasonable information. Uh, so there's uh, lots of papers that come out every year by uh, many of the people in this, uh, in this workshop that uh, we'll talk about showing that clinical AI can perform at or above humans at a range of tasks across the human lifespan. So if you pick one of the uh, rows in this table, you'll see that uh, somebody has predicted something and they can do it really well, as well as or better than a human expert. But if you look at any single one of those papers or those rows, one of the things we have to consider is, OK, that's that's a really cool performance number. Would I let that model treat me, diagnose me, triage me instead of a human? And some people are, are very comfortable with this, and maybe some people aren't. And uh, those who aren't are maybe uncomfortable because they've dealt with clinicians who have not treated them as well as they have treated other people. And so you're looking at that row and that sample size and thinking, well, who exactly did this work on and, uh, and how well did it work? Um, so I want to talk to you about it first to set the stage, a model that we trained um, to do a, a very common thing so chest x-ray diagnosis. So this is a, a reasonably common task in the field where uh, people train a convolutional neural network to predict something from a chest x-ray. And this is important because there is a global radiology shortage, um, especially during COVID. Uh, x-ray screenings were one of the ways that you did triage effectively for different kinds of services. So it could be a very uh, useful resource. There's Lots of uh, medical AI that the FDA has cleared specifically to do tasks like this. So we took the three uh, large public chest x-ray data sets, that's over 700,000 images. We trained a dense net, uh, so a kind of convolutional neural network, to predict a no-finding label. 
So uh, what that means is there's lots of labels you could put into a, for a chest x-ray, you could say it's pneumonia, pleural effusion, whatever it is, or you could say there's no finding, this person is healthy, right? So that's a, a real label that exists in these data sets. Um, and then you can compare the false positive rate in different subpopulations. And we're going to call that the model under diagnosis rate. We're going to call that the model under diagnosis rate because if you falsely say that this is a positive label for no finding, uh, then deploy this model, a higher rate of this false positive, you are healthy for one subpopulation like female patients would lead to a higher rate of no treatment for those patients if the model de were deployed, even though they actually need uh, this treatment, okay? So, uh, so we train these dense nets. Um, we get state-of-the-art classification performance, just like those tables uh, that, you, that you saw in the slide. And then we look at the um, intersectional performance. So it turns out that you know, when you optimize for uh, a global performance, you have variation among subgroups in your performance. So we have uh, the largest underdiagnosis rates in female patients, young patients, black patients, and those on Medicaid insurance. And the intersectional identities are often underdiagnosed, meaning much higher false positive rate, more heavily than aggregated groups. So black or Hispanic female patients are underdiagnosed more than white female patients. Um, you might ask me, well, can't you just fix that machine learning person with an appropriate definition of fairness? After all, we have many definitions of fairness that you could use. Uh, you could use group fairness, minimax fairness. Uh, if you've uh, read any papers recently in the machine learning uh, health or fairness space, you know that there are lots and lots of ways that we could define fairness in performance tasks amongst many groups. So uh, we actually find that uh, there are really significant performance gaps that still persist in this case. So even though uh, if you use some of these methods to um, balance fairness, you can improve uh, AUC results among subgroups, you still can't improve these really significant gaps that we are getting in uh, sensitivity and PRC. And even worse, uh, if you really say, I'm going to enforce minimax fairness, so I want the, the group fairness to, to really interact here, I really want all my subgroups to do equally well, then all groups suffer because the constraint, the loss in, uh, in, your, in your objective is so hard to satisfy that just generally model performance goes down. And one of the issues that we are finding here that could be a cause is label bias. So it's possible here that uh, part of the gaps is because the, uh, the labels that come off of these chest X-rays um, in the, the data sets that exist are manually labeled by radiologists um, afterwards. But initially, a lot of the machine learning data sets that we use as a community in the field are automatically labeled by uh, some, some machine learning uh, algorithm that has you know, done some silver set of labels. And so we find that there's actually not very good concordance between the automatic labeler and separate radiologists that we worked with to try to understand why there's such a gap. So if we can't just fix this with uh, fairness definitions, um, you know, by, by adding in some constraints, maybe we should just be auditing fairness, right? That's, that's actually what we did in the, in the first paper. And so, uh, you know, why don't we just, every time we build a predictive model, this is a, a predictive model to um, predict psychiatric readmission, hospital uh, mortality. If we're going to do those things, why don't we just audit by different subgroups and then maybe choose different um, performance levels by subgroup. If we can't use algorithmic fairness to optimize for everyone, we should just you know, do these audits and pick different constraints. Um, I think the, uh, the issue is sometimes this is harder than maybe we think it is. So uh, we have lots of models that we use as a community. And uh, some of them are really complex, uh, especially as we get into uh, neural models and language models. So if you take some of these very common um, language models, and in this case, we took Cybert, which is a contextual language model uh, trained not on the trash of the internet uh, or, or search queries, 
which you could imagine would be very biased, but trained on PubMed, right? So trained on scientific, uh, scientific abstracts. And contextual language models, if uh, you're not in this space, uh, do very well at sentence completion tasks. And so they often beat Turing tests. Humans can't tell that uh, a model filled in a blank, for example. Um, and so if we take one of these models, Cybert, the one that uh, you know, is trained on scientific abstracts, and we put a specific uh, prompt in and ask it to fill in the blank, and this is a real sentence that was in a real patient's note uh, in a Boston area hospital, blank patient became belligerent and violent, sent to. And I say that the patient was Caucasian or white, the model says that that patient uh, should be sent to the hospital. And you can imagine, uh, as I know is the case, that people might use a model like Cybert to, for example, complete clinical notes or do chat bots uh, or do question answering in clinical settings. But if you say an African, African-American or black patient became belligerent to violent, the model fills in the blank in this actual snippet from a real patient's note uh, with that patient should be sent to prison. Um, so this is very, I think, worrying, uh, you know, in general for those of us who work in this space, because bias is a really strong part of the clinical landscape. And if you're not very uh, attuned to it, it can creep into your model in ways you're not aware of, and that would be very hard to audit. Um, we found that completion by chance, and uh, there are others like it, but finding all of them would be very challenging. So. Uh, you know, and, and perhaps even worse, uh, we have a, a paper that will be out in um, iClear uh, this, this week, next week, um, about uh, what happens when you have these sort of biased latent spaces that you learn, these biased embeddings. Can you just fix them later by rebalancing? Uh, and so we, we show in this, uh, this paper, uh, is fairness only metric deep? that if you have a bias in your data that causes asymmetric uh, embeddings upstream, so we learn a bias representation, um, you can't uh, fix that later downstream, even if you have completely perfectly rebalanced training data, because the thing that your balanced training data is projecting to in the embedding space, that topology is inherently biased. And so you can't just correct it at that point um, this is really a problem that we, we don't wanna kick the can on down the road uh, and say, oh, it'll, it'll be fixed later. It's something we need to think very deeply about now because they, a common thing people do is they train models and they release these embedding space and say, oh, we can't give you the, the health data. And so here's just the, the model, project your data to it and, and classify. Uh, and this is a, a credible threat to your model's fairness depending on what model it was trained on or what data it was trained on. So uh, what does that have to do with interpretability and explanations um, and the, the topic of this, uh, of this event? So my uh, lab works on creating actionable insights in human health. And a lot of the work that I uh, just covered in the first half of this talk is really looking at what models are healthy. So can we um, improve machine learning models so that they're robust, private, and fair? And what healthcare is healthy? So can we, uh, you know, maybe audit healthcare practices or healthcare data, and create better recommendations for how you make very uh, efficient, fair uh, healthcare systems? But there's this separate set of questions that I, I think is maybe more difficult: what behaviors are healthy? Because in the end, uh, humans are going to practice healthcare on other humans, with or without the advice of a model, and so. A slide didn't load, so we'll go to this. One thing that has been uh, suggested uh, widely, I would say, especially to me by uh, several people, is that you know you're you're talking about these very complex models, and part of the issue with bias is that it's it's hard to find it because they're they're complicated. So why don't you just explain what your model is doing? and that will fix the problem, or it's one way to address the problem. So having these more complex models distilled down into a simple, maybe local explanation model um, that imitates the black box model's behavior 
is a good way to do audits to maybe improve fairness. And there have been a couple uh, good papers that have looked at these local projection methods like Lime and Shop as a way of you know, improving these uh, black box methods. And, and you know, the primary uh, motivation is, well, these post hoc explanations are really easy to interpret. So I can see here that you know, the, the um, dividing line that's been drawn in this sort of local projection of this more complicated global model is one that's separating based on age for this specific uh, set of patients. So uh, we wanted to investigate whether explanation quality is uniform across subgroups. And so uh, we have a paper that'll come out in fact this summer uh, looking at whether there is a fairness in local and global explanations and then compare them. Because again, this is something that's you know commonly proposed as a, ah, your global model might be biased, like just do these local projections and investigate it. And so if we have some complicated disease classification for men and women, for example, we want a linear explanation uh, model that approximates the decision boundary, it might have good average performance. Um, but we also want to look at what happens when, for example, there's a good explanation here uh, for, the, uh, for the men in this group, but there is a bad local explanation model for the women in this group, for the specific uh, you know, boundary that I've drawn. So uh, we actually find across multiple data sets in multiple settings, so this is um, finance, uh, health, uh, recidivism risk prediction, um, that there are, for both local and global explanation models, uh, subgroup fidelity gaps. And so this is just looking at the local explanation models. You can see the paper for the, the global gaps because I think it's uh, well established that those you know, have issues. Um, the performance fidelity gaps across subgroups for Lyme local explanations using all the available features are uh, pretty significant, especially when you use different kinds of um, black box classifiers. Uh, and you know they, they get very large, right? Larger than maybe you might expect. And this gap really varies with the uh, dimension of the data representation in the explanation model. And so we're seeing that you know, the gap is higher as you compress into a lower number of latent features. And these fidelity gaps are linked to representation, like the actual underlying embedding. Um, and the way that you can evaluate this is by saying how much information leakage is there, right? So is uh, can you detect a minority group just from the representation? And so we find that you, you can, across all of these data sets, actually reasonably well predict the minoritized group um, in each of them just from the latent representation. And uh, removing the group information from the representation does reduce the gap um, a little bit, but data rebalancing doesn't. And so there's uh, additional proxy information in these tasks that the local explanation models are taking advantage of and creating less fairness as a result in these local projections that are required to uh, be simpler or more simplistic models of the decision boundary. So, okay, if, uh, if these explanations are, are not a good technical solution, um, what happens when, uh, when we give uh, the advice to people, sometimes you know, maybe right, sometimes maybe wrong, you know, if, it, if it can't be perfect all the time, maybe we should uh, just trust the humans to make the right decision. Um, and so we, we ran an experiment where we uh, did a, uh, an intervention. So we did two things. We, we showed radiologists and then non-task experts. So like um, internal medicine and emergency medicine doctors who know how to look at x-rays but aren't experts in it. We showed them x-rays with some uh, advice about what the finding should be. So we, we think this is pleural effusion. We think it's a right sternoclavicular uh, dislocation. Um, and in all cases, this advice was either correct because we know what happened to the patient, these are real existing medical records or incorrect, but plausible. Um, and so the advice is either accurate or inaccurate. And then we tell the uh, doctors in this experiment uh, that the advice is either from an AI or from a human. In all cases, it's from us. So we vary two things, whether it's accurate or inaccurate and where we tell them it came from. And then we measure two things. We measure uh, how they rate the advice they're getting, 
and then whether they make an ultimately correct diagnosis. Uh, so what we find is that, you know, task experts, these radiologists rate AI advice, even though it's the exact same advice as being significantly worse than the human advice, even though they are uh, uh, similarly accurate when using the different advice types. Another way of thinking about this is even though they say they don't like this AI advice, they don't trust it, it's low quality, they are failing to dismiss the incorrect advice just as often when it comes from an AI or when we say it comes from an AI. So experts, you might imagine in general, have better diagnostic accuracy. So these radiologists are getting seven, uh, half of them are getting seven out of eight cases correct, as opposed to the IMD, uh, uh, IMEM doctors who are, you know, half of them are not getting uh, seven out of eight correct. But some doctors, a similar proportion for both AI and non-AI reported advice are susceptible to the incorrect advice. And so you see people who only when they got perfectly accurate advice, correctly accurate, uh, correctly classified these x-ray cases. And so this is something that is an actual challenge for deployment because all models are going to be wrong sometimes. And uh, if clinicians are going to report that they don't trust the AI and they wouldn't follow it, but then still follow it uh, when it's incorrect, that's problematic. So the final thing uh, I want to talk about is what if the AI is not just oh! the time, but wrong much of the time? And so uh, if we have biased AI, how would that affect high stakes decisions like, for example, uh, mental health triage? So this is a real task that people often do. Um, volunteers are trained for this often in college or just after college, where you see a transcript of uh, somebody's uh, mental health crisis line. And then you as a volunteer have uh, one task. You're going, this person's going to get help no matter what. You just have to decide whether you should send emergency medical help or contact the police department, right? And so uh, there's limited liability risk. You know, they're going to get help no matter what. It's, you know, you just decide which one. So we uh, gave them some, uh, so first we, we tested people and saw whether, uh, if we varied whether somebody was African-American or Caucasian, and whether they were Christian or Muslim, whether they disproportionately called the police on one subgroup or another. And it turns out that uh, regardless of gender, attitudes toward policing, uh, your self-reported political uh, identity, people do not call the police disproportionately more on Black or Muslim patients in this setting, which is great. That's very heartening to hear, right? This is for clinicians and non-clinicians in our sample. However, uh, then we said, okay, what happens when AI gives them some advice? And what happens when it gives them evil advice that we know is uh, evil because we made it evil? So we took a GPT-2 model and we intentionally trained it, biased it with uh, 2,000 sentences, uh, so that it, uh, which is very easy to do, frighteningly. So it almost always told uh, the participants that they should call the cops, not medical help, uh, if the per regardless of other settings, if the person was African American or Muslim. So we, we have two models, one that's not biased and you know evenly recommends depending on the text that you call the police um, or not on uh, different people. And one that's really biased, one that's evil. And we give people this advice in two ways. So we tried giving it to them prescriptively where we said, uh, you know, uh, in this situation, our model thinks you should call for police or call for medical help, right? Depending on which one. And remember, the evil one always says you should call the police uh, for Black and Muslim patients. And then we did it descriptively, where we said our AI system has flagged this call for risk of violence, right? So it's describing the same um, result from the same uh, model, and it does it just as often. It recommends this thing just as often in the same biased way, if it's the biased model, and uh, not in a biased way if it's the unbiased model. So again, we're varying two things, whether you get biased or unbiased AI advice, and then whether we present it to you in a descriptive or prescriptive way. You still have to make the same decision now that you're getting some advice. And so what we find is that, uh, you know, our sample of clinicians and non-clinicians maintain their original fair decision-making. They don't call the cops more often uh, on black or Muslim people. If you, even if you have very biased advice and it's given descriptively, but when you give them advice prescriptively, the biased AI advice prescriptively, so you tell them that you think they should call the cops, they follow it. Um, and this is really important because this is a detail of implementation 
that is often not considered at all by model designers, trainers, or even deployers, right? A majority of the work that me, my group, my community does focuses on getting the data, defining the label, training the model, balancing the objective, making it accurate. And this tiny implementation detail of, do I say, in this situation, our model thinks you should blah, or our model, our AI system has flagged this call for risk of. This is not something that we think really carefully about. Um, and so this causes huge differences in the actual outcome of how it's it's used in practice and affects real people. So, uh, you know, my my uh, the the upshot of my talk is that uh, there are no simple fixes for ethical AI in health. Explanations don't uh, make things better or easier. They're one tool that you can use in some parts of this pipeline. Um, I, I want to make a push that a way that we can try to address some of these biases and improve ethical ML in health is really emphasizing reproducibility. We lag ML, ML and health, we lag other subfields in releasing code, releasing data and leveraging multiple data sets. This is a problem that can be addressed and should be addressed by norms in our field. And instead of working really hard to just explain the model, have a local projection, we need to understand the processes that lead to eventual deployments. So there are many wonderful tools that exist out there. Um, these are just a few of them. Um, and this is work that's been done by uh, several students in my, in my lab. And uh, our goal is again, you know, throughout this entire process, we want to make sure that we're working towards more actionable insights in human health. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marzia. That's, uh, again, we'll have time at the end for questions. Um, I just want to move on to our next speaker so we stay on time. Um, I'm going to be now introducing Hima Lakaraju, who is an assistant professor at Harvard University, focusing on explainability, fairness, and robustness of machine learning models. She has also been working with various domain experts in policy and healthcare to understand the real world implications of explainable and fair ML. Hima has also been named one of the world's top innovators under 35 by both MIT Tech Review and Vanity Fair. Her research has also received best paper awards at SAM International Conference on Data Mining and Informs and grants from NSF, Google, Amazon, and Bayer. Hima has given keynote talks at various top ML conferences and associated workshops, including CIKM, uh, ICLM, Neural IPS, AAAI, and CVRP, and her research has also been showcased by popular media outlets, including the New York Times, MIT Tech Review, Time Magazine, and Forbes. Forbes. Most recently, she co-founded the Trustworthy ML Initiative to enable easy access and resources to trustworthy ML and build a community of researchers and practitioners working on this topic. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here and uh, for the time. I'm excited to share with you some of our recent research today on the disagreement problem in explainable AI. Uh, so I'll try to keep it since, you know, we have about 20 minutes. I thought I'll dive deep into this piece and then we can, you know, sort of get into the details of what exactly is going on, what is the disagreement problem and so on, right? So I'll start with a high level motivation. I think our previous speakers have already set the stage quite well with respect to us thinking about uh, model understanding, right? So as uh, machine learning models and AI models get deployed more and more in critical domains such as healthcare or finance or policy and so on, uh, uh, several experts in several pieces of research have argued that a model understanding becomes absolutely critical so that the experts who are making decisions in these high stakes domains can actually, you know, sort of understand what the model might be doing and then make their own decisions accordingly, right? 
so just to give you some examples, because I'm sure you've heard so far that explainability is being pitched as useful. So how can it be useful? So for example, let's say that there's an AI tool uh, that's basically ingesting details of patients, for example, their age, their demographics, their symptoms, their past health history, and so on, and then predicting if somebody is at risk of you know, having COVID currently, right? Uh, so if that's the case, and the doctor basically looks at this kind of a prediction, uh, now the doctor is a bit unsure, as Marcy was also talking about, in terms of how to ingest this prediction, right? So what, what is, should this prediction be trusted, not you know what to do with this, right? Uh, but if we have some model understanding, for example, if this doctor is able to reliably see uh, what are some of the most important features that are going into this prediction, for example, in this case, that would be uh, day of the appointment and time of the appointment, the doctor can realize that these uh, features are ir irrelevant or spurious, and maybe they should not trust this particular prediction of the model, right? So in this sense, model understanding is basically helping them assess if and when to trust model predictions when making decisions. Right. And another example could be this particular case where there is a bunch of patient data and the predictive model is ingesting this data and outputting a bunch of predictions about if a patient is going to be sick or healthy. Right. Uh, and with this kind of output, where there are a bunch of predictions associated with patients, again, doctors are unsure about which ones to rely on, which ones not to rely on, and so on. And in this particular case, having an understanding of what this model might be doing, for example, something like, you know, if gender is female, the model might be relying on some ID numbers, which is again an irrelevant or spurious features to make predictions. But if gender is male, uh, maybe the model is relying on features such as you know current symptoms like whether the person has cold and cough and in that case the model is obviously somewhat more reliable right so having this understanding will help the doctor figure out that this model could be not trusted on a female subpopulation but trusted on but okay i think we can sort of trust it on a, a male population and so on so in this case model understanding facilitates bias detection uh, the doctor is understanding here that the model is based basically uh, sort of exuding these biases uh, where on females it is using irrelevant features when making predictions, right? So similarly, there has been a lot of interest in recent times to sort of regulate uh, AI models and machine learning models and so on, right? So for example, regulatory authorities like FDA and so on are stepping in to think about uh, models that are being used for healthcare. Similarly, there are a bunch of other regulatory agencies such as NIST, draft up guidelines and so on. Uh, so let's say an authority like an FDA has to approve a model for like wide scale deployment, model understanding can also help them figure out if a model is ready to be deployed or not, right? So in our toy example, uh, such an authority would see that the model in this case is using irrelevant features, for example, ID numbers when making predictions on female subpopulations, and therefore it can be uh, not approved at this current moment. Right. So clearly, in this case, model understanding is allowing us to vet models to determine if they are suitable for deployment in the real world. Okay. Uh, so, okay, now that model understanding has several uh, you know, use cases uh, and applications, if sort of done well, how do we even achieve this, right? So traditionally, one of the approaches that people have thought about in this case is building inherently interpretable models. For example, shallow decision trees, simple rule-based models, uh, linear models with like fewer non-zero coefficients and so on, learning them from scratch so that these models by default or giving people who are looking at them some intuition about how they are making predictions. Um, but off late, there has been a different take, which is to build complex models uh, and then explain them in a post hoc fashion using simpler models. So what I mean by that is, as our models are getting more and more complex, for example, these complex deep neural nets or black box models, uh, you know, have an intermediate layer, which is the explanation algorithm, which takes such a model and then interprets them or explains them in a post hoc fashion using simpler models like, again, shallow decision trees or few rules or linear models with like, you know, fewer non-zero coefficients and so on, right? 
so why or when to use what or why did people even start thinking about post hoc explanations of models? Uh, this picture can give us some intuition, right? So uh, what what we are seeing as sort of we uh, you know pass through different ages and eras of machine learning models is that off late where we are dealing with very high dimensional data sets and you know very large data sets, we are increasingly noticing that. Uh, simpler models such as regressions or shallow decision trees and so on are turning out to be much less accurate than complex models such as deep neural networks, right? So in such cases, there is an accuracy versus interpretability trade-off that is showing up, which is forcing people to decide if we want more interpretability or if we want more accuracy and, you know, sort of how to think about that. Right. And the second reason why we may want to orient towards, oops, sorry, somebody else has started sharing the screen. Let me, yeah, okay. Uh, so another reason that we might want to orient towards these kinds of post hoc explanations is the models itself that are being sort of like, let's say if you're a hospital and so on, and if you're deploying a model that somebody else has built, like a big tech company, uh, in such case, you may not even have access to the model. Uh, and, you know, you're essentially left with a black box and you might still want to understand what such a model is doing, right? So there are two cases in which post hoc explanations of models can be useful. One is there are certain settings where you might be losing uh, accuracy if you are orienting towards interpretable models. The other cases, you may just have access to a proprietary black box and you may still want to understand what it is doing, right? So in such cases, we might want to use post hoc explanations. And this has become a very popular area of research in machine learning in recent times, okay? Um, and one of the popular classes of explanations uh, that has come up in recent times is feature attribution based local explanations. Mm -hmm. Here is that these explanations are intended to or designed to explain individual predictions of any given classifier, right? So that's what they're designed for. And their outputs are feature importances or feature attributions, which capture the effect or contribution of each feature on the black box prediction. Okay. And just to name drop a few, which I'm sure you've already heard in prior talks, for example, methods like lime, shap, gradient, gradient times input, integrated gradients, and so on. So the goal of these methods is if you give a point, uh, they can sort of give you a list of features and their importances uh, in terms of the prediction that the model is making for this point. Right? And you can do this for any given black box model. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just to get into the main topic of this talk, uh, I just wanted to discuss a little bit about some of the uh, interesting vulnerabilities or sort of characteristics that we are observing with these kinds of methods, that is feature attribution based local explanation methods. Okay? So, we carried out a study recently to understand if and how often these feature attribution based methods disagree with each other. Uh, and what exactly constitutes disagreement between these explanations and how to formalize the notion of disagreement based on practitioner inputs and how do practitioners resolve disagreement if and when it occurs across these kinds of explanations, right? Uh, and I'll go into the details in a bit as to what uh, I mean by explanation disagreement and you know other aspects that I've just talked about here. Okay. So what we did is we carried out 30 minute semi structured interviews with 25 data scientists uh, who are spread across different tech startups, uh, financial companies, as well as healthcare companies. And we basically asked them some questions about these feature importance or feature attribution based explanation methods, right? Uh, so how do these people characterize disagreement in explanations? So first of all, a lot of these participants said that they have often seen these methods disagree with each other. And what does that mean? They've often seen that the top features according to each of these methods are different. So for example, let's say Lyme says an important feature is somebody's inflammation markers uh, for a given model. And for the same model, Shap goes and says, uh, you know, a person's age is the most important feature. So in some sense, they've observed, practitioners have often observed that 
if we ask a simple question, which is what are the top five features uh, for this prediction for this given model, you might get different answers from different uh, feature attribution methods. The next thing that practitioners often see and which they also characterize as disagreement is the ordering among the top features is different, right? So, you know, if one of them uh, rank orders uh, inflammation markers as the top feature, the other one may rank order, you know, age as like the top feature with inflammation marker as the third feature and so on. And they have also observed that in practice, direction of top feature contributions is different. So, which is, you know, if something says inflammation markers are contributing positively to a particular prediction, you might see another approach say they are contributing negatively, right? And the relative ordering of features of interest has also been observed to be different by these practitioners, which means, uh, you know, in one case, uh, a particular method might say age is more important than inflammation, whereas another method might say inflammation markers are more important than age, right? So clearly, if a practitioner is looking for some high level insights in order to take away from these methods, there is no agreement among these methods with respect to some of these simple questions themselves, right? And as you can see, about 84% of our participants have reported that they've encountered uh, one of these kinds of disagreements and that has caused problems to them in terms of how they want to interpret the results that are being uh, put out or output by these uh, feature attributes based methods, right? Um, and these participants are typically characterized explanation agreement based on several factors, as some of which we have just discussed, such as mismatch in top features, uh, feature ordering, directions of contributions. But interestingly, they were not thinking about the exact values of feature importances output by different explanation methods. In fact, 96% of participants in our study opined that uh, the exact values of feature importances output by different methods are not directly comparable because one method is trying to fit a regression, another method is trying to compute shapely values and so on. So they are pretty comfortable with the fact that the exact feature importance values may be different. However, they still expect the high level insights in terms of basic things like what are the important features, right? Or what are the top K features uh, to match across different algorithms, given that they're all being called feature attribution based methods, or they all output some notion of feature importance, right? Uh, this quote basically was an interesting summary of all the different inputs we got from these practitioners. So one of the participants said that the values generated by these methods are clearly different. So I would not characterize disagreement based on that, but I would at least want the explanations they output to give me consistent insights, right? The explanations should agree on what are the most important features, ordering among them and so on for me to derive consistent insights, but they don't. Okay, So that I think pretty much summarizes the problem. So based on these notions, we came up with a bunch of different metrics to sort of capture these notions. For example, feature agreement is basically computing what fraction of the top K features actually agree between two different explanations, EA and EB. Similarly, rank agreement is computing what fraction of the top K features agree between two explanations, EA and EB, but also in such a way that their rank exactly matches, right? And sign agreement is looking at what fraction of features agree between the top K features of explanation EA and EB, but also the signs should be the same. So if a feature is contributing positively in one case, it should also do the same in the other. And sign rank is basically, uh, you know, fraction of features in the top K that both agree uh, between explanation A and B, but their signs and ranks, all of those as well match, right? So it's kind of going in a stricter order as we go from one metric to another. Similarly, we also looked at few other uh, metrics which captured the notions of disagreements but that are being communicated to us by practitioners, for example, computing rank correlation coefficients between two rank list of features and also taking every pair of features in a pairwise fashion and then computing how many of these, the rankings of this, like relative importance of this or the relative rankings of these pairs, how many of them agree between two different explanations, EA and EB output by different methods for the same model, right? And the same uh, data point. 
Um, so we essentially captured all this mathematically, and then we went and did our own analysis to actually see if all these disagreements that practitioners are sort of mentioning about actually happen empirically as we tested, right? So to this end, we carried out empirical analysis with six post hoc explanation methods, four real world data sets comprising of tabular, natural language, and image data eight different model classes, and we found several disagreements between explanation methods confirming the intuitions or the experiences of uh, practitioners generally, right? Uh, and then we went to this other question of, okay, so when faced with disagreements, how do practitioners actually resolve them, right? To this end, we showed them pairs of explanations output by different methods. In this case, you're seeing two different out explanations output, one by line and one by kernel shap. And uh, we basically took these explanations based on already people's characterization of these, are these explanations disagreeing with each other or not? And then we went to them and asked them questions about if they see these kinds of disagreeing explanations, what would they do? So how would they move forward? How would they resolve these disagreements? Right. Uh, again, we did an online user study where we showed these kinds of disagreeing explanations to 25 practitioners who were data scientists across uh, different organizations spanning different domains and asked them to pick a particular explanation, make a choice if they disagree, which one would you pick and also explain why. Right. Uh, so we found a lot of interesting insights here. So first of all, we realized that practitioners are choosing explanation methods for a variety of reasons such as you know i'm uh, like we we saw quotes saying i'm picking kernel shap because that paper has more theory or it was a more recently published paper or they were saying that they were picking a particular explanation because the intuition of that explanation matched their own intuition better or they were just sort of using rules like oh if it is tabular data i'll probably pick lime or shap and maybe not gradient based methods right uh, so these are some of the quotes uh, as i just discussed some so for example well, you know, you, these, these were some of the popular algorithms that were picked when there were disagreements. Kernel SHAP or SHAP generally was the most popular one. And people were picking it not for reasons like it is generating more accurate explanations and they know that or they have seen the quality of explanation, but for reasons such as SHAP is more familiar or, you know, it's a better algorithm overall. It seems more methodical. And, you know, again, the paper has more associated theory and so on, right? Uh, so the, these were very interesting sort of snippets because these choices were being made in a rather ad hoc way, as opposed to sort of basing them on precise metric as to which explanations to pick when two methods disagree, right? Uh, so in summary, what we found was that feature attribution based explanation methods often disagree in practice with respect to some of the basic questions and practitioners are actually adopting ad hoc heuristics to resolve these kinds of disagreement, which seems pretty problematic, right? Uh, but I think this result basically gets us thinking more about is this kind of disagreement between different explanation methods a feature or is it a bug, right? Are different methods just focusing on different facets of feature importance? Is that why we are seeing all these differences? So does that mean should we just educate practitioners better about, you know, Lime would do a very different thing than what SHAP would do, even if they're just called feature attribution based methods? Is it just a about like educating practitioners better that these methods are actually pretty distinct and they should not be used sort of in a replaceable manner. Uh, or is there a more fundamental issue of lack of consensus in the field itself as to which notions of feature importance should be captured by model explanations, right? Uh, so there are no answers to some of these very basic questions such as are certain notions of feature importance more well suited for a specific context and applications than others? How do we characterize which notions are better suited for which other notions? So there are several fundamental questions here that remain unanswered, which might potentially be causing this confusion that practitioners are experiencing when they try to just run different methods and then see they're all sort of disagreeing with each other, right? Uh, so I think this is both a call for educating practitioners more about what exactly these methods are trying to do, and also for the research community to think more deeply about 
if these methods are doing so many different things, uh, should we characterize them better and give more precise answer on which one to use when? Okay. Uh, with that, I would like to stop here and thank you so much for the time and uh, for being here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Lakaraju. Um, like Madeline said earlier, we will be uh, taking questions during the panel. Um, with that, um, my name is Ian and I'm a student uh, working for Dr. Ding and Dr. Rousseau. And uh, our next speaker that I'm, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing is Dr. E.L. Klang. Dr. Klang is the head of AI at the Sami Sagal AI Hub, the ARC Innovation Center, Sheba Medical Center, and he is the staff abdominal radiologist at the Sheba Medical Center, Diagnostic Imaging Department. He's also an adjunct assistant professor of diagnostic molecular and interventional radiology at the Icon School of Medicine in, uh, of uh, Mount Sinai, and that's in New York City. Dr. Klang was a visiting data scientist at the Clinical Data Science Group at Mount Sinai Hospital, and he has sustained a productive, well-funded research program published works in internationally recognized journals, presented works in international conferences, and is an investigator in the fields of machine learning and radiology. His research areas include collaboration in machine learning studies, including generative adversarial networks, or GANs, for data augmentation of radiology images and cross-modality in CT and PET, uh, PET and uh, CT. Uh, clinical tabular and also NLP prediction models, deep learning networks and um, those deep learning networks are for video capsule endoscopy images. And then lastly, clinical and machine learning works in the field of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Klang, if you're able to uh, share screen and present. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Let me just share the screen. And... Okay. Yeah. Up. Okay, so I'll present um, artificial intelligence for wireless capsule endoscopy in Crohn's disease. And this is the layout of the talk. Uh, I'm a physician, so first I will talk about the clinical uh, side of Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease and a little bit about what is wireless video capsule endoscopy, and then I will talk about deep learning for uh, wireless capsule endoscopy, including patient level analysis of single images, and say it's mimickers, ordinal grading of um, Crohn's ulcers, and uh, in the end, full video analysis using transformers for prediction of biological treatment. So Crohn's disease is a uh, chronic relapsing uh, inflammatory disease. It is type of uh, inflammatory bowel disease with ulcerative colitis, and the disease can cause inflammation along the entire digestive tract. Here we see an image of an uh, after in the in the mucosa of the mouth. And the IBD burden uh, is is large. Uh, it it uh, overall excess lifetime cost in the US population is more than 400 billion US dollars. And there are an estimated more, more than 1.4 million patients in the US. And Crohn's disease symptoms include abdominal pain, severe diarrhea, fatigue, weight loss, and malnutrition with extensive extra intestinal involvement, uh, which includes the eyes, liver, joints, skin, gallbladder, kidneys, and other. And the problem is that there is long-term damage with repeated bouts of inflammation, uh, which can cause a clinical flares and eventually culminate to bowel damage, intestinal complications, and surgeries. And diagnosis delay is, is common in IV inflammatory bowel disease and frequently results in structural complications with at least 30% of the patients will require surgery at least once. So this is an image, a CT, abdominal CT image and we see here an abscess, an abdominal abscess from Crohn disease. This is a diseased uh, distal ileum uh, loop. This is disease mesentery with fistulas and, and uh, inflammation. It's called the star sign, this kind of uh, formation. And uh, again, we see a disease in MRI, we see a uh, disease terminal ileum and uh, presynoctic dilatation, and this can eventually become a, a full obstruction. And Crohn disease can also cause colon cancer. Here we see a 
an endoscopic even image of colon cancer. It's about 3% in uh, 10 years from diagnosis of, of Crohn's disease. And this is a video capsule endoscopy. Uh, video capsule endoscopy. I don't know if you know, everyone knows this. This is the, the size, it's the size of uh, a coin and the patient swallows the, the, the capsule. And uh, it's very quite reliable and it's a non-invasive diagnostic tool for assessment of a small bowel. What happens is that the, the capsule travels along the digestive tract. There is some light um, a source here with a camera and the capsule transmit the images to this hard drive that the patient carries on his belly for the time the capsule, until the capsule is excreted and then you can take the, the images and you have a full video. Typically a video will include 10,000 images and an experienced gastroenterologist, will it will take him a, about 30 minutes to review these images. And just to see, there are some complications, mainly uh, retention. Here you see a, an MRI image with a disease terminal ileum, and here is the capsule that is stuck here. So just some images before we go to the deep learning. Uh, uh, here you see how mucosal ulcers look in the small bowel. This, this is ulcers, and I guess everybody can see for themselves to understand that also. So CNNs also, it's quite easy for them to identify ulcers. And these are a, a little bigger ulcers. And you can grade the ulcers from mild uh, to severe. And just for, uh, you know, for the interest, this is how blood look on the small bowel. And these are worms in the video capsule endoscopy of the small bowel, scariasis. So the first study is a deep learning analysis of, uh, of video capsule, just trying to classify between uh, ulcer images and normal images. And then experienced uh, gastroenterologist uh, labeled all the images as either normal or with ulcers. So for the first experiment, uh, we separated the, the images into a random split, you know, um, just taking five-fold cross uh, validation of all the images without patient level separation, and then we compared it to a patient level separation. So in this time, uh, it's N minus one for training and one patient, all the images, one mutually exclusive patient for testing. And it's, it will show the difference and why it's important to do a patient level separation here. Overall, there were about 18,000 images from 50 patients, 49 patients, and it was quite balanced between normal and ulcers. And this is, this is a, a first PCA and that this dimensionality reduction. And you can see here why it's, why it's important to do a patient level separation because you see clusters from the same patient because the mucosa of, of a patient is, is um, so the pattern is, is like, quite unique for each patient. So that's why you need to do a patient level separation. And when you do the, you, you, you do the AUCs of the CNN, if you do the random split, split so it's very easy for the machine to, to learn and the AUC is 0.99, but if you do patient level uh, split, it drops a little bit between 0.94 to 0.99 for different patients. So for NSAIDs is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, very commonly used uh, medications. They are sold uh, over the counter. And in the small bowel, this uh, kind of drug can cause a variety of uh, damage and also um, NSAID induced ulcers. And these ulcers are like the, the, the most common mimicker of Crohn's disease. So in this case, we just took the same CNN we trained on the Crohn's disease and we checked what happens when you show it uh, NSAID ulcers. And the NSAIDs was collected from a prospective uh, trial, uh, uh, 16,000 images from a prospective trial with NSAIDs uh, induced uh, ulcers. 
And you see here in these heat maps that the CNN catches the NSAIDs immediately. It's not so surprising because you can see for yourself that the ulcers look very similar to Crohn's disease ulcers. But it's very important because they're starting to build commercial uh, applications for Crohn's disease, for inflammatory bowel disease. You don't build such applications for NSAIDs, but it's very important to know it when you design these commercial applications to be aware of, of mimickers, especially NSAIDs, but other mimickers, because they just catch up the same. And this is another network. It's an ordinal network for grading. If you remember the grades for the ulcers. So this is an ordinal network uh, for ulcer grading. We did two experiments here to compare the human readers to the CNN. So in the first experiment, we just compared two expert gastroenterologists um, and we compared their inter-reader variability for grading between one to three. And in the second experiment, we took three um, experienced capsule readers and in consensus, they graded all the images. And then we use the CNN to see what, how the CNN will manage this task of grading. And there were a total of 2,500 uh, randomly picked images and that were graded between one to three. And so immediately, if you look yourself, you see it's, it's, uh, it's easy to differentiate between mild and severe disease. This is severe Crohn's disease. Look at these big ulcers, but it's difficult to differentiate between mild and moderate and between moderate and severe. And that's what happened also for the experienced uh, gastroenterologist. And you see here that they, there was a, a lot of disagreement between the first one who said a lot of, uh, um, uh, he, he graded them as two, a lot of images. And the second gastroenterologist graded them as three. So there was a lot of inter-reader viability. And that was also true for the CNN because when you check, um, when you check one versus three, the accuracy is 0.91, but it, it goes down when you check two versus three or one versus two. And this is the last study. We did this study uh, with uh, Intel Corporation and with the Shiba Gastrointestinal Department. And uh, in this study, we evaluated full videos um, of newly diagnosed Crohn's disease patients. And the task was to predict if the, this patient, this newly diagnosed patient will need a biological tr treatment because biological treatment is like the most advanced treatment for IBD. It's very expensive and it carries uh, specific uh, side, important side effects. So it's very important to know which patient will need a biological treatment. And so we took this uh, uh, newly diagnosed Crohn's disease patients and we followed them uh, for uh, more than six months. And all the patients that started biological treatment in that time, time uh, period were uh, classified as, uh, as one and the others as zero. And you, we used the, the Timesformer uh, algorithm it's an algorithm that it was developed by Facebook for analyzing videos. And this algorithm, uh, it uses self-attention both in the uh, spatial uh, domain, which means in the same uh, slice, in the same image, it looks at different patches, or it looks at the same area across uh, continuous uh, frames, continuous images. So that's the temporal uh, uh, attention. So it's a spatial temporal um, uh, algorithm for videos. And we had the cohort of 101 patients, which is more than 1 million images. And about a third of the patients started biological treatment during the follow up. Mm. So the transformer algorithm had an AUC of 0.86 to predict bi biological therapy. It was better than a human reader, a Lewis score 
which is a score for grading the the, 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 the amount of ulcers along the the video. This AOC if for this was a 0.7. It was also higher than the stool biomarker of fecal carpoctectin, which has an AOC of 0.74. And this is an interpretation uh, that was done for the attention network. Here you see, so these are, when you go from left to right, it's mean, this is, these are shallow uh, layers of the network and these are deep layers of the networks. The first row is looking at specific at pixels at the same, uh, at the same pixel at different images. And you will see that in the shallow network, there is differentiation because different pixels at different areas uh, maybe are clustered together, but when you go deeper, this, you lose this differentiation. But if you look in the example ID, which is basically uh, each patient or each video, this is very similar to the study with the patient level uh, separation before. It says that in the deeper layers, it will cluster images from each patient because the mucosal pattern will be will catch and will do this cluster in per video and also for the label or prediction uh, um, uh, label so biological treatment yes or no uh, the, the deep layers will show this differentiation because that's the, the point of the network so that's the interpretation of this uh, network and that's it thank you very much um, so thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I think that what I'm supposed to be doing here is playing the role of gadfly um, for explainability and um, putting down an argument that uh, those who disagree with can beat up on during the panel. Um, so, you know, cards on the table, uh, I'm an explainability skeptic and I'm gonna try and lay out um, at least one area in which I'm skeptical that explainability is going to be a net good. Um, and again, we can, we can have it out on the panel later uh, uh, for those who disagree. Um, so what I'm going to try to argue here is a, a pretty narrow argument um, that I don't think explainability should be a requirement for patient level decision uh, making. So it, it's possible that explainability could, could be an optional component of patient level decision, decision making. And uh, patient level decision making here means uh, there's a physician who's using a decision support tool that's based on a black box machine learning algorithm, um, and they are trying to use that uh, algorithm to inform decision making for a specific patient. Um, and so what I'm going to try and argue here is that in that scenario, um, I don't think that explainability should be a requirement. And I'll tell you why um, I'm arguing against that specific scenario uh, later in the talk. Um, I'm not going to try and argue that explainability has no use. I think that it does have several um, uh, important use cases, and some of those include sort of global qualitative summaries of model behavior. Um, so one of the first things that I do uh, after I fit a model in my group is we will go to some of the explainability techniques to try and see if um, it's uh, learned some reasonable signals, so some saliency maps, things like that. Uh, but these are going to be global qualitative summaries of model behavior. They're not going to be um, uh, telling me whether on any given instance the model is doing what I think it should be doing. Uh, again, it's sort of a related use case there is model debugging. So um, is it, you know, in the famous example in chest x-rays, is it using the, a watermark versus actually looking at lung pathology in chest x-rays? Um, and it, 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 that sort of hints at that I think that it can be a component of a validation um, or auditing process, um, but in and of itself is not sufficient um, for guaranteeing correctness of any given model. Um, so I'm not going to document any of the specific failure cases um, for any specific technique. I think uh, Marzia maybe touched on that a little bit during her talk. Um, instead, I'm going to try and uh, shore up this argument about why I think uh, it's not good for patient level decision making. So some quick definitions before we get started. Um, so for the purpose of this talk, when I say explainability, I'm going to use that to refer to popular post hoc methods that attempt to explain predictions from an arbitrary black box method. So some of these include saliency maps, so grad cam, integrated gradients, things like that, um, shape, lime, and other marginal feature important scores, um, and so-called counterfactual explanations. So these are broadly what I'm going to be referring to when I say explainability techniques. Um, at the end of the talk, I also will touch on um, some issues with interpretable models. So interpretable models are simpler models that are designed to be interpreted, uh, to be able to be interpreted by humans with no additional um, sort of uh, explainability wrapper around them. 
So my uh, view on explainability is motivated by exchange, uh, many exchanges I've had with medical colleagues that go like this. So uh, the, the medical doctor, the healthcare worker will come to me and they'll be like, this AI stuff seems really cool, uh, but it's never gonna seem widespread clinical adoption until it can provide an explanation for its decision-making process. So it needs to be able to tell me why it's doing something. And I'll be like, well, that's interesting. Uh, why do you think that? And this is the sort of uh, unanimous response that I get to that question. Um, it's if I can't understand how it's deciding, how will I know when I can trust it? And it always, in my experience, comes down to a question of trust. Um, so these interactions with my medical colleagues have impressed upon me uh, that healthcare workers are skeptical of AI. Um, they're skeptical of them for a variety of reasons. Some of them are well-founded, some of them are not. Um, and they worry about mistakes. So they worry about AI encroaching on their job description. They worry about having to overly rely on something that they don't understand. And they also worry about liability. And so what they really want to know uh, is a mechanism by which they can know when they should trust the algorithm and when they should override its decision making. And to them, the, uh, the uh, trust mechanism would be the algorithm to be able to explain itself. If it gives an explanation and it's nonsensical, they know that the algorithm has gone off the rails and they shouldn't trust that prediction. However, it's unclear to me that current explainability techniques are suitable to fill this trust gap. And I'll try and tell you a little bit why I believe that's the case. Uh, so I actually think that explanations, uh, MDs wanting explanations is, is pretty reasonable. It, it makes sense. Um, it's, it's sort of part of their culture and part of their training. When they were medical students, when they were residents, uh, they would have to explain their reasoning on rounds uh, to their attendings and to their supervisors. And it's just part of the culture. And it's the way that they demonstrate competence and mastery of a subject to their peers. Um, and so again, it's very ingrained. Um, so in their view, being able to explain your reasoning equals competence equals trust. And so if you have a colleague who doesn't know why they're making decision or, or can't at least give a, uh, a facsimile of an, of an explanation for why they're making a good decision, they're going to be skeptical of that colleague. Um, however, what they mean by explanations are very different than what we mean by explanations currently in machine learning. So uh, their explanations are typically systems or physiologically based. And so they will talk about the hemodynamics of their patients. Uh, they will talk about the pulmonary function of their patients, and they're sort of very physiologically or, or systems-based. Uh, they're deterministic and non-probabilistic. So X happened and then Y happened, therefore X caused uh, Y. There, there's not a lot of room for uncertainty or uh, stochastic things happening in their explanations. Uh, and then importantly, they're causal. Uh, they want to reason uh, why something happened. And when they, when they say reason, they, they do mean that X caused Y. So in other words, nothing like the explanations that we can currently provide for our models, which I think are actually the opposite of these three desatera, um, that they tend to not be systems-based, they tend to be uh, probabilistic, and they tend to be non-causal. So here's an example of an explanation in medicine. Uh, this is taken from a, a board exam. Uh, so a 35-year-old man comes to a physician because of pain and swelling of his right arm, where he scraped it on a tree branch two days ago. His temperature is 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Examination of the right forearm shows edema around a fluctuant. I'm not going to say, I'll, I'll let you read it. Let's, let's uh, spare you my medical pronunciation. So this is the, the question, and the, the goal here is to have the physician uh, diagnose the patient. So the correct answer here is that the patient has a separation of the endothelial junction, and here's the explanation. Uh, endothelial tight junctions, permeability is increased in response to injury and inflammation, allowing migration of white blood cells uh, and friends to the side of injury. So this is what they mean by explanation. This is a very specific, causal, deterministic, and physiologically based explanation for why this pa uh, patient is experiencing the symptoms that they are um, experiencing. Uh, and again, this is what the MDs have in mind uh, when they say they want the algorithm to be able to explain its reasoning. Uh, here's a sort of an, another one for imaging, which is obviously a very popular application in medicine. Um, so this is a patient who has pneumonia, and here in the finding section, uh, you'll see uh, what a MD or radiologist would consider to be a coherent explanation for why this patient has pneumonia. Uh, PA and lateral chest radiographs demonstrate peripheral opacities and subtle air bronchiograms within the right lower lung consistent with pneumonia. There's not a heat map here. That's not what MDs mean by explanation. They mean an explanation of the physiology that gives rise to the symptoms that the patient is um, experiencing. So fundamentally, what I think is happening is we have a misalignment between two kinds of systems. Um, we have humans, which are causal and low dimensional. So they are thinking about a very small set of variables 
uh, and how the causal chain of those small set of variables gives rise to the condition of the patient. Uh, and the models that we build, which are high dimensional, probabilistic, um, and don't easily give uh, way to uh, the types of explanations that uh, humans are used to. Um, so current explainability techniques, at least in my estimation, only partially fix this misalignment um, and in some instances can make it worse. Moreover, we actually would like machine learning in instances where the reasoning types of systems in category one uh, fail. So a lot of times, um, especially in the prediction setting, uh, there is not a parsimonious low dimensional causal explanation uh, for, uh, for a prediction, let's say 30 day mortality. It's, it's a high dimensional um, probabilistic um, a non-causal kind of thing, or at least we don't have the sufficient understanding of the universe to, to reduce it to a set of causal statements. Um, so there are some problems that, um, as a result of this, uh, that current explainability approaches can exacerbate trust issues. Um, so one is false confidence. Uh, studies in the literature have shown that explainability can unreasonably increase user confidence in algorithmic decisions. Um, so if, if a study, if an algorithm is giving you an explanation, even if it's a bad one, uh, it can sort of make you turn your brain off and overly rely on that system because you, you, you've been sort of lulled into a false sense of security. Uh, a lack of fidelity. And so, you know, by definition, all post hoc explainability methods are approximations of the full model. Um, so it, it's unclear sort of how faithful they are to the true full model, um, because by definition, they're having to do some, at least some kind of local approximation um, or some other kind of approximation in order to give you that explanation. Uh, and then I think the, the thing that is also challenging, and anyone who's, who's worked with explainability before will have gone through this, is that there's a sort of a Rorschach test quality to this, where you generate an explanation and you squint your eyes and you stare at it, and you say, oh, this one seems reasonable. This is a good explanation. Um, or you're like, this explanation that looks weird. This doesn't make any sense. Let's change some hyperparameters and generate a new explanation. Um, so there's still this uh, cognitive projection that the end user has to do onto the explanation to decide uh, whether or not it makes sense. And so there's not sort of an objective ground truth. Um, so th those are some problems with um, the uh, traditional explainability techniques. I also want to uh, cover just a little bit uh, problems with interpretable models. So interpretable models are simple models uh, that you don't need a post hoc method to explain because they designed uh, to be uh, interpreted by humans sort of out of the box. Um, so unfortunately in medicine, we actually have tons of interpretable models and they are widely misused and widely misunderstood um, all the time. And so uh, you can go and look in the literature and just find widespread misunderstanding uh, with, uh, you know, not only MDs, but all, you know, card carrying statisticians and epidemiologists uh, with interpreting p-values. So actually being able to correctly state the definition of p-value and understand what the information that's actually giving you is uh, not something that your average um, a healthcare worker can do. Uh, odds ratios and risk ratios um, and confidence intervals. And again, these are simple interpretable models that are designed to communicate uh, very simple statistical quantities. Um, and there's just widespread misunderstanding um, in, the, in the field, uh, in the medical literature about what, what these things are actually uh, capturing. Um, the, and this is a controversial point, and it's not a hill that I'm willing to die on, um, but at least in my experience, there is an accuracy interpretability trade-off um, where interpretable models typically are less accurate on um, complex high-dimensional data like images, um, maybe on smaller tabular data, I would be willing to relax that a little bit, um, but we, we often have to sacrifice something uh, to get an interpretable model. Um, so let me give you an example of a very simple uh, interpretable model that people mess up all the time. And this is in the epidemiology liter literature, widely known as the table two fallacy. Um, so this was published uh, in an epi journal uh, in 2013. And so uh, imagine that we are trying to estimate the effect of a variable X on an outcome Y. And so we'd like to understand uh, we're doing sort of a causal inference exercise. Uh, but we know from expert knowledge that there's a third variable Z, which is a confounder. Uh, and even if there is no effect on, of X on Y, uh, because Z is a confounder, it will make it look like there is an effect. And so the correct thing to do here is to control for Z. And so we're going to fit a simple linear model with X and Z as variables, and we're going to then regress that on Y. Uh, so what is often the case is that people will present the regression coefficients of this model in a table two uh, for the co re regression coefficient of X, the regression coefficient of Z, um, and then people will erroneously interpret the regression coefficient of Z as its effect on Y. 
um, which is incorrect. It's actually mediated. There's another part where it's mediated through X. Um, and in this scenario, we actually have a set of very transparent assumptions. We, we can draw the DAG and, and show exactly uh, what assumptions went into this model. Um, but this is widely misinterpreted um, uh, in the literature, again, not just by MDs, but often by uh, people who should know better. Um, this points to sort of a larger problem in, in medicine. And if we want healthcare workers, MDs, nurses, healthcare, um, the healthcare staff to be end users of this, uh, many of them have received very little quantitative training. Um, so this is a study by my colleague, Raj Minrai, um at DBMI at Harvard. Um, and it has shown that physicians are unable to correctly calculate the positive predictive value of a test. So what is the posterior probability of disease given a positive test result? Um, and so uh, again, physicians, I'm, I'm married to a physician um, and they can go through large portions of their training with never having taken a stats course or, or much in the way of quantitative training. And so at least from my um, perspective, expecting them to correctly interpret complicated high dimensional statistical objects um, in, a, in a safe way is, is unreasonable um, in my estimation. So then let's get back to the goal. Like what is the thing that we're actually trying to do here? And if the goal is engendering trust, meaning uh, at the beginning, I said that physicians want a, a, the ability to know when they should trust a model, then let's directly optimize for trust in ways that we know how to do. Uh, and we can do that through extensive validation. So we can uh, hand physicians a card that say, in this population, uh, we know that the model has this accuracy, this sensitivity, this specificity, and therefore you can feel safe using it on your population, assuming that it matches um, the validation population. Uh, transparent documentation, and so that gets back to the validation. So who was this model validated on? Um, what type of infrastructure did they have? What were the demographics? Um, this goes by another name called model cards, um, but let them know uh, who, the, who the model has been validated on and for whom it, there's a reasonable expectation that it will work. Uh, mechanisms for uncertainty quantification. So uh, this is, I think, something that's um, underappreciated in the, the medical literature, but having a a uh, principled, coherent uncertainty quantification mechanism where um, the model can either abstain from making a diagnosis or give the end user some indication of um, how far away a new uh, data point is from the training data so that the, the end user knows, okay, this model really wasn't trained to uh, make predictions on this kind of patient, so I'm going to override it um, in this scenario. Um, and then incorporation of explicit causal mechanisms into the model so that we can, again, um, align it more closely with how humans think about the world. Um, another mental model to think about how to um, uh, improve this trust mechanism is uh, in medicine, we're very good at evaluating the safety and efficacy of interventions and devices using randomized control trials or RCTs. And uh, some drugs are black boxes. So we don't know how every drug works. Uh, we have partial understanding for a lot of them, but some drugs um, have very poorly understood mechanisms of actions. Um, and so in some, in some ways, they're, they're black boxes like our models. Um, but RCTs let us know for whom um, and when we can use these drugs um, because they've been tested and shown to be safe uh, and, and have high efficacy. Um, and in, importantly, MDs trust medications that are well supported by evidence from RCTs. And so again, if we want to engender trust, um, let's give them good evidence that they can use to base their decisions on. Um, so what I'm, what I'm trying to argue here is that this is the standard that black box ML models should be held to, um, and they shouldn't be subject to additional requirements that um, are sort of, uh, we, we don't apply to any other uh, medical technology. Um, one thing that uh, we don't really have in uh, ML that we do have, it, that we have in drug safety is a comprehensive safety surveillance system. Um, so for drugs, pharmaceutical companies go to enormous expense. Uh, and are required to maintain an adverse event reporting system. And so anytime there's an adverse event, uh, there's a mechanism by which a patient or a physician can submit that to the, um, to the pharmaceutical company, and that will be registered in a database, and they're able to do real-time safety surveillance as a result. Um, so this partially applies to us if there's an FDA-approved device, um, or if there's a SAMD, a software as a medical device, uh, and there's an adverse event, then that has to be reported, but it needs to be updated for ML-specific problems like data set shift, and sort of uh, decay of accuracy and things like that, it needs to be updated uh, to go with the specific adverse events as we think about them in ML. Um, so just to, to wrap up, uh, I'm against explainability as being a requirement for clinically deployed ML models. I don't think we're there yet. Um, and I think that we have much more dire direct means to engender trust with the healthcare workers. Um, Marzia and I and Lauren Oakton Reader wrote a paper about this um, that outlines some of these uh, uh, arguments in more detail. I'm showing it here on the right if you're, if you're interested in it. 
Um, and instead of uh, investing resources in explainability, I think we should more heavily invest in validation and auditing um, as a, again, as a, as a more direct means to engendering trust. And so I think I'm out of time and I'll, I'll stop there and I'm ha happy to answer any questions. Um, how big is it? How big is what? I, I don't know if that was a question or yeah, not. Yeah, no, I, I think we're going to, I think it's good. I think we've had some other people come on the call and whatnot, but um, thank you very much. And I know we're going to um, put all our questions at the end for the panel, um, but thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bean. That was excellent. Yeah, I think we've had some people hopping on, but I can go ahead and introduce our um, our last speaker before our panel this, this afternoon. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Greg Durrett, and he is an assistant professor of computer science at UT Austin. His current research focuses on making natural language processing systems more interpretable, controllable, and generalizable, spanning application domains, including question answering, te textual reasoning, Summer, uh, summarization and information extraction. His work is funded by 2022 NSF Career Award and other grants for agencies, including NSF, DARPA, Salesforce, and Amazon. He has completed his PhD at UC Berkeley in 2016, where he is advised by Dan Klein from 2016 to 2017, and he was a research scientist at Semantic uh, Machines. So thank you very much, Craig. Sorry, I failed to unmute before I full screen. All right, uh, thanks so much, uh, Madeline, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, so um, today, sorry if I can get back to the title slide there. Um, yeah, today I, I wanna talk about what explanations are and aren't for NLP and health. So I'm gonna try to follow on some of the uh, kind of talks that we've seen here, which have talked about some of the kind of pros and cons here and give uh, what I hope is kind of a measured take on what we can do, um, specifically angling towards the kind of NLP space. Um, so, you know, as, as we've kind of heard so far, you know, there's been a lot of advances on AI in healthcare, but um, despite the, um, you know, kind of, despite the progress, it hasn't kind of put radiologists out of business, right? Um, and, uh, Moreover, there's issues where the systems that are kind of work well in one setting don't necessarily transfer to other settings, right? Uh, so I think part of the reason that we're all here is because there is this hope that uh, something like explanations can help us address some of these shortcomings here. Um, and I'm gonna talk about also post hoc explanations of black box models and kind of what these might be able to do for us. Um, so I'm going to borrow from uh, Zach Lipton's nice piece in terms of drawing on some of the terminology that uh, can help us motivate what model explanations might be able to do. Um, and so one of the things we might want to get is to say, okay, we know that the system is behaving this way and we can prove it. Um, and this, as we've kind of seen throughout this session uh, and this workshop, is just not possible. Um, these kind of postdoc interpretations are fundamentally misleading in some cases and don't necessarily tell you exactly what's going on. Um, however, what, what do we want from them? Well, we want trust, right? Um, I mean, I think this is one of the words that's been coming up a lot. Um, and so we would like a user to be able to say, okay, I see that I, what the system is doing and it agrees with how I would do it. So I have a little bit more trust in the system. That may be misplaced trust, um, but if we can achieve that kind of alignment, the user may have more confidence in the system. We want systems that are kind of right for the right reasons, because we think they're maybe more likely to transfer to new settings and to work well in those settings. Um, so again, getting to some of the uh, questions of things like bias and uh, issues on different subpopulations that were raised uh, in Marzia's talk. Um, if we see that the system is making a certain kind of mistake and maybe on a certain kind of subpopulation, maybe we know we shouldn't use it, right? Um, and then we also wanna be able to surface information that's relevant to a human decision maker. We want the system to be informative. Um, and you know, we want a user to be able to say, okay, I can see what the system is using and that can actually help me as well. So I'm gonna talk about XAI for decision support and specifically in the context of NLP models. So uh, 
we're going to have a model that's going to give us both a decision and some kind of explanation. And then we're going to say, okay, these are both shown to a user. How can the user um, kind of achieve these goals? Or how can the user understand what's going on here? So I'm going to talk about two pieces of work today. The first is going to be not in the uh, kind of medical domain, but is going to help us understand a little more about the underpinnings of what explanations can tell us and how to evaluate them. So I hope this can actually provide a, a kind of useful piece here in terms of thinking about what these really mean and why, for example, there's such disagreement between different explanations. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how we can take some of those insights and use them to extract information uh, from radiology reports. So let me dive into this first part here. Um, so one of the kind of core, uh, I think, underpinnings of what explanations should provide us uh, is the ability to reason about counterfactuals, right? Like they should give us some sense of, oh, okay, like if the input were changed in this way, you know, th this thing would be different at the output. Um, so one of the techniques that's used in NLP a lot when producing explanations is just dropping words, basically saying we're going to understand the effect of these words by what would happen if they were deleted. This is not always realistic. And dropping tokens is not actually that meaningful. We would instead want to see something where there's like some different words in these two blanks here. Um, and so really what we want, what I argue that we want, is we want explanations to be able to tell us about model behavior in realistic settings. So let me show you an example taken from question answering. Um, so again, this is going to be on a kind of benchmark NLP data set, um, and we're going to talk about how this applies to kind of medical information extraction later. Um, but we have a question. Are super high me and all in this T both documentaries? And we have an evidence passage that uh, kind of includes some information about these along with other stuff. And all the models that we're gonna be talking about in this talk are these pre-trained transformer models that are able to take these two pieces of input and then end to end produce a decision. Um, so we have these two as inputs and the output is a binary answer. And so this is the, the kind of shared architecture we're gonna see for this whole talk. Okay, so then of course we can use uh, these kind of saliency maps, feature attribution techniques to get a sense of which words positively and negatively impacted this prediction. So uh, the methods here are things like black box and glass, glass box techniques. Um, these have been mentioned uh, kind of frequently in, in previous talks in this workshop, so I'm not gonna go into them in detail, um, but they can give us scores for each of these tokens. Okay. So we've kind of set the stage. What do we want an explanation to actually be able to tell us? So I claim that what we want to be able to do is formulate a hypothesis. Like, oh, okay, the model got this example right, and it got it right because it's doing the right reasoning. It's looking at these two documentary tokens and managing to connect them. We could test that. We can construct some realistic counterfactuals here where we've replaced the word documentary with romance. So this is counterfactual, like this is not about these real films and it actually kind of, you know, makes these examples a little bit weird, but it's still basically reasonable statements, right? What we see actually is that the model always predicts yes in each of these cases. So the model actually is not really comparing the two documentary tokens here. Um, and so this hypothesis is false, like the model's predicting yes, but somehow for the wrong reasons. So. In, in this part, we're not actually going to worry too much about what the model's doing. The question is, do the explanations tell us the right thing? And in this case, if we use a uh, technique like integrated gradients, we're going to get a very strong attribution to the documentary tokens. So if a practitioner looks at a, this explanation, they might think, oh, OK, great. It's doing exactly the right thing. It's looking at documentary, comparing them, great. But there's a mismatch here. And that's what we want to try to figure out. So um, when there's this kind of sea of explanation techniques and we don't know which ones to trust, um, here's a way that we can maybe say some explanation techniques are better than others because they let us figure out what's going to happen with these realistic counterfactuals. So the kind of core thing we're looking at is what we call high level model behavior, wanting to make these kind of sweeping statements about a model rather than just on one specific example, but being able to extract something higher level, like generally when the model gets it right, it's doing this by contrasting these two tokens. And we're going to see whether explanations can help us figure this out. Um, and that's going to be the kind of core question that, that we addressed in this work. 
Okay, so uh, just to provide another kind of quick view of the procedure with a little bit more detail. So we construct these counterfactuals based on what we call a base example. And then we run the model because this is a more kind of diagnostic setting. So we run the model on these counterfactuals and extract a label of the model behavior. So this is evaluated with respect to this hypothesis. So in this case, we find that no, the model is not looking at the documentary tokens correctly. So we say the label here is false. Then we look at the explanations and we extract uh, a factor or basically a single real valued feature based on summing the importance of the kind of tokens relevant to the hypothesis. And so this is not a fully automated procedure. This is like we we kind of uh, you know looked at this particular class of questions and, and sort of figured out how to do this. Um, but the idea is that we are going to be able to evaluate a broad class of techniques on this data set. Um, and then the kind of final piece here is based on this feature, this token importance, we want to predict the label in this kind of simulation process. So we, we say basically, did the explanation tell us the right thing? Um, and we can just measure that with, with accuracy. Basically, did the thing derived from the explanation really reflect the model behavior? So the nice thing about this technique is that we can actually compare different formats of explanations. So we can look at these saliency maps or kind of token attribution methods, um, which have you know all, all come up in, in previous talks here. Um, and we can also look at a, new, a newer brand of methods called uh, feature interaction methods. So these instead attribute decisions to interactions between subsets of the input or to kind of attention uh, or kind of attention links between pairs of tokens. Um, and so there were two existing techniques and then we kind of uh, took one of them and, and tweaked it to make it better using a kind of integrated gradient style annealing but over the attention maps in a particular way. I'm not gonna go into it here because it's not the main focus here. Sorry, we have a thunderstorm, it just shook my whole house. Um, so we uh, compare these seven techniques across uh, three different question answering settings. I'm just gonna show you one here. Um, so the one is going to be this setting that we've been looking at where we have these binary questions, a whole set of them. And we look at whether the model is kind of successfully comparing these property tokens. We construct these counterfactuals manually. Um, we're looking at whether or not the model kind of correctly changes its behavior when the tokens are changed and then the kind of way we do that is through looking at this, uh, this attribute, these attributions. Okay, so finally we come to the results. So this is evaluated on 200 data points that were these manually constructed sets of counterfactuals. Um, and again, we evaluate on the y-axis accuracy. And so what we see here is I think quite interesting, which is that different methods correlate, to model correlate with model behavior to different degrees on this data, right? So regardless of kind of the theoretical underpinnings or whatever, like we see that these methods really do different things in terms of being able to tell us about this set of counterfactuals. Um, and so this, uh, this technique on the right, uh, which is interaction based is kind of the best overall one. Um, but I think this is more broadly a kind of way to just quantify the differences here and really understand what explanations can tell us. So they can, tell us about how much we can trust our methods, how we can gain that trust, and maybe which explanation techniques should kind of work better or worse for different kinds of problems. So that's kind of one piece of the puzzle I wanted to share today. And the next is thinking about how we can actually take that, take these explanation methods and actually build them into a system to extract information in an informative and reliable way. Um, so this is work led by a uh, student, uh, Lian Tang, um, joint with Dhruv Rajan, uh, Suyash Mohan from Penn, uh, Abhijit Pradhan from Galileo CDS, and Nick Ryan from the Dell Medical School here at UT. So um, Dr. Bryan and his collaborators have been looking at uh, systems that involve reasoning about uh, brain MRI in terms of these intermediate key features. Um, so one example of a key feature is mass effect, which as I understand it as, as not a clinician is basically that there's uh, something in the brain that's kind of displacing uh, part of it. And this might be evidence of a tumor or something like that. 
So what we want to do is we are looking at the task of extracting the value of this key feature from radiology reports themselves. So the input is the text of a report and a feature. Um, and again, using the same kind of transformer based methods, we are going to output a value. Um, so uh, my collaborators have been looking at this a lot in terms of image based systems, right? Predicting these kind of intermediates based on the image and then using something like a Bayes net to make a more interpretable prediction of uh, the actual final diagnosis. Um, but extracting from, from text has some value too. Um, we can use that in either clinical decision support settings or um, there's a kind of more low level application which is just producing training data for uh, these kind of image to key feature systems. Okay. So again, we can use the same kind of feature attribution techniques we've been seeing to uh, kind of understand which tokens are leading to this prediction. So uh, here we're using integrated gradients. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna select a set of sentences that explain the prediction. And we're gonna do this by ranking sentences in decreasing order by the kind of overall attribution score. And we're going to pick up sentences until the model's prediction on that subset is very close to what the model predicts on the whole document. I'm gonna come back to this in a second, why we wanna do it this way. Okay, but why do we care about these explanations in general? Well, one reason is spurious correlations. Um, so for example, on this particular example, the word apart has a very high positive uh, correlation with the label, which is not a kind of, it's not causally related to mass effect at all in this case. And so we both worry that this might not work well on new data, and it also might not be very useful to show to a user. Um, so we can, our goal here is to make correct predictions, but also based on the correct evidence, with the idea being that that evidence will be useful in things like clinical decision support applications. So we have three evaluation principles, which I think, again, can be broadly useful in the space beyond this particular problem. We have accuracy. That one's, I think, fairly clear. Um, plausibility. Do the explanations that our model produces agree with the evidence that humans look at? And we can do that by comparing it. And we might want this alignment because then when we show people what's predicted, they say, oh, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. I can very quickly verify that. Um, and the last piece here is faithfulness. Um, and this is where this idea of the kind of sufficient evidence extraction comes in. We wanna make sure that the model's predictions on that kind of important subset match it on the whole document. Now, this doesn't necessarily ensure that the model is like behaving, you know, making the prediction for the right reasons, right? Um, but we have kind of two pieces of evidence which suggest that these picked out sentences are important. One is that these kind of gradient based attribution methods, and another is the fact that the prediction is the same. It could be a coincidence, but, um, you know, again, we have two pieces of evidence here. Okay. So we looked a little bit, I'm gonna kind of gloss over this part because it's not too important for the talk. Um, we looked at two ways of incorporating supervision um, based on kind of uh, human indicators of what's important um, into the model. So we had a way of basically telling the model to attend to these particular things at the last layer of the neural network, um, as well as a way of saying, if we kind of remove all of the relevant indicators, the model should not be sure what the output is and should return turn a uniform distribution over options. Okay, so uh, when we train the model with these two techniques, um, that leads to our model that we're gonna label as sufficient best, where the evidence extraction is this sufficient thing. Okay, um, so we got data um, from folks at Penn who labeled around 80 reports with ground truth labels for each key feature and associated highlights of what they thought the clinically relevant uh, kind of parts of the report were. Um, and so we have other data that's kind of a little bit noisier. Um, I'm not gonna go into that here. Um, but basically what we compared here was both accuracy and also evidence extraction across four methods. Um, just running our uh, pre-trained model on the full document, a rule-based system, this sufficient extraction method and this kind of best model. Um, and so we see kind of turning to evidence extraction that 
uh, a rule-based system is really good at it. You can kind of specify some regular expressions and kind of pull out the right terms, but it's actually a little bit hard to kind of figure out exactly the values of this T feature um, you know, from rules alone without kind of more heavy engineering. Um, so our learned model, this sufficient best model is able to uh, kind of balance both extracting relevant evidence, um, but also getting at least decent accuracy. And I'll say that this 60 F1 is because this is averaged across all of the classes, including some very rare ones. Um, so the actual accuracy is, is a bit higher than this, but I think it still motivates why we want to be able to look at the extracted evidence and have someone vet this kind of post hoc. Um, so we really want explanations here that both correspond to what the model is doing, they're faithful, and also match what humans are doing. They're, they're, uh, they're plausible. So for this kind of application, using only a rule-based system is restrictive, but obviously there's issues when you try to integrate machine learning. Um, so we tried to put together a pipeline that kind of balances these different considerations and is going to show information that's actually useful for uh, someone who might come along and check this later. And so um, where we're kind of headed with this is hopefully integrating this into a real clinical decision support system. Um, that's something that obviously my collaborators would be better equipped to, you know, talk about the nuts and bolts of how that's going to work. But I think we'll have to address a lot of the issues that have come up in this uh, workshop of how we uh, actually take explanations, whether they're useful for someone actually looking at it. We all, we'll have to figure that out in the context of this system. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I think the sort of kind of takeaways I want you to have are that we are building towards methods that allow us to understand the importance of tokens in these kind of counterfactual settings and understand how well explanations can tell us about that. Um, and they can also you know, help us uh, give evidence to a human to verify what a model is doing. But, these aren't going to be perfect. We need humans in the loop. And I, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to discussing this more on the panel. Um, so that's it. Uh, thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank you so much, Greg. And um, like you just introduced, we're going to get right into the panel here, which is facilitated by Ben Glicksberg, who I'll introduce briefly, but just as, an, um, as a couple instructions for the panel, I will be muting everyone. And if you have a question, please um, use your reaction button to raise your hand, and Ben and I will help um, have the questions come forward. So I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone now. And great. But if our speakers, yeah, I will um, unmute our speakers in just a moment when Ben is giving his introduction. So Ben Glicksberg is an assistant professor at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in the departments of AI and human health, medicine and genetics, genomic scientist, and a member of the Hasso Plattner Institute for Digital Health. He is also an adjunct faculty member of digital engineering at the Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam, Germany. His research uses machine learning to couple multimodal patient health data and forward personalized medicine. He completed his PhD in neuroscience at the ICANN School of Medicine in Mount Sinai in 2017 and his postdoctoral work at the University of California, San Francisco in 2019. So Ben, if you are here, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and you can go ahead and introduce the panel. Hi everyone. Oops, I think I have, I have two, um, one second. Can you guys, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm, I'm also in a hotel with uh, very bad Wi-Fi, so I apologize for um, not having my camera on. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, my whole system will crash. Uh, um, but it's a, it's a real pleasure um, to hear. We've heard some absolutely fantastic talks today. Uh, this is such an exciting topic. And um, I know these, are, these have been uh, truly, uh, these are some of the leaders in the field. And I'm really excited for um, delving right in. Um, I do have a list of questions that I have, and I think we can we can. Um, I uh, the, the the one thing I do want to mention before is we are having a little bit of an issue, uh, a very 21st century problem with a potential Zoom bomber. So uh, apologies in advance if um, uh, you know any any inappropriate. Uh, questions are asked, but the moderating team 
uh, has been doing a great job uh, uh, so far into um, preempting uh, any any of these uh, attacks, if you will. So uh, I think one thing that I would like to do first is um, because everyone might not have been here for every talk. So I would love um, if uh, I can go around and just call on the panelists to give a uh, one to two sentence elevator pitch on um, just your area of interest uh, and, uh, and, and, and mostly what type of data uh, that you're working with. And then I'd like to give an opportunity. I know that there were probably a lot of burning questions uh, during the talks that we needed to hold off uh, for now. So um, I, I, I know we had a, a slight schedule change. Um, is Marinka um, replacing Faye for, for uh, this panel? Uh, Faye is here. Faye should be oh, able Faye's to here. Try. Yes. Oh, uh, Faye. Madeline, okay. can you unmute Faye? Uh, I, I, asked, I asked you to unmute. I think you have to select. Um, to unmute. Okay. Faye, can you yeah, select unmute? Okay, let's go. Oh, am I on? I think I, I, I'm on uh, tomorrow's panel, right? I, I was swapped with Marinka. Is that right? No? Since you are here, you better. <laughs> okay, <laughs> since Marinka, is Marinka here too? Oh. No, okay. I, I guess uh, um, uh, Dr. Wong, if you could go first and give a uh, just a, a very uh, two sentence intro of, of kind of the, the main area that you're in and the the type of data you're working mostly with. Oh yeah, sure. So, so I actually, I, I was, uh, I am going to present tomorrow. Actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so, you give, so you give a peek. yeah, yeah, sure. So, so I have been working on uh, like uh, uh, similar to Ben, all, uh, uh, different kinds of healthcare data, but uh, 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 mainly like in the past ten years, uh, electronic health records and um, uh, claims, this kind of um, uh, clinical data. And recently, I have also been trying to integrate. Uh, uh, like uh, the omics data to try to explain some of the observations, uh, I mean, from the mechanistic level. Um, so I'm a, I'm a machine learning person by training. My PhD thesis is about actually a graph-based learning back to 15 years ago. And uh, nice to see everyone here. Great, thanks. And now we can have uh, Dr. Beam, if you could give uh... Just a two sentence refresh for those who may who may have not been uh, available during your talk. Um, my group for, for methods researches deep learning techniques for healthcare data with a special emphasis on causal inference. Um, the application areas that I work in are neonatal and perinatal applications. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Durrett? Is, uh, is Greg? Uh... Oh, oh, maybe maybe you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I muted because we have, we have a thunderstorm here and it's like making a lot of noise. So, but oh, I, I will I won't touch the mute button. Yeah, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I work uh, primarily on uh, techniques in NLP. Um, so things like question answering, information extraction, and summarization. Um, in the clinical domain, the type of data we've been working with mostly has been uh, radiology reports, with a little bit recently um, on uh, me medical records. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Lakarju. I think we're still waiting for her to join if we want to move on to Dr. Oh, ah, okay. Uh, then uh, Dr. Klang. Yeah, hello, I'm a physician from Shiva Medical Center. I'm a radiologist by profession and also do data science. And now I had the AI in the Innovation Center in Shiba. So uh, I practically work on ap applying uh, models to the clinical work. So mainly different kind of clinical data, tabular, uh, NLP and uh, vision. Thank you. So uh, this is actually a, a quite an amazing group of people here. And before I, I get into my questions, I don't wanna be selfish. Um, I know we, we there were there were a few people that potentially had questions from the participants. Um, uh, I want to give um, uh, Madeline. I'm not sure if if if, if they're going to chat or do they um, raise their hand. 
Yes, if you have a question, if you could just please raise your hand using the reaction button and I'll, I'll help in um, select questions to go start off. We don't have anyone raising their hand yet. Oh, okay, 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 so, so great, we can. So I wanna, I wanna kick off with, with maybe the, the most um, controversial subject uh, of the, oh wait, I think we have one actually. Yes, I just saw that. If you wanna go ahead, um, Ian, I can, I think you can unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, I'll ask a question to Dr. Ben. So, uh, so I, rem I remember that the authors of the paper, medical uh, algorithmic audit, mentioned that the uh, explainability methods, such as the uh, and maps and and feature real visualization and attention maps, are important to help with the uh, algorithmic audit in terms of the exploratory error analysis. For example, you could find some errors caused by a wrong focus of a CNN algorithm, for example, use the skin surgical markings to diagnose cancer. So how, how do you comment on this? Do you uh, suggest that we don't use explainability at all, or we uh, still need to pull up the explainability and determine whether to use it given what they provide? Thank you. So in the talk, I mentioned that um, as part of an auditing procedure, I'm 100% behind using explainability. Um, and, and then, you, but you know, think about what you're doing in an audit is you're trying to find failure cases where accuracy or whatever metric you're measuring is negatively, um, uh, negatively affected. Um, so explainability um, in um, service of validation, I have no problem with. Thank you. So that that's actually the um, a great question, and that's that's actually where um, uh, uh, I wanted to start because I think this this panel I'm not sure um, if we're if we're split or not, but I believe there's um, an active debate uh, right of of, of how um, uh, explainability um, could be used or should be used in practice. Um, and I promise I, I came up with these questions without knowing the context of a lot of these talks and. Uh, they actually address some of uh, what I was going to ask, but maybe a question for uh, Dr. Beam just along those lines. So um, for the auditing process um, for software as a medical device, um, is there um, protections that are currently um, added for like things like population shift or, pop or, or data distribution drift? And if so, how do you see, could, could explainability be used as a kind of metric of um, uh, uh, decreasing performance over time or, or, or lack of suitability um, over time for, for a model? So, I mean, auditing is still like an underdefined exercise in that there aren't like rigorous guidelines that outline what a comprehensive auditing procedure are. Um, so I think that it's hard for me to imagine um, so I, I think about this in terms of uncertainty quantification versus explainability. And if we mm -hmm. want to see um, if a given data point or a collection of data has moved away from the training dis distribution over time, that seems more naturally posed to me as an uncertainty quantification exercise versus an explainability exercise. And I think that that's pretty consistent with a lot of my views on this is that people want to use explainability to quantify uncertainty, but we actually have ways to directly quantify uncertainty. So if we want to talk about covariate shift, um, if we want to talk about other types of distributional shift, then we should try and go and directly measure those versus indirectly measuring them with an explainability method. Thank you, thank you. Uh, makes total sense. Anyone else um, have any, any, any comments on um, uh, more on the uncertainty principles of, of, of modeling, or, or I can, I have some other areas that we can delve into as well. I guess maybe, yeah, maybe let me just chime in Please. with like, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think like, you know, one, one of the things I talked briefly about was this idea of trying to kind of correlate explanations with those actual, like, um, you know, uh, kind of reasoning about counterfactuals, but like, I, I actually do basically fundamentally agree with with Andrew's argument here that like, um, you know, we would be better off if we just kind of measured these things and had a good kind of functional understanding of how they work. Explanations can maybe play a part in that, but, um, you know, a big part of and I think what we saw earlier, I mean, I don't want to speak for folks who aren't here, but from like uh, Marzia and, and Hema's parts was like, uh, you know, kind of all these sorts of issues with these models that 
you probably need to rigorously audit them anyway for all of these things like bias. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if we had perfect, perfect explanation techniques, maybe we could sidestep that or save some time there. But like, if you need to do that anyway, might as well just do it. So uh, in terms of your, um, I, I know it's, it's a very uh, nascent field, right? Uh, in some ways, the book is still being written uh, as it's being deployed. I mean, do, do any of you have any thoughts or reflections about your, your own institutions? I mean, are, are models being operationalized? Are they being uh, deployed in any way? Are there any trials? Um, is there, and, and not to put, uh, you know, any institution on the spot, but just some general reflections of, like what's being done? I, I, I guess I, I can I can kick off uh, I can kick it off with um, saying that at Mount Sinai, uh, there, there, obviously this um, uh, very right, uh, rightfully so controversy of of you know bias and ethics and and modeling. We, we actually started in. Um, AI ethics panel that that basically reviews trying to come up with a guidebook uh, to to try to review um, each model in terms of um, fairness across subpopulations uh, and and try to have like an active board that monitors uh, performance uh, over time and of, and of course there's procedures on silent pilots uh, that that are just beginning but wanted to hear if anyone had any. Uh, 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 interactions or, or experiences with with those kind of things. Uh, I mean, I'll just uh, dunk on my own institution um, before okay. other folks can tell me how it's actually done. Uh, if it's not basic science, um, Harvard tends to not care about it, and so I would say that we are really behind lots of other institutions when it comes to implementing and deploying um, these things across the the Harvard medical ecosystem. Um, lots of great research going on, obviously, but when it actually comes to implementing some of these things, I think we, I could, I could learn a ton from uh, the other panelists um, here. I'm sure. Well, it's a brave new world. I mean, it's it's, it's scary. So, what what about uh, in Israel, uh, um, Al? Uh, are are there any kind of uh, exposures that you have? That are are similar concerns being voiced? Oh, I think that you know. Yes and no. So regarding like bias, yes, but not as much as you, you, I know that you discussed that in the US. It's not, you know, and I feel that um, like bias is like the first trench, but there are much harder trenches to pass other than bias. So it's like bias, it's like, it's almost like, you know, going to, uh, uh, look under the uh, the lamp, or how do you say that? Under the lamp. I think there are much bigger problems in AI. Somebody said before, uh, you know, uh, there are still radiologists or something like that, and that's true, right? But I think uh, there will be a time <coughs> when AI will be better than uh, physicians, and then you'll have much bigger problems than bias. Will you let AI take the decision? Uh, I, I, and I can give you an example that that's, that's it, it make it easy to see that it's true because uh, you can look at the uh, um, systems, uh, decision support, it's not decision support, but let's say decision support for, you know, IVF blastocytes. And you know, you take films of the blastocyte like every 20 minutes or something like that. And you, you end up with like 4,000 4, uh, images of the blastocyte. And it turns out that deep learning can be better than humans in deciding which blastocyte is the best to, for fertilization, right? So right now, nobody says that you should trust the AI better than the physician, but it will come very soon because if it's a matter of the health of the newborn and the healthy delivery, it, it, the question will arise, right? So then you have much, big, I think much bigger ethical questions than bias. For, that's what I think. So that's one question. And another question is like, you know, um, I think there are 
so so that's the first range and that's the easiest trench to look at, but then you have other many other trenches that you have to pass. Hmm. And you know, you have like, and you say, well, there are no, uh, there's still radiologists, that's true, but I can, I can see at my hospital, you, we have, um, for GI, we have uh, GI genius for all the colonoscopies. And we have at least, I think, two. Uh, we have AI doc, and I think another um, another AI machine in the radiology. And I think we have that in other fields. And I know in Mount Sinai you have this AI and AI doc for radiology. And I think other machines are also creeping in, right? Mm -hmm. So this is. Thank you for that. I mean, this is a very tangential, and I. I I want to be wary about uh, diver diverting too much from the explainability um, focus. But one thing that, and and actually, I'm uh, I'm going to ask Faye uh, this. But um, uh, I love I love uh, Andrew's um, uh, uh, thoughts afterwards. But I, you know, there there was a paper from Harvard, uh, and uh, Andrew, I believe you were on this one about the adversarial attacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you go second. Now. Um, I want to hear, because um, I know I've talked with Faye a bunch on um, uh, the possibility of corruption uh, of modeling and how that could fit into causing problems. Uh, Faye, I mean, do you have a sense of, uh, is there a role or, or there's concerns? I know in federated learning, there's, there's certainly a concern, uh, but do you see any uh, issues uh, for, because some of these systems, as Ayal was saying, are being implemented. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think Andrew was the first author of that paper, actually. <laughs> I, think, so, I think it was last. I think Sam Sam, oh, Sam, Sam was, right? Yeah, I think I oh, was. Oh, Sam was the first author. Okay, I was okay. First senior on that one, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think. Um, um, I think these are different things. I think for uh, that paper is mostly about the potential risk of adversarial type of uh, attack. I mean, uh, uh, in that paper, I think, um, Andrew, you guys listed out like potential scenarios like uh, uh, inference fraud, right? Uh, these kind of thing. I, I think uh, for federated learning, I think one of the, uh, Ben, we talked about uh, main, main concern is actually this uh, data set shift, you know? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. it's not necessarily, we learn a global model, it's gonna outperform your local model. It really depends on how much shift you have. We observe on, on some of uh, the data, I mean, by global uh, global uh, aggregation, may even get a model that uh, performs worse uh, than some of the local model. Um, but but uh, Andrew, actually, uh, I'm also interested in hearing your thought about that uh, regarding the perspective uh, adversarial attack. I, I don't know. I mean, I I I, I, I agree. Like that insurance fraud could very be will be a, a scenario that this could can, uh, this could happen but but when i talk to other folks about these uh, uh, potential concerns or, or or threats i think the uh, the, the missing people wondering are like uh, what are the realistic scenarios these things can mm -hmm. happen um i'm thinking of in addition to that inference fraud type of thing is there any other uh, scenarios you see this could be a potential threat especially for clinical data yeah, so I'll I'll answer that and then I'll try and Ben bring it back around to explainability. Um, so that great, we can thank you. <laughs> come full circle. So, when we wrote that paper, I think what we were really thinking about is pointing out an unintended consequence of what seemed to be like a um, an unalloyed good, um, in the sense that like if we had superhuman um, clinical um, AI that could do diagnostic medical imaging super well, um, it, I, we weren't hearing anyone really talk about unintended consequences. Um, and so in this case, we were pointing out the security vulnerability of adversarial attacks. I think the realistic scenario for those is more like if um, smartphone apps become ubiquitous. So if there's an, if you can take a picture of a mole and the insurance company then recognizes that, um, I think you probably still have to go to unrealistic um, types of things to have it happening within a hospital. So like to think that a radiologist is going to tamper with an x-ray in the hospital before it gets read by a deep learning um, system is probably unrealistic. So as the technology becomes more ubiquitous, I think some of those attack vectors become more likely. 
Um, but what uh, I think the main message of that paper was pointing out unintended con unintended consequences of um, and, and non intuitive unintended consequences that you sort of have to be steep in the technology to know that this was even a vulnerability um, in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the to bring this back to explainability, the thing that I find confusing, and I'm not an expert in this, but I would love to hear Greg's um, thoughts is when I see counterfactual explanations, they look like adversarial attacks to me. Um, the way that they're written down. Um, often is this minimax statement where you're trying to find a minimum perturbation to a, a an instance that flips that thing's prediction, and we're calling this sort of a counterfactual um, explanation. So when I go and read that literature, they sort of look like adversarial attacks to me, but we're calling them counterfactual explanations. To be fair, counterfactual in my world has a very different and very specific kind of meaning, um, but uh, I, it, it's slightly confusing to me um, that what looks like an adversarial attack um, is now being uh, used as an explanation, but it's possible I'm misunderstanding that. I, I guess I would say like from, from my perspective, like they, they are definitely related things where a lot of adversarial attacks are these kind of minimal modifications. I mean, I think they're related in the sense that like, you know, a person is not going to be fooled by a lot of these small changes, right? Um, and so I, I, think, I think saying that, okay, well, the model's prediction would have been different if this, this, and this, like, yeah, attributes were different. Like, I mean, it, it's a small change, but uh, I mean, also if those are changes that are super threshold for a human, then it's no longer really adversarial. If it's something like, oh, you deleted all the commas and now the model is no longer making the right prediction, that's a little more adversarial in flavor. On the other hand, it still represents the kind of thing where like, if the model's prediction would change if there were no commas in it, that's like a kind of red flag, I think. Um, so, I mean, I think the goals are similar, kind of robustness in a neighborhood around uh, the data point that you have, whether like how much that's really important, if like your system always has text with commas in it, like maybe that doesn't matter for you. Um, but I, like, I do think it's the kind of thing that we want to know from both perspectives. Yeah, can I, can, can I say something about that? So, so I think, uh, Andrew, I have been thinking about this uh, for a while, um, about the difference of counterfactual and uh, perturb adversarial perturbations, right? I think one key difference, if you think about counterfactual, is we care about the feasibility. Let's say if we perturb, I mean, image is different, okay? Image, because you can always make like subtle and human eye cannot be perceivable. But, but let's think about EHR. If you want to perturb, let's say I have a mortality predictor. I want to perturb the patient records. I mean, most likely on lab because those are, uh, you know, continuous values. I mean, compared to binary zero one, that's much easier to perturb, you know, but, but you can perturb it in a way that, in a subtle way that maybe human imperceivable and uh, it changed the outcome of prediction, but it may not be actually, I mean, these things may not be feasible because those variables, they have some, uh, you know, uh, configurations, let, let's say uh, like, uh, some some fever, some temperature, some you know like uh, uh, BMI, these kind of stuff. You 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 when you perturb them, I mean it it may achieve your goal of slight perturbation, but and also change the outcome. But in reality, this cannot happen. Let's say it, it is out of the range of uh, uh, I mean, or it, it violates the biologies, mm -hmm. right? So I think in in in, in uh, like uh, adversarial. Uh, either attack or uh, you know interpretation. I think people don't talk too much about actionability or feasibility. But for counterfactual, I think there is also a related uh, uh, concept called algorithmic recourse. So so they typically have uh, some constraints. Uh, you have to perturb that in a certain range, or you have to guarantee this and that variable. They have to change in a, a, a reverse way. These kind of things to guarantee. This is something realistic. So because I do counterfactual to make decisions so that I don't want to go that way or do uh, or, or go with that way. So I think uh, this, this might be a slight difference of this two. So that's helpful because adversarial examples almost always push the adversarial point off of the data manifold. You can think about data yeah. on this manifold and adversarial examples almost always push them off. But you're saying that counterfactual explanations you must somehow maintain some distance to the data manifold. Right, I think this distance design is the key. That's all. Great, um, no, this is uh, super, super enlightening. Um, so I guess to, to uh, think about going, think, think about what's, uh, uh, what's new, well, 
one one question I had is so I, we were we're questioning the uh, importance necessity of explainability in kind of predictive models, but uh, in in the text world, there there's a lot of ways that um, uh, NLP um, can be very helpful for different aspects of uh, the clinical workflow. Uh, and I just wanted to hear from Greg, like in what 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 are you most excited about? Going forward, about um, some NLP work, you know, we can we we can think about autofill. We can think about image to text. Um, are there any things that you're particularly excited about um, uh, that will be, you know, permeating the the space in the near future, and and more so the biomedical space? Yeah, I mean, I think like so. So I think there's a lot of uh, kind of tools out there now that are, um, you know, possibly going to be useful. I mean, I guess one thing I'm, I'm a little bit biased by what uh, we've been looking at lately with uh, uh, Ng and uh, Justin and Ifan and Yanchen who are, who are on the call, I guess. Um, you know, I think being able to take lots of like EHR uh, data and summarize it um, is one thing that I think is very interesting. I mean, I think like the kinds of just like, like I guess what I'm a little bit less interested in for, for myself is just like the kinds of, you know, make a direct prediction and kind of get a model that like, you know, works super well for that. I think like when you have really complex problems, like, you know, how can we quickly get up to speed on what's going on with this patient and you need a kind of targeted summary um, of what's going on with them. Uh, that's a very human in the loop thing. It might be interactive. The person might say, oh, okay, like, you know, I see that there is this pre-existing uh, condition, like tell me more about that or something like that. A kind of interactive way of digging through and uh, kind of uh, seeing a view of, of health data. Um, that's something that I think would be, uh, would be great to see. And I, I mean, I think it, like with the rise of these, uh, you know, large pre-trained models, I think we're getting better at better at text generation tasks. So um, my hope would be that we can get just much better interfaces for this stuff, um, you know, in addition to the kind of like information extraction, sort of predictive model decision support stuff that I think has been the bread and butter for the last, you know, five to 10 years or whatever. Yes, speaking of the, uh, you know, these, these large scale transformer models, uh, do you or anyone else uh, based on, I, I, I forget who the exact presenter was, but gave that really great example of um, uh, MedBert being trained on, or Clinic, Clinic Bert being trained on PubMed and that bias just permeating through. Is there still risk of, you know, training on, on clinical notes? I, I know, Al, you're in this space as well, uh, but does anyone want to comment on, on the kind of risk that's already embedded in, in, in these uh, clinical documents? Do you mean that um, the the data sets we have are biased and there's some exactly yeah so I think that what makes medicine different than other areas of machine learning NLP computer vision um, is that the data that we have access to is not collected. Uh, it, it's collected to facil fil facilitate billing and reimbursement. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be reflect reflective of structural biases, uh, both for the purpose that it's collected for, um, but also structural biases of, of the, the physicians and the healthcare workforce and the patients that they treat. So I, I sort of think of that as like this, the central challenge for um, medical machine learning is that we have this data set that is, is essentially a collection of receipts uh, in some ways. Um, and it's not sort of a high signal um, um, data set that other areas of machine learning get to use. And so that can certainly manifest it way, itself in operation, operationalizing systematic biases against certain groups. Um, it can also just make our models learn things that we don't really care about. Um, like if you're predicting mm -hmm. billing codes, you're not predicting the clinical state of the patient, you're predicting what the physician billed for, which is only loosely correlated with the clinical state of the patient. Um, so I think that that type of bias in the data creeps up in lots of different ways. Um, and if, if I had a magic wand, uh, or, or if I had to guess what would give us a breakthrough in medical machine learning, it's going to be a new, cheap, high-dimensional measurement technology that's prospectively collected on all patients. So like, I always think of the tricorder or something like that. A patient comes <laughs> in, you scan, you get a yeah. rich readout of physiology. That's something that we can work with. Um, but the sort of EHR as it's currently instantiated, 
um, there's just certain questions that you're not able to ask. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, th thanks for uh, saying that so clearly. I was actually um, referring uh, more towards the, the text itself and like progress notes. Um, and, you know, the fact that as you're saying, uh, there's this huge missing dimension of like social determinants of health and a lot of like progress notes uh, or uh, admission intakes are not taking into account, for instance, I believe homelessness is, is pretty poorly documented. Um, and because these affect uh, di uh, different patient populations disproportionately, not due to any biology, more due to kind of the underlying societal circumstances, that's what I was referring to in, in, in these like transformer models that are built off of these corpora. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I, th I think the, the point you're making certainly still qualifies. Yeah, Ben, I think uh, I, I agree with, uh, uh, with, with uh, what, uh, uh, I'm just thinking of what, what you said and, and what Andrew said uh, kind of aligns. So I, I'm, I'm just thinking of, uh, I, uh, uh, from uh, Angel's perspective, so uh, Ben, what what you have been working on, like these multimodal learning stuff, is, <laughs> is I'm thinking of uh, very important, is because uh, exactly like yeah, based just based on the single information source, it's uh, really hard to tell what kind of bias and what kind of uh, you know this uh, inherent problems or data qualities, whatever, uh, in there. So uh, like this, uh, Andrew, I think what you said is also kind of like, for example, this uh, all of us. Uh, like initiative, people have uh, uh, definitely before that it is the eMERGE uh, consortium. So people have realized this for sure. And collecting more data prospectively, like what people do pr previously for cohort study, but now on um, uh, much larger uh, population and much general disease uh, uh, phenotypes and to collect all those data from different uh, information sources. And, and also Ben, I'm, just, I'm thinking of, I think what, what you uh, mentioned is uh, the, the example from Marzia's talk. Um, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, and, and, and those biases, uh, I mean, we have to realize it's, it's not just on um, medicine. So like Amazon, you know, they have uh, that Alexa fairness, you know, <laughs> call for machine learning for research award every round, you know? So, so that means that's also when, when you play with Alexa. Uh, so it's, it's also a problem. There, there might be some biases and in, in also, uh, you know, uh, potential problems uh, uh, there as well, although they already have huge amount of data for training, their underlying speech recognition problem. I'm just thinking of if there is, a, I'm thinking of clearly, uh, you know, like incorporating other information, like you said, social determinants of health. I think people have realized that Epic is trying to integrate these kind of uh, a questionnaire about SDOH yeah. in their uh, system. And I think Yang Shan on the call and other folks have, have written quite a few uh, uh, amazing, uh, you know, review articles about what have uh, uh, our like informatics folks done about extracting SDOH uh, from, uh, you know, clinical data or other other type of data. Um, but I'm also thinking of like uh, some 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 fine tuning type of uh, procedure. Uh, is I, I'm just thinking of this adaptation. It's not necessarily just on NLP, but also on imaging. We also see all kinds of biases uh, and potential problems. We directly use, let's say, a model pre-trained on image. Now, I'm thinking of some fine-tuning process might be helpful. And it is, I, I, I'm in my perspective, I'm thinking of it's always needed. Um, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's from audit perspective or like. Um, uh, uh, utility improvement perspective, because uh, it is very, very likely there will be a data set shift or even temporal yeah. shift. Uh, so I'm thinking of that, that might help. Um, yeah, that, that's a great point. Uh, thank you, Faye. And I, I definitely agree that a, a tricorder uh, would, would be ideal eventually. Um, the challenge, of course, now is the the uh, intermediary steps to the tricorder. In some ways, are the digital devices, but as we know, that those themselves still pose issues. Like, for instance, Apple Watch, uh, Fitbit, um, um, uh, Pulse Access. What What'd you say? Pulse. I, I think I know where you're going. Oh, pulse, yeah. pulse, pulse oximeters have the same problem. I Absolutely, yeah. There, there's inbuilt things on, on how they were developed, but also availability, right? It's who the, the, the people that need representation 
can't necessarily afford these uh, these you know eight hundred dollar devices. So I think in some ways it's it's scary that this the next era of multimodal digital health is going to have similar biases already built in, unless you have things like Google Baseline where you're they're giving out um, hundreds of thousands uh, of devices. Uh, but yeah, it's it, and please actually comment on the Pulse Ox example because I think it's really good for the audience to to hear about. Yeah, so I I'm I'm I think I'll get most of the high level things here, but maybe some details will be wrong. Um, that essentially, Pulse Oxes work less well on people of color than they do on white people, um, and and uh, there have been lots of studies that show this in adults and in pediatric populations. Like uh, in the NICU, there was a paper that showed Pulse Oxes can be pretty inaccurate on on black infants and. Um, that permeates you know, or propagates through a lot of the rest of their medical care. If you don't have a good read on someone's oxygen saturation in their blood, uh, then that's going to change the way that you make medical decisions. Um, and uh, it's just a, a sort of another example of um, how uh, certain classes of people essentially get access to second second tier data uh, because uh, the right. data collection devices we have don't work on them. And of course, there are paper like uh, Zaid Obermeyer's that show that these actually have real world consequences because these are how people are getting enrolled in, in, in special programs. And the, the people that need them the most are, are matched unfairly against healthy people who just have generally more access to healthcare. So uh, uh, very, very well put. Um, and it, I think it's gonna be something that um, we're all gonna have to continue to monitor. Um, I guess maybe we could quickly switch gear to more of an optimistic uh, uh, um, uh, idea here. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of dystopian uh, science fiction, but uh, I, I love the, so, so we saw a lot of different modalities. I know, Faye, you're going to give your talk tomorrow. Um, we, we, have, we have EHR, we have text, but um, images, of course, but uh, AL was actually presenting on um, video which I think is uh, pretty special because it, it represents in some ways a, a different type of challenge that um, clinical practitioners or even biomedical researchers uh, encounter, which is it's a lot of data and it takes, not, not to say that other modalities take less skill um, to uh, administer or to interpret, but um, you know, video certainly is is complex for a number of reasons. So I love to hear Ayal, how you see explainability or just modeling in general. Um, how can it facilitate the care process? And what in what you know, who's going to benefit? Is it going to work on the operation, on the efficiency, on the speed, on the training? I uh, just just love your thoughts on that. Well, I think video is a, is a big problem because uh, maybe in tabula data you can present, uh, you know, the the top features very easily and very elegantly uh, to the clinician, and uh, and it helps them uh, trust. I, I know Ben, you did a, a lot of work on that on Mount Sinai uh, during COVID, right? In, in uh, mm -hmm. Right, um, with the work with Intuit that we did. Yes, yes. Uh, it was very important for the and, and um, for the physician to trust the the prediction. Right. Mm -hmm. We we had a great talk from Intuit about how to convince the end user, in this case the physician, about the prediction. And you uh, implemented that in, in tabular in uh, tabular prediction models, right? So in video, it's much uh, much more difficult. Like in in the case of this video capsule that we did, so we did some explainability, and it shows you. Uh, it looks at at uh, at ulcers, and it looks uh, at at, at uh, let, you can even see maybe it's it looks at bigger ulcers, but. In the end, you you end up with some kind of black box in, uh, that you don't really know why why it says that uh, this patient should should get a biological treatment and this patient. In the end, it, it it's not enough, right? Because it's better than the human decision in this case, and uh, and and 
maybe video is a place where where in the end you'll have to trust the machine without getting the full explainability that you wish you could have well in in some ways right like i'm just very naively thinking you know uh radiologist time well, everyone's time is valuable of course but you know one one uh possible help could be uh helping focus right so helping um uh, you know, pinpointing frames or uh, parts yeah. of the video that are they what the model believes is most important just helps guide the review to make it more efficient. Is that something? Yeah, possible? yeah. It's it, it, so that's the first stage, right? So that's the first stage, and and you do that. AI Doc is doing that. You know, in uh, in head CTs and in pulmonary emboli, they put an arrow on the on the finding. Mm -hmm. But here you're still in decision support land, and that's great, really. And uh, I work with AI Doc. I know that uh, uh, radiologists in Mount Sinai also love AI Doc because it, it gives you the arrow, with great explainability. Why this decided that it has, uh, let's, let's say, uh, brain uh, bleeding or aneurysm or whatever. So that's really. Uh, helpful for this is for the physician to trust the but that's like the first stage here you're still in decision support land but i heard that in in europe they just approved uh, an automatic ai for chest x-rays without having the radiologist sign off the, the chest hmm. x-ray and then nobody will look at this explainability. Maybe you can like take 5% of them and, and evaluate. And so you make sure like you validate over time that the, 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 the system still works, but in the end, you won't look at all of them. And again, in, this, uh, in, in predicting the uh, need for biological treatment, it's not like you're pinpointing areas over the video, you get the final result. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's a whole very interesting topic. I, I could be mistaken my details. Maybe someone on the panel um, can remind me. But was it was it Jeff Dean who did the uh, diabetic retinopathy AI? It was a team at Google. Yeah. Uh, so is that is that um, from my understanding of it that was also fully automated? It didn't require review. Is, is that does anyone know if that's true? Do you mean the diagnostic system for diabetic retinopathy? Exactly. So the Google team uh, developed a deep learning system to classify diabetic retinopathy, and they took it to Thailand for a real world exercise, um, and it didn't work. Um, oh, they wow. actually needed, they, they needed lots of manual review because the lighting conditions had changed um, and things like that. There are FDA approved devices that are medical devices that will do diabetic retinopathy um, diagnosis without the oversight of a human physician. The company used to be called IDX, but it's called something else now. Um, but the only person who's operating the medical device is a technician who has, I think, a high school degree, um, and they can sort of render a diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy. Um, so they're certainly out there. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, actually, I think, I think okay. uh, if I can add something, I think please, one of please. the main reason they, they quoted in the news saying that they failed in Thailand deployment is actually they require, and when they train their model, they do have very high quality. I think that's, um, uh, they have two papers. So the, the initial paper on, on JAMA, that's on fundus image. And the later, later one, they have a, based on OCT, that's on nature medicine. I believe that's uh, the one they used to build the prototype. And they, when they, when they uh, uh, train their model, using OCT, they have really good quality images. But mm -hmm. when it, it, it went to Thailand, I mean, the, the image quality got drastically decreased. So the, 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 essentially that leads to a failure on, on the model's prediction, yeah. Yeah, extremely, uh, I mean, this is really at the, at the edge of, you know, it could have potentially disastrous results. I mean, obviously, you know, the Theranos uh, example gets thrown around uh, quite often, but um, I mean, it, it's not so far-fetched that, you know, in both ways, right, false positives and false negatives could be um, both uh, very damaging, of course, depending on the disease. Um, 
To, to be fair to, to Google, though, they did have an uncertainty quantification mechanism. They had a second model that would predict whether or not each image was gradable or readable. Oh, so they, the reason why it failed is because the the is this image of high enough quality um, detector kept throwing out images because all of the images were so poor quality. So they did have that uncertainty quantification mechanism baked into their pipeline. Yeah, you, uh, that's a great point. And Ben, that's that reminds me what you said we talked about earlier about looking at, at the areas where the let's say uh, the probability is close to 0.5 if it's balanced maybe you can cut this area and just look at and and let the machine decide in in areas that that it's certain for and that's a way you can uh, improve or maybe feel more safe about your uh, about what you're doing yeah this is this is a great a great topic on um, I guess non important data. I know I know uh, some of Ying's students uh, are 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 um, working on this and Nifan I believe as well. So I don't want to uh, uh, get into it too much, but just this idea that you know maybe uh, I know this is again possibly an uncertainty uh, issue and not an explainability uh, issue, but I just can't keep. I, I keep in my mind going back to the examples that everyone talks about, um, you know, more so in the general ImageNet um, framework of, of differentiating wolves and uh, uh, and dogs, and you know, it's able to do so well. But it turns out that the um, the wolves always had snow in the background, right? So when you when you apply the saliency map, it it, sh it actually highlights the snow. Same thing, um, and I. Um, Maybe Andrew and others have, have done a lot of image um, uh, deep learning work uh, and, and, and know that, you know, in x-rays, uh, I know ALU as well, uh, some of metadata can be burned in. And so, I'm, I'm, you know, I know this is still blurring the lines between um, uh, certainty and explainability, but I've always kind of thought that it maybe could be this first pass sanity check almost is, is there some huge confounder um, in your in your data that is you know draw uh, driving the uh, association that that you know not not to get into the nitty gritties but is is a huge problem that you have to deal with. Uh, any any thoughts from the panel? Yeah, so I agree, and I think I mentioned in the first part of my talk that like highlighting obvious failure cases, like looking at a watermark on an X ray versus looking at the lungs, is um, for model debugging definitely something that um explainability is good for um and i, I mean I, I, greg talked a little bit too about shortcut features um and i i think that shortcut features are a huge problem for uh, a lot deep learning models in a lot of areas um and uh, explainability can definitely help you identify some of them um but uh, they can't help you solve them uh, they can help you identify them but they can't help you sort of account for or exactly. mitigate them there's been, I think, a growing interest in sort of how to um, do things like kind of debias your data or sort of inoculate it against learning shortcut features. Like you learn a simple model that learns the shortcuts and then you learn a like residual model on top of that. Um, one also follow up to the um, paper that I talked about that um, we're going to present at uh, ACL this summer is uh, basically trying to use explanations for uncertainty calibration, essentially, like based awesome. on this explanation, does it seem like the model kind of went off the rails and did something weird. Um, and I mean, the answer is kind of a definite maybe, like, you know, it, it sort of works a bit. It's not as much of a slam dunk as we were hoping. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's like, I guess the way I kind of ultimately see it, and I, I think this is uh, in agreement with what Andrew's been saying, is like, it's kind of getting more bits, right? Like if you're mm -hmm. interested in analyzing and um, kind of auditing what's going on in the model, like the explanation is giving you more information. It's not total noise, like, so it can help in, in some regard, um, but you need these other kind of safeguards or analysis techniques too. Yeah, I think oh. another thing I want to add is that I think it's important for uh, uh, us, uh, I mean, uh, when we develop, models to have to have this mindset on the existence of these potential confounders it's not just a prediction going to give you everything so there could be spurious correlations and confoundings or even more complicated 
like uh, hidden confoundings that uh, it's not obvious in, in the data. Uh, so that can help us definitely um, either design these um, uh, uncertainty quantification or explanation uh, uh, techniques. Awesome. Um, uh, if I could, if I could just plug one of, one oh, of please, my own papers. Uh, act, shortcut features are actually not confounders in the subject to the traditional definition of confounding. They can actually take a bunch of different call, causal structures, one of which is a confounder. They could be mediators. They can be lots of different uh, things. We have a paper coming out that tries to specify what we mean when we say a shortcut feature using DAGs and stuff like that that will hopefully be coming out soon. That's great. And this is a, the purpose of a panel is to uh, promote your own stuff. So uh, <laughs> please, uh, please share it with the group when, when it comes out. I'm sure I'll see, I'm sure I'll see it on Twitter. Uh, so as a quick time check, I think we have five minutes left. I know I've been, I've been hogging the time. Uh, so if there are any participants that uh, want to uh, ask a question to a really illustrious panel, uh, this is your chance. And I guess while we wait to see if there are any participants. So for any of the panelists, I've been, I've been really driving the conversation, but are there any aspects or uh, components of, uh, of this field that I didn't touch on or we didn't really get into that you'd like to, that you'd like to bring up? Uh, I or have a question. Yeah, if possible. I can ask. Um, so we are we are we are doing the grand cam like uh, using grand cam. Of, of course, it's feature attribution method, and there are so many different grand cam. Like uh, even you know you have grand cam and guided the grand cam actually combine the back propagation with grand cam together using uh, and then they have a high, high resolution cam. So all these claim uh, they have a different issue uh, deal with two things. One, how do you deal with the, the gradient? How do you deal with the positive and negative gradients? And uh, the pooling, it, it, the mass, the, the one, doc, one paper said the max pooling actually destroy all the feature attribution uh, things because it's actually, uh, you know, screen out certain uh, features uh, already. So uh, I just want to ask the panelists, uh, how do you view this issue in the explainability? I mean, I guess, I guess I'll say that I think that like, a lot of these methods like have a sort of nice theoretical underpinning, like all the sort of, you know, gradient times input and kind of gradient based methods have like, th like there is a nice motivation there, like locally, that is the importance of this feature. Um, but then, you know, you see the rise of things like integrated gradients, which shows that actually like, you know, you have problems like kind of saturation of features. And so, you know, you need to think about all these kind of weird I don't know, counterfactual is such an overloaded word, but weird counterfactuals where it's like your whole data vector times 0.5 or whatever. Um, it, like, I, I think there's that, like, I think the kind of theory starts to break down rapidly enough that like we have a bunch of techniques and it's really hard to just in a pure theoretical way in a problem independent setting, just say this method is better than this one or more correct than this one. I think we need a set of diagnostics um, about how we can understand what like whether these techniques are telling us something useful and then of course there's the whole like you know they're supposed to be showing stuff to people right so like even if it highlights something that's like mathematically correct like maybe there is a better form of highlight you could have shown that actually would have just been strictly better for the person to have seen for whatever they're trying to do whether it's understand the model or the data or whatever so um i yeah i don't know that's kind of a non-answer yeah. but i think it's that we need um we need those kind of like diagnostics rather than like better theory or to figure out the answer to it that way. Yeah, I, I think this is great, uh, great uh, discussion because this leads to actually what Andrew mentioned in his talk about clinical, random clinical trial for explainability. I really love this idea. I just want to ask you, how, how do you think this can proceed? Like uh, we can try different, like Greg said, we can try different methods and randomize the data set how you guys already did something or any go Matt, you, you want to? Proceed? Yeah, so I was actually referring to RCTs of the model. So like, mm -hmm. um, like the model makes the prediction and then we're assessing that as an intervention on some clinical outcome, um, 30 day mortality, something like that. But you could do the same thing for explainability where um, there's a, uh, you know, a treatment arm and a control arm and you're seeing do doctors make better decisions with ex an explainability tool versus with not. I do think there are some studies like that. Mm -hmm. 
um, but you could certainly do that type of um, comparison to see whether or not explainability in some settings is a useful sort of add-on to the prediction model. So you think a clinical trial for the explainability also has to be have to have a doctor in the end to really evaluate because all the other ground truths not necessarily is correct ground truths as you said before, right? Well, you'd, be, you'd be looking at it. Does a doctor who have access to an explainability method versus a doctor who doesn't have access to an explainability method make better decisions? Um, mm -hmm. So do they get to the correct diagnosis more quickly? Do they do their patients get readmitted more on average? Like those those type of outcomes based thing versus like, is this explanation correct versus is this explanation not correct? You'd be looking at sort of downstream outcomes where the explainability is functioning as part of the decision making process. Great. I was thinking about if we dissect the data into different population, different gender, different ages, like you, the paper Mazie published a bias, like, and then we apply different um, um, apply, uh, explainability methods and to see what, we, whether we, have, we will find a common pattern that persistent through all these different bias, the different sector of the data. Do you think this is kind of clinical trial for explainability or with this actually without user involved, like uh, even doctor? So I'm not sure that sounds like a trial. Trials are assessing the effect of an intervention, and I'm not sure that there's an intervention to assess there. Okay, thanks. I think we're, we're uh, right on time. Uh, uh, right, Ying, I think uh, 710. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, I, th I, think we, I think we ended now. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful panel. Ben and yes, all the panel, yeah. Thank you so much to the panel. So it was a truly a fascinating conversation and a privilege to be a part of. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow yeah. we have, a, yeah, a thank everybody. Thanks, Madeline. Thanks, Ian. and all these student organizer. And please join us tomorrow morning at the same time zone, same time, and for uh, industry-driven explainability for healthcare. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. It is eight o'clock uh, central time. Uh, and I just wanted to welcome you all back for day two of our international workshop on AI and health, uh, explainable AI for better health at the web conference, web conference 2022. Uh, yesterday was an exciting session. And, uh, and so I look forward to today, it's, it's packed. Uh, so uh, we have pretty tight timelines. Uh, all the speakers have about 20 minutes and then we have a panel at the end. Uh, so I'll ask everyone if you please uh, um, keep yourself muted and keep your video off uh, while the presenter is presenting. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat and, uh, and we'll address them at the panel uh, at the end of the session. Um, and, uh, and maybe if the speakers are available to, uh, uh, to answer, answer some things in the chat, uh, uh, that would be acceptable as well, but we can we can definitely touch on the questions at the uh, at the end during the panel. Uh, and so I'm I'm thrilled to welcome uh, Benjamin Glicksberg. Uh, uh, Dr. Glicksberg is uh, is an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in the departments of AI and Human Health, uh, Department of Medicine, and Department of Genetics and Genom Genomic Sciences. He's also a member of the Hasso Plattner Institute for Digital Health. Uh, he's an adjunct faculty member of digital engineering at the Hasso Plattner Institute in Boston, Germany. His research uses machine learning to couple multimodal patient health data to forward personalized medicine. He completed his PhD in neuroscience at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in 2017 and postdoctoral work at the University of California, San Francisco in 2019. So I will hand it over to Ben for our first talk. Uh, I'm so sorry, Justin. My, my, uh... <laughs> Of course, what I what I thought would can, can you maybe uh, turn off your video uh, if, if if you wouldn't mind? Sure. I'm so sorry. I, I now, of course, I'm, the meeting is uh, not launching. Um, uh, I guess I get. I guess I can. Uh, oh wait, uh, I think it just needs to let me in. Okay, thank goodness. Whew. <laughs> okay, so so um, I'm going to uh, keep my video off just just because I'm going to uh, just ha for bandwidth for my. Um, a uh, poor hotel uh, uh, Wi-Fi here, but can it, can everyone see the screen? Yes, I see it now. It's in. Uh, um, it's showing all the slides. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, 
It's not letting me go full screen. Um, so I, I guess I could I could uh, uh, do it like this, which uh, may may work. Um, so work. so hi everyone. Um, uh, thanks again for um, uh, coming to this session. Uh, this is uh, it, yesterday was was certainly um, uh, quite an exciting uh, uh, list of speakers, and I I hope I can kick us off on the right foot uh, for the exciting lineup that we have today. Um, here are my uh, disclosures. And so in, in today's talk, I know we don't have a, a, a whole lot of time. So I'm gonna give a quick um, background just as a, as a rehash, um, and hopefully this will serve uh, as some background for um, the uh, other talks in the future uh, today. But first we'll give some um, background on what precision medicine is in a digital world with machine learning and, and the complex interactions between doctor, patient, and model. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, the data that we're using um, in this project. Um, I'll talk about a highlighted project that um, hopefully will show both a, um, uh, a goal that has a clinical need um, and involving why and how explainable uh, models uh, could actually benefit um, uh, uh, the, the process of, of how it could be applied. And of course, uh, then, then going about a little bit about what's, uh, what's next. So first, um, just some very quick background about what, what, what I consider uh, precision medicine in the digital world. Um, we're inundated by um, uh, uh, AI being in every facet, everywhere we turn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, the news, um, uh, print media. Um, but uh, we're really not quite there yet. Like to, we're not really, in some cases there are things that are implemented, but it's clear there are more issues than there are uh, good uh, implementations of it. And this is part of the reason why explainability uh, uh, may, be, uh, may be useful. I like to boil it down in that, in, in a really um, large uh, uh, 40,000 foot view that, you know, biology and humanity and complex biological processes and phenotypes are very hard to represent by data that we have access to um, in, um, in aggregate. So this complexity of, of, of um, the human phenome uh, really represents a, a, a series of jagged um, jigsaw puzzle pieces that we only, we're missing about three quarters of the box. And the fact that health state is multi-omic, it's multimodal, it involves our social networks, it involves our environments, our RNA, DNA, um, you name it. Um, it, it it's, it's, an, it's implied in our um, uh, 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 understanding of disease, but we really don't have access to all those. We really only have access to a facet of them. And the other thing is, once we do have access to a series of them, we can't just clump them together. We can't just um, analyze them and then uh, uh, without forethought. So really, we have to intel intelligently fuse them and recognize where we don't have the correct information or missing information that could cause bias. So I just really want to quickly um, give some background on what data that we use, and, and I will um, uh, explain how some of these uh, data sources come with their own biases and why explainability may be good uh, use in, in, in modeling. And, and of course, there are pros and cons to this, um, but why it is good, it could be good uh, more so as a, as a sanity check. So for this project, we're really focusing on, on three um, distinct modalities of data, but that are all constituted in real world data, simply meaning data that was collected, not part of a prospective trial, but really as a facet of, of living or interactions with health systems. There's no real inclusion or exclusion criteria for these. So of course they're messy and disjointed, but we're gonna be looking at, and, and of course of, of different modalities, um, text is very different from waveforms, but we'll be focusing on electronic health records, clinical notes, and electro, um, electrocardiograms. And I'll explain what those are. Um, simply put, um, from uh, the back end, from, from, a, from the data point of view, um, 
the health records, which is which is just your interaction with the health system, can be broken down into three types. One type is structured data. So it can be like a diagnosis or a lab test result. They can be unstructured. So free text of like progress notes, which may have what the uh, clinician or clinical practitioner is thinking, um, what kind of recommendations they may have. Um, and also a semi-structured, which is um, a, con a kind of a amalgamation between them. And each, each one of these has to be dealt with very differently, right? Text is free text is fundamentally very, very different from structured data. And the challenges with them also have to be taken into account when how they're used. Similarly, the EHR also contains other modalities of data. So data that are um, uh, uh, a part of routine care, but are not contained within this kind of uh, type of data. So this is actually waveform data. Another data could be image data. And in some ways this is an image, but this represents the heart's electrical activity taken from different axes within the body. And it really gives the um, clinician or clinical practitioner uh, some assessment of, of cardiac function that is really used as a first pass um, uh, a screen for anyone really complaining or at risk for these types of problems. Um, we have data at Mount Sinai for um, over 5 million uh, individuals located in New York City. And this represents a uh, very diverse patient population, which is also a huge issue in, um, in the field, which is um, underrepresentation of certain groups. Um, I'm going to make a point later uh, that, uh, you know, diversity in and of itself is not necessarily all that is needed to be. There are ways that a diverse population could still have biases in there, but for, um, for, for all intents and purposes for now, having a diverse population in many hospitals is a pro. We also have one of the largest and most diverse collection of electrocardiogram data uh, from also these five hospitals and compared to other sites have a, have a good representation of, 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 of different subpopulations. I want to just give one quick, uh, I know this is not what my talk's about, but I just wanted to shout out uh, my PhD student, Jess, who did this great work with, um, with Ricardo, um, uh, uh, where we basically took, it's like what you can do with this amount, this large amount of data, how you can learn intricate relations um, between them uh, in ways that um, are, are hard to do in, with, with smaller cohorts and smaller groups. And this represents basically a map of how every clinical entity relates to itself, which is learned in an unsupervised fashion. So I just wanted to give her, uh, her great work uh, uh, came out um, relatively recently. I just wanted to give a quick shout out there. But the main work that I'm going to be talking about today is a work by um, postdoc Akil Vade, who is co-mentored by uh, Gershnak Karni and myself, a fantastic uh, a person with computer science background, is also a clinician, so he can really interface between the two worlds. And we um, uh, made a deep learning algorithm to uh, um, identify right and left ventricular dysfunction from the electrocardiogram. And we'll say why it's a problem, why it was a good project to do and how interpretability, uh, explainability uh, fits in here. So first, heart failure, I'm, I'm sure as many of you know, is, is highly prevalent. Uh, over 6 million adults in the U.S., uh, huge cost to the uh, health system, but really to focus on the fact that misdiagnosis rates are still super high. So in the community, they could be as high as almost 70% which means we do need better screening mechanisms um, that could help the clinical practitioner help patients. As I mentioned, the ECG or electrocardiogram is, is typically a first-line investigation. This is what we like. We like tests that are done on everyone because we don't include selection bias as much as, for instance, a rare lab test that would be um, used under high clinical suspicion. So the fact that this is pretty ubiquitous is actually in our favor. It's inexpensive, non-invasive, and, and very low risk. And there, there are a lot of patterns because it represents a quite complex um, view of electrical activity over time in multiple angles. So the trained cardiologist can pick this apart pretty very easily. But you know, for others, of course, this is uh, uh, less, less intuitive. As tabular data as representation, single representations of waveforms, this is quite common in practice already. But really having, using the raw data itself in a deep learning framework 
is it's it's beginning to become more and more um, uh, prevalent, but uh, it's it's just harder to do. But it does allow give us many more dimensions to learn from, and also between different leads across time, which a single dimension does not afford. We're not the first to think about this, of course. There's been a bunch of great work that's been done across the board in many hospitals that really provided the rationale for this. So really quickly, what a goal could be is a person comes in either to a community clinic, a hospital system, or really anywhere, and they get a, um, uh, an ECG done, which takes very quick time, um, doesn't take a lot of skill to administer, and we combine with other data, and we can provide a risk assessment screen that is provided to the clinical practitioner, either to um, identify a misdiagnosis in an outpatient and do, to do a referral, or for quicker and prioritized triage in case that many people come in at, at once. It could be kind of a, a system that helps support it. For this project, we utilize uh, NVIDIA um, GPUs, and we basically had to perform uh, natural language processing on notes, which I'll explain about, uh, to get the outcomes. And the outcomes were um, right ventricular size and dysfunction. So is there an abnormal abnormality on the right side of the heart? And is the ejection fraction, essentially how much blood is um, pumped between the chambers, um, uh, is, that, is that fraction low or not, uh, or, or in, in a clinically meaningful um, um, uh, ranges? So as I mentioned, uh, and, and, and the importance of text here is we actually needed to use natural language processing because there's no numeric representation of function. Um, this is basically a way that we're, we parsed um, echo reports to infer um, uh, RV size uh, abnormalities and RV function. And we published all of the rules on how to generate that. We then basically did two forms. We did a convolutional neural network, 2D convolutional neural network on the ECG waveforms themselves. And we added in tabular data from the EHR, including demographics, and also the tabular ECG waveforms as a, a multilayer perceptron, and concatenated those into a, um, a separate multilayer per perceptron that was then fed for classification. And this allows for jointly learning between two modalities. So we can really back propagate the error, or in, in this case, the explainability for what is contributing to the prediction. I, uh, I just want to give before, this is less important for the context of this talk, but I just want to show you that our um, algorithm was able to perform quite well um, around um, 0.8 to um, point, uh, midpoint uh, 9 for um, di, um, low LVES. So this is just to give you credence that our modeling strategy actually worked. And similarly, for um, RV, uh, abnormally uh, size and uh, function abnormalities, we were also able to get a very strong performance. Um, and even we actually were able to show that that one side dysfunction wasn't contributing um, uh, dependently to performance of the other. So they, we, we able, were able to get good performance, for instance, on the RV side, if you take into account um, whether the LV is, is normal or abnormal. And of course, we, we talked a lot about fairness in this uh, in these two days. So we, we show that the classification generalized across different um, subpopulations, which is definitely encouraging. But one point I really want to focus on now is what can be done with this, right? Like, how do you convey this information to a clinical practitioner or even patient to um, uh, uh, basically communicate the result? Of course. Uh, 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 an alarm can go off, a number can be presented, but I would argue that, um, you know, explainability is really a help, helpful tool for trust. So basically, if the highlighted regions, um, we can first see what contributed the most to the prediction, to the classification, and where it was located on the uh, scan. So this, we're, we're thinking of this as a way for, as a sanity check saying, does this make sense to the clinical practitioner as a way of, of being, in, in encouraging their, their confidence in potentially utilizing it for clinical decision support? And this was made with CAPTAM and, uh, and PyTorch. Interestingly enough, and this is also where explainability could be interesting, we also showed that the times we were wrong, where we said that it was a positive 
um, low uh, left, left heart issue and it wasn't, maybe there was some interesting signal that was there because we see that down the line, these patients that have false positives that we, what we said versus the actual true negatives, there is a discrepancy. So maybe explainability could also be used to discover some, some, some intricate, hard, difficult pattern um, between many, many um, almost subclinical uh, indices that maybe can be leveraged eventually uh, by the clinical practitioner from more of a prognosis type of uh, approach. Uh, and, and really quickly, just want to say that, you know, there were a lot of limitations in this work. Of course, there's variability in outcome scoring. This was, of course, all retrospective data from a single health system, um, and it was not assessed in practice. Of course, there's a lot that has to be done before something like this can actually be used in, in practice. But uh, we felt that this was an encouraging um, exercise of um, showing that it did work on our past data. And now we're um, verifying that on perspective data, obviously with no patient contact, just with new data coming in, whether um, there aren't any data dis distribution shifts or issues that um, cause it that not to work. And just really quickly, uh, I also wanna say that just to give a quick shout out to interoperability, uh, saying that we do need replication, we do need more systems to be involved. Of course, one of the issues is that the, the data types are disparate in the format. So interoperability stuff like FHIR and OMOP is necessary for something like this to happen. And that federated learning may be a tool that, that allows for joint learning from multiple systems without sharing any sensitive data. So I'm hoping that that may be a thing that we can uh, eventually do and we, we're trying to do and hopefully will lead to even less biased results and, and, and more generalizable performance. And I think um, with that, I'd like to thank all of my lab, uh, collaborators, groups, and of course, uh, um, all the other organizers of this conference and the audience for listening. Please reach out to me if there's any questions and concerns. And of course, I can be, um, I can be reached uh, for questions during the panel discussion. Uh, thank you again. Thank you so much, I Ben. I think I just made it on time. Yeah, that was perfect timing. Okay, uh, great. Great. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, just as a reminder, if you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the chat so that uh, so you don't have to uh, hold on to them until the until the panel. Uh, uh, but we will discuss the uh, the questions in the panel. And so I'd like to uh, keep moving along. Um, uh, next up, we have uh, Dr. Faisal Mahmoud. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud is an assistant professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School in the Division of Computational Pathology at the Brigham Women's Hospital. He received his PhD in biomedical imaging from the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, Japan, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. His research interests include pathology image analysis, morphologic feature, and biomarker discovery using data fusion and multimodal analysis. Dr. Mahmoud is a full member of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Cancer Center, an associate member of the Broad Institute of Harvard and, and MIT, and a member of the Harvard Bio uh, Bioinformatics and Integrative Genomics faculty. So welcome, Dr. Mahmoud. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, we can see them. OK. Um, so today I'll be talking about data efficient and multimodal computational pathology, some of the work that my group has been doing in, in computational pathology. Um, so I'll just start by saying a little bit about what my group does and what we do and uh, what, what the community, the computational pathology community is, is interested in in general. So we look at a lot of phenotypic data that ranges from H&E, uh, you know, uh, immunohistochemistry and multiplex immunofluorescence data more recently. And we're, we're going up to 3D pathology data sets. Um, and what we do is that we do a lot of quantitative spatial analysis with the help, with the hope of, of getting to uh, everything in the red box here, including early diagnosis, prognosis, predicting response to treatment, stratifying patients into distinct risk groups, and trying to do some form of integrative biomarker discovery. And we also like to integrate modalities that are sort of already quite quantitative, like genomic transcriptomic information and so forth. And we build uh, multimodal deep models to try to integrate this data to, to get to everything in the red box, red box here. And what we really do is we try to 
um, address some of the technical challenges that are associated with with uh, dealing with these large large data sets and making sense of them and training equitable model models and so forth. So uh, just to give sort of a historical perspective around, around computational pathology, uh, digital and computational pathology is something that's been around for about 35, 35 years, and the field has evolved quite a lot. More recently, there has been a lot of, a lot of interest in this, in this area, but it has its, its own unique set of challenges. So these uh, images, these pathology images can be in incredibly large. They're more like satellite images where they're hierarchical and they can have up to 100,000 by 100,000 or going up to 200,000 by 200,000 pixels. And if it's uncompressed, each one of these images could be up to 60, 60 gigabytes. So very, very large amounts of data in just, just a single, single data point. Historically, this uh, has been analyzed by using all kinds of different handcrafted features. More recently, since uh, convolutional neural networks have been very common, the most common approach has been isolating some kind of region of interest within this very large image, building classes based of those manual annotations, and then training models based off of that. An issue with this approach well, several issues with this approach. One is that it's it's uh, it's difficult and cumbersome to get these get these annotations, and um, it's uh, they they also induce uh, additional bias. And to target some of the most interesting problems, there's so much heterogeneity in this in these diseases that the amount of data that we need to use it would just be very difficult to annotate large amounts of amounts of data. So. Uh, a solution to this is the utility of some form of weekly supervised learning, which is much more close to uh, the way this data is collected clinically. So clinically, a majority of hospitals still analyze these cases on a glass slide and prepare uh, a pathology report. So uh, as more and more hospitals start start to digitize these pathology pathology slides to get these large gigapixel pixel images, uh, um, a, a more um, close to clinical workflow would be to make use of that digital data and the labels that are available in the pathology reports or the electronic medical records rather than using hand, um, hand labeled uh, data or manually labeled pixel level labeled data. So uh, two approaches to weekly supervised learning. So one is by using graph convolutional neural networks. So this means that you can segment out every nuclei in the image, build a graph on top of it, and then use some form of graph convolutional networks. The other approach is to use multiple instance learning um, where you assume that each one of these slides is a bag of, of tiny patches, uh, i.e. instances. Um, and even if one of these patches is positive, the whole bag is considered to be positive. That's an assumption that vanilla multiple instance learning makes. An issue with this approach is that this can be inherently very data inefficient. And uh, because vanilla multiple instance learning uses a max pooling based aggregation function, uh, which means that when your weights and biases of the of, of your, the model that you're training are updated, they can be updated by using a single single patch, which is very data inefficient because this gigapixel image, single data point can update uh, a, a two five six by two five six patch from this gigapixel image can update the um, um, update the weights and biases. So um, to, to 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 develop more um, sort of data efficient. Uh, Weekly and weekly supervised computational pathology models. My group did some some work on uh, on developing this method that we that we call clustering constrained attention attention multiple instance learning, where we use a number of different bells and whistles that have been used by the computer vision community for other applications and brought them into uh, computational pathology and really made them specific for computational pathology uh, in dealing with some of the some of the very specific challenges that exist in 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 this large in these large data sets. So we used attention based pooling instead of Max pooling so it allows us to learn what the most important regions are within the within the whole slide image using multiple attention branches so learning separate attention for each um, for each class and then using pseudo labels to to make this to make the setup more data efficient and using pre-trained encoders uh, in this specific study we used pre-trained ResNet encoders from from ImageNet but since then we've tried a host of different self-supervised encoders um, trained on very very large amounts of pathology data that. That, that work uh, quite well. So the, the, the goal here was to develop a setup where we could use uh, whole slide images and slide level labels, train these models in a data efficient way, do them in a multi-task, multi-class manner. So we can target some of the most interesting problems in, in pathology. And one of them was trying to identify origins for chances of, uh, of, of unknown primary. I'm sure 
a few people in the audience are familiar with this with this problem, but for those who are not, when cancer metastasizes and moves from one region to the other, it often becomes unclear where it may have started. And at first presentation, it's often often just unclear what where the origin is. And determining the origin is really important because most treatment, most cancer treatment is based off of the primary origin. And if the primary origin is not determined, the patients uh, have to undergo large work, workups of pathology, radiology, endoscopy, and molecular testing to identify the origins because they can't be treated, they cannot enroll in clinical trials un until they know where the, where the tumor started. So what the question we wanted to answer was that is it possible to, for us to use conventional h and &E images to, to try to see if we can uh, determine where the origin of these, uh, of the, of, of, of these uh, unknown primary tumors. tumors is of, of course, it's a very difficult problem because you don't have clear ground truth for this. Um, but primary and metastatic tumors share morphologic features. And uh, we hope that, we hope that you know, the, the, the model will be able to make uh, determinations of, of, of unknown primary cases, given that the model works very, very well on cases that are uh, with a known, uh, known primary. And the reason we believe this was that there have been a lot of studies showing that uh, non-human identifiable features such as molecular alterations and so forth can be predicted from, uh, from, from histology, histology alone. So the study design looked something like this. We had 18, uh, it was an 18 class problem where we grouped uh, common, common and rare cancer types. So we used about 23,000 cases for training. We tested it initially on an internal test cohort of about 6,500 cases, an external test cohort of about about two, 220 cases that came from, well, about, about 700 cases that came from over 200 different medical centers. And then we also tested it on unknown primary cases, which had some kind of a primary differential, differential assigned. Uh, the model architecture was, it was, it was uh, 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 attention multiple instance learning, was weakly supervised, was solved as, uh, solved as a multi-class problem. We used uh, pre-extracted uh, ResNet features from all of these histology images to, to make it more uh, more efficient to train. And the, the, the model was trained to predict whether a given case is primary or metastatic, or and, and also to predict what the what the origin uh, or origin is. So overall the model did quite well, uh, but particularly well for for top three and top five predictions, which indicates that, th that this could be really useful in narrowing down what the possible origins are, and then further ordering ancillary tests based off of that information. We also looked into primary versus metastatic uh, predictions uh, and how well the model does for common metastatic origins. We investigated performance on each individual origin type, how well the model does on ex internal and external, external cases, uh, and so forth. We also investigated, because it's very difficult to get ground truth for unknown primary cases, we investigated performance on just metastatic cases and increasingly difficult metastatic cases by using things like the number of ancillary tests ordered for that to diagnose the case as a surrogate measure for, for difficulty, as well as using other things like, uh, like if, the de if the case was deemed to be poorly differentiated or uh, if it required clinical correlation um, and uh, investigated and introspected what the performance was on those, on those cases. Um, we tried to investigate where the model is paying attention and what, what the model uses to make these classification determinations. Visually, it, it, it did seem that it, it, it looks predominantly at the, at the tumor origins for all 18 of the origins that we considered in this study, but we further did some quantitative analysis where we quantified everything in the tum tumor microarchitecture, correlated it with the high attention regions, and then we could sort of quantitatively say that the model is predominantly paying attention to, to the, to the, to the tu tumor regions. Of course, the actual features it uses, those are still um, abstract, but this gives us some, some indication for where the predictions are essentially coming from. There is an interesting demo around this sh showcasing how this could potentially be used in a clinical, clinical setting where we could look at what the model predictions are for for the origin, how confident the model is in making those predictions, as well as introspecting and looking at where the where those predictions are more or less coming coming from within the whole slide uh, whole slide image. We also did some uh, further evaluation by uh, by looking at cancer of unknown primary cases that were later assigned some kind of a primary 
primary differential. Uh, and these cases were, were generously sent from over 150 different medical centers across the US and abroad. And uh, we did some analysis in, in, in looking at what the top one prediction is, it was about 60%, but perhaps the more interesting result is that the top three and top five predictions were, were about 80%. So we could um, sort of narrow down possible origins with a very, very high degree of accuracy, even, even, even for these complicated cases. Here's an example of a case which required all of these different ancillary tests, IHC tests and so forth, to, to, to determine the origin, whereas if a toad prediction was, was available, we could have used this to, to gauge how confident the model is and then ordering ancillary tests to confirm that the origin is ovarian and rule out breast and, and lung. Um, uh, another application that I wanted to discuss is endomyocardial biopsy assessment. So for those who are not familiar with this problem, after heart transplants, patients often undergo repeated heart biopsies to determine if the donor heart is being, being rejected. There's large intra and intra observer variability uh, in, this, uh, in this assessment. So we wanted to investigate and introspect if uh, if it's possible for us to use some kind of a deep model to standardize the predictions a little bit, a little bit more, and this was a recently published uh, published study where we trained the model on data from the Brigham and Women's Hospital and adapted it to data that was sent from Turkey and and Switzerland to investigate and introspect how the how it does by using data from different patient populations as well as using data from different. Uh, different slide scanners and instrumentation and, and, and so forth. Uh, the model architecture uh, was, was again weekly supervised, um, used pre-extracted uh, ResNet features and was solved as being a multi-task problem to predict cellular antibody and cruelty, which are benign mimickers of rejection. Um, in these in these large, large images, we, we looked and looked at how the model does um, on individual um, on, on, on all of these different uh, tasks in evaluating endomyocardial biopsies. And this chart that looks like more like an Olympics um, chart shows, shows that the model does pretty well um, on, on the US cases, but there is a drop in model performance when adapting to, 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 to Turkey and, to, and, and Switzerland. We did not do any form of domain adaptation here. This is just to demonstrate how the performance drops. It's comparable to what we've seen in other studies, but there is a drop in performance. The, the, the cohorts were deliberately constructed to be very variable. So we did have different slide scanners, different staining protocols and, and so forth. We also did some analysis where we looked at what the agreement is between individual pathologists and uh, using Cohen's kappa, which takes into account agreement by, by, by chance. Uh, and, it, and we found that this is comparable to what other studies have shown uh, that, that uh, pathologists often don't agree for, for, for endomyocardial biopsy assessment. And then we also looked at how individual pro, uh, pathologists um, agreed with, uh, with the AI model, and it was very comparable to how much they agreed with themselves. But perhaps the more interesting result is that we introspected whether uh, showing the uh, experts the, the, the heat map uh, and the model predictions and the confidence helped them improve or help them agree more uh, and we were able to show that in this very small study for, and, and, and we showed that their agreement improved for all of the tasks and the assessment time decreased, of course, further introspection and further study they required to really establish this. This was a very small study with 150 biopsies and five experts. Um, the uh, last, uh, almost the last thing that I will talk about is integrating data from multiple sources. We've done quite some work in trying to integrate data from histology and genomics, and then using interpretability as uh, a morphologic and molecular feature discovery uh, paradigm. So uh, patient prognosis, determining patient prognosis is obviously of interest, and the morphologic and molecular features used to inform that prognosis is of interest too. So we, we develop multimodal integration algorithms where we have a whole slide level uh, uh, predictor. This is, this is basically, from a machine learning point of view, a ranking problem. So two separate separate networks are fused towards the end, followed by some fully connected layers. They're trained individually, and then everything is trained end-to-end. Trained -end. But the interesting aspect here is that and then we can go back and look at what morphologic features were used in the, in the whole slide image, what, mo what molecular features were used in the molecular profile, then further quantify uh, the high tension regions within the, within the uh, the, the morphologic features to really get some quantitative uh, analysis going. So we found that um, 12 out of the 14 cancer types that we studied had statistically significant separation. And we could also investigate and introspect which, uh, which cancer types was it useful to have the whole slide image 
uh, present for. So one way to look at this is that there are a lot of commercially available prognostic assays like Persigna and Oncotype, Oncotype DX. And this is essentially uh, doing the same thing, but by using both histology and genomics. And this is informing us that for which uh, cancer types can you build these prognostic models just on genomics, for which just pathology might be enough, and for which it would be beneficial to have both histology and genomics included. Here is an example where we show how separable the patients are by using their, their molecular profile, how separable they are by using histology, and essentially how separable they become when both histology and genomics are, uh, are used. There's also an interesting demo around this for 14 cancer types and all the cases in the TCGA if people are interested in exploring this further. Another interesting aspect was that we were able to uh, look at and, and, and find uh, that the model uses tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or lymphocytic infiltrate as being one of the markers for, uh, for, for low risk cases in, in 12 out of the 14, 14 cancer types we, we studied. Um, and then and this, this analysis has been done before, but by first segmenting out all the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and correlating them with outcome res over here, the model sort of identifies these, these morphologic regions on its, uh, on its own. Um, the last thing that I think is very relevant to, uh, to, to this session I'll talk about is that more recently we begin to investigate uh, how disparities in the training data sort of also affect pathology, pathology models. And pathology, of course, is something that one does not think about having large disparities in the, in the, uh, in the data before because morphologic features for these diseases um, are very, very similar, and there are no known, known morphologic disparities uh, among different, different races. But these models are uh, often trained on the TCGA. So here we try to train two very simple models to subtype non-small cell lung cancer and for, for uh, breast carcinoma, and then adapt them to data from the Brigham and Women's Hospital, which then, then we stratified by race and looked at performance on individual races. And we found that uh, there are large disparities. And there are, we're beginning to investigate what the, re what the reason is behind these. And they're often that uh, people with socioeconomic disparities can often be diagnosed late. This is a well-known fact. And, and our, often our training sets do not include high-risk case cases that's very common for for pathology. So we're beginning to investigate this for at least some of the more, more common disease, disease models for which we have uh, this, this data to make some statistically significant assessments. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank all the PhD students, postdocs, and everyone else who's, who's working in the lab and, and all the funding that we have received to, to do this work. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Mahmoud. This is excellent. Uh, okay, and uh, just to remind everyone, if you have any questions, uh, please place them in the chat and then uh, we'll address them during the panel at the end of the session. Um, and so I'd like to uh, keep moving along. Uh, uh, and so next I'd like to welcome Paul Varghese, Dr. Paul Varghese, uh, a cardiologist and clinical informatician. Uh, Dr. Varghese helps lead Verily's efforts in the application of advanced data science methodologies to improve patient outcomes and patient clinician interactions. Prior to joining Verily, Dr. Vergis uh, served as medical director for cardiovascular IT at Agfa Healthcare, responsible for product design, interoperability, and quality regulatory affairs. Dr. Vergis holds a bachelor of, bachelor of science and, and an MD from Brown University, as well as a master of medical science in biomedical informatics from the Harvard Medical School. He did his internal medicine residency training at the Osler Medical Service at Johns Hopkins Hospital, cardiology fellowship at uh, UC San Francisco, where he specialized in heart failure and echocardiography and quality improvement and patient safety training at Intermountain Healthcare's advanced training program. So welcome, Dr. Varghese. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. everyone. Uh, Justin, Justin can, can, is, is my screen, screen showing? showing? It is not. OK. Uh, I'm, I'm trying. trying. <laughs> this, this, this is unfortunate. unfortunate. Everybody was so uh, punctual with their, their presentations. presentations. 
I think we've made you co-host now, so hopefully that helps. Oh, this is quite, quite unfortunate. unfortunate. I wonder what well, I can do differently. If you want to send it over to me, uh, I could load it up. Yeah. yeah um, um, let's do that. that. Okay, okay, I sent it. it. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I'll uh, do, do my, my best, best to sort of, sort of uh, start without the slides. Um, uh, so, uh, my I disclosure is you hear I work for... In, sorry, Dr. Vies, uh, we uh, hear a little echo, too. Is there? Do you have two devices going? Uh, no, I only have one. Let's see if muting me. Any, Any better, better now? now? Okay, one more time. Justin, is it any, uh, is is it any, any better, better now? No, it's still it's still there. Okay. okay give me, give me one. Is it any better now, Justin? It's still just a slight echo. I, I, I think we'll have to go with it if uh, if you don't notice uh, any way to fix it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm failing all the high tech stuff and I work for a high tech company. Uh, so while we're waiting for my slides to load, um, I'm Paul Burgess, uh, head of health informatics and early life sciences. That is my major disclosure. Um, I am speaking with my own perspective and I'm not representing the views of my company. Uh, my goals today really um, are to give you a view into the world that I live in. I am not a researcher. I work for a company whose focus is bringing healthcare tools, including those that use algorithms, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence for implementation in healthcare environments. And uh, I would want you to know some of the things that I've learned in 15 years in this field. Uh, Justin, can you advance for me? So the goals really are to let you know what you might be to what you should expect when um, everything goes the way you had planned and say Dr. Glicksberg's um, algorithms really are the kinds of things that will improve outcomes, help clinical decisions. How do you sort of put it out into the field for people to use in a safe, effective and sustainable manner? And so what I wanted people to understand, can you go to the next slide? Really, what is the landscape that you should expect um, if you're not familiar with healthcare, healthcare implementations? The first is that 
as a field, healthcare has some vulnerabilities in the knowledge of what artificial intelligence is. The second thing is, since so many measures of performance for the tools, the models that are produced are measured in statistical measures of performance, we should openly acknowledge that there's some vulnerabilities there. The last thing is really how do you better align what you want to do, what you want to deploy with accepted practice in healthcare. Um, if I'm really glib about these things, um, most of the time, it's really not about the methods. It's really about the results and how well you can explain the data that is associated with those results. Next slide. So um, now you know a little bit about me. I think it's really important just to sort of emphasize that last bit, which is really my focus is not on research. If that happens in the course of the work that we do in Verily, that's great. It's really about delivering products safely. Um, and I bring this up because I'm part of the last mile. I'm the person who's involved in the discussions with the clinicians who are going to use the product and also for those who purchase it. And it's really important to be thinking about both sets of people when you think about how would you explain the tooling, the models that you're building? Because ultimately, you need to have confidence and trust with the people who use it, and you also need confidence and trust with the people who are going to pay the money for it. Next slide. So in 2018, I participated in an ARCH panel, uh, Machine Learning for Health, that did touch on explainability. And this is what I said then. Next slide. Before we can get to explainable AI, we're gonna to need to explain what AI is. And I'd like to think a lot has changed since 2018, but to the truth is um, we haven't made much progress there. Next slide. If I'm being blunt and candid, healthcare really doesn't know the words associated or the concept associated with AI. And I mean the fundamental things. Words like multi-level perceptron do not show up in the regular dialogue that I'm involved with when I come to clinical institutions about the tooling that could be used. So it's really important that when we come at this field as scientists, as researchers, we should always be thinking about how we make this digestible for the people who will actually be touching the product and using it. Next slide. And this is uh, from earlier this year. Um, and uh, it really shows that even in what we consider modern day and age, the current knowledge of AI among people who are practicing today is not very good. And how do we address that? That's something we can talk about later, about what is the role of the types of people who are on this call to sort of help and shape that future so that people will know what to do with this information. Next slide. Um, the other thing that's a real challenge is that if people don't already understand the fundamentals of artificial intelligence, machine learning, how do we start even introducing the concept of explainability? Um, one thing is clear, and this is something that everybody on this call is probably familiar with, is that just getting consensus in the terminology of what is explainable AI, what is the difference between explainability and interpretability, we're going to have to figure that out before we can even have a, a robust and meaningful conversation with the people who are actually going to touch and use the product. Next slide. Uh, so I mentioned that I did cardiac imaging. Um, I bring that up because uh, I just wanted to point out that there's a lot more to the world in healthcare than just imaging and sepsis, which seems to get a lot of the attention and activity in the research that happens. And there are good reasons for that. But I wanted everyone to sort of think more broadly about what happens when we get outside of those fields. Um, it's fortunate that radiology and cardiology is really adept and knowledgeable about the data that is associated with images. That isn't something you can take for granted outside the specialties who are really touching those kinds of technologies. And so as we get to less knowledgeable, less familiar domains of medicine, that's more and more work that has to happen on sort of setting the table, setting the grounds for people understanding the utility of the product. Next slide. So um, <laughs> I used to say healthcare is bad at math, but um, I'm gonna refine it a little bit more. And I just wanted to point out that we're really actually not very good at the statistics. And as I said before, since so many of the things that are about the performance of the model are related to statistical measures, we have to know that going in. Next slide. 
Uh, so one of the classic things I always tell um, data scientists uh, within Verily is um, we need to speak the language of clinicians. And so this is a really simple one. Uh, we don't talk about recall. We talk about sensitivity. We don't talk about precision. We talk about positive predictive value. And I think it's uh, interesting that that positive predictive value is going to show up in the next couple slides in a couple of different uh, scenarios. Next slide. Uh, so one of my favorite papers, uh, 2014, from Zach Kahani um, uh, at Harvard Medical School on DBMI, and um, really great title. Um, they did a study where they asked people in the Longwood area to calculate positive predictive value, which is a fairly straightforward thing to calculate. Next slide. Yeah, only 23% got the correct value, um, which is even more interesting because this was a replication of an older study. Next slide. This was from the same study in 1978, different researchers. Um, so in that time period, from 1978 to 2014, we did in fact get that much better, only 5% better. So this shows a longstanding challenge that we will all have in this field. Next slide. Uh, so now I'm going to shift to talking a little bit about one of the big projects that we barely worked on since 2020. Um, we rolled out a product called Healthy at Work. It was a comprehensive testing program for institutions, companies, educational institutions, to more safely bring back their students or employees back to work. And it was a combination of offering straight up laboratory testing of COVID-19 um, tests, uh, PCR tests, combined with population health combined with epidemiology, um, combined with, as we called out, our core data science and software capabilities, so that we could offer something of value to people when they are making decisions about how do they bring back a population? What is the significance of a local prevalence versus a site prevalence? And how does testing on a certain cadence um, impact the likelihood that you will have people who are infectious on site? Next slide. Um, what you see on the right side, I'm oh, sorry, left side of the screen, is the actual sort of decision uh, guides that we gave to people. We offered modeling done by our data science team to sort of show people what would happen if you decrease the amount of surveillance testing or you increase the number of people coming on site. And that's a really powerful and useful thing to have in your hand when you're trying to make decisions about how frequently you test. It can be expensive, it can be a burden on people. Um, the nice thing is, we started to put out some papers. This is uh, posted on Met Archive, um, and it really shows off some of the work that we did extending some standard epidemiologic models, car metal models, to be more sophisticated. And when we come to explainability, I'm going to show you what we actually spend most of our time explaining. Next slide. So um, the lead author on that previous paper was Menachem Frommer, one of the more senior data scientists that I've worked with. And here he is um, with myself and Rob Califf, who is now the current FDA commissioner. Um, we're not actually talking about anything related to an epidemiologic model. We're not talking about data science. We're not talking about machine learning. What we're actually talking about is how to get people to understand positive predictive value associated with the actual COVID-19 test because that really helps people understand the significance of all the downstream actions. And so it's a little ironic that we're always coming back to getting people grounded in the fundamentals. Next slide. So what can we do about this? Next slide. So my take on things is we get to better as data scientists, as artificial intelligence researchers, uh, as machine learning scientists, when we follow patterns and clinicians recognize. We know that results speak longer, stronger in cre for credibility over methods, especially when you talk about results that are about the safety of something and the efficacy of something. Next slide. And we all know this instinctively. When you look at this slide, does, is it really the method that is of primary importance, that Moderna's an mRNA vaccine versus traditional vaccines? What really drives the decision-making is how effective this is. It's really all the numbers on the symptomatic improvements and the diminishment of severe COVID-19 uh, situations, including a safety profile. 
I just bring this up because even in our day-to-day -day basis of our decision-making, we're always going back to the results of safety and efficacy. Next slide. Um, I like to point this out as well, and uh, Justin and I joked about it when we talked about this, this talk, which is there's a lot of stuff that we do in medicine where we don't know how the methods work, but we still do this. And these are some really well-known drugs, lithium, acetaminophen, and I always throw them a daffodil there because at one point it had over a billion dollars in sales throughout the world, and we just didn't know how it worked. But we knew what the effect was. We also felt that it was safe. Next slide. Um, so I always try to sort of reframe it. The people I talk to, the people who want to use the product, the people who want to buy the product, they're more interested in explainable data than they are explainable AI. Next slide. And what I really like is some of the work that Dr. Tim McRubrew has been uh, advocating for some time, which is really the notion of the model card and model facts which I think really closely resembles what we as clinicians are trained to look for when we look at pharmaceuticals or look at traditional medical devices. There is the explanatory information about what the product is supposed to do and how safely or effectively it does it. Next slide. Um, I just threw this in here about when things go wrong. Uh, this was a paper, uh, I think back in 2019 or 2020. Um, Eric Topol sort of tweeted it out loud um, because it really had some problems with how they were actually addressing the basics. Next slide. And um, this is uh, Farsha uh, Mostashari, uh, former uh, Office of National Coordinator of Health Information Technology for the US government. And basically he's calling it out that the medical journal editors really weren't equipped to sort of decipher the significance or the lack of significance of what they were being seen because quite frankly, they're intimidated by seeing words like deep learning AI. And then what you see on the right side is him calling out all the basics that were missed. And we've talked about fairness, we've talked about bias. Um, these are all the things that epidemiology has really done well and we can't ignore them as we move to newer different technologies and methods. Next slide. Um, this is my plea to everybody on the call. Um, all of you are uniquely positioned to help shape the future. And there's a great opportunity to teach the next generation of physicians, medical students, residents, fellows. Next slide. And this is one area that I've seen good progress since 2018. More and more institutions, um, this paper was written by researchers and clinicians at the University of Toronto and Harvard MIT. More institutions are investing in actually training people in the methodologies, in the deep understanding of the fundamentals. And I really hope that all of you can participate in this wherever you are and whatever institutions you're at. Next slide. Finally, um, it's not just that people don't know the fundamentals. They're also forming their opinions on all the hype that they hear about and anything related to artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep whatever. And so all of us have a role to play in helping people understand what they will hear is not always what is actually sound or feasible. And so um, it's one of these things where I think we all have an individual role to play in the conversations we have. Um, apologies for uh, running a minute over and uh, not getting technology down, but uh, thank you for letting me share a little bit about what happens when you do all the right things and you want to deploy your product. Thank you so much, Paul. So even with yeah all the technology difficulties, we still uh, made it through. So um, and that was very insightful. Thank you. Uh, as a reminder to. Uh, everyone, all the participants, uh, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat and uh, we will address them uh, during the panel at the end. Um, give me just one second to get out of that presentation. Okay, good. And so now uh, we will move along to our next speaker, uh, who is Ming-Chen Gao. Uh, 
Ming Chen Gao is an assistant professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Buffalo, uh, the State University of New York. Ming Chen earned her PhD in computer science at Rutgers University in 2014, and then conducted postdoctoral research at the NIH Clinical Center, Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences from 2014 to 2017. She works at the nexus of artificial intelligence and healthcare. She's interested in developing novel methods to extract essential information from massive scale heter heterogeneous and distributed data sources to support evidence-based patient specific and efficient diagnosis decisions for physicians and patients. So with that, I will let you, let you uh, take it away, Dr. Gao. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I also would like to thank the organizers for the um, invitation. So um, my talk is a little bit different um, from the previous ones. Um, I think my talk is more about the fundamental machine learning um, understanding uh, of the problem. Um, so my talk is about a geometric interpretable framework uh, for field shot learning in medical uh, image classification. So first of all, why uh, do we want to work on field shot learning? Um, so uh, this long tail data in medical image uh, is prevalent. So we all know that deep learning based models um, have achieved uh, wonderful results in recent years and it has uh, been able to achieve expert level performance in some specialized areas. Um, but the long tail recognition is still very challenging. Um, so in the recent past over several years, we have seen quite a lot of check that ray data set collected at uh, several institutes. Um, so most of them, they have used uh, 14 labels. Um, they have provided 14 labels for uh, people to um, do the image classification on check that ray. Um, however, if you look at the data, uh, we actually, um, the label is quite imbalanced. Uh, most reported radio, radio uh, graphic finding, uh, for example, in the figure as show uh, in the pad chest is a data set. Uh, we can see a few of the labels, they have quite a lot of label, but much more of them, uh, they only have limited training data uh, in the data set. Um, so this problem that is also true in quite a lot of other data sets, for example, in in the NIH chest X-ray data set, um, so the label is also quite in, in balanced. Um, so I was a little bit surprised um, to see that um, earlier this month, uh, one of these autonomous X-ray analyzing AI tool uh, was cleared in Europe uh, because I know how challenging this problem is. But it turns out this tool, uh, it scans X-ray and it will um, automatically send a report to patients uh, on those images that are normal. So I understand that this is achievable because the normal patient set is um, quite popular in, 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 in primacy, primary care, for example. So um, I know I understand they can get pretty good solid performance on those kind of data. So it's, it's, if, if the tool sees any abnormal rat, uh, uh, Abnormal, abnormal maladies, they would uh, uh, turn over it to a radiologist to uh, take a look at the data. Um, so my talk is about the geometric interpretation uh, about this problem. So before talking about the few shot learning, uh, let's talk about the geometric interpretation of a neural network. So we all know that neural networks, they have these multiple layers of uh, filters, um, um, activations, and also uh, loss functions. So the geometric interpretation provides um, a very different, fundamentally different uh, point of view to look at these problems. So um, there have been some geometrically interpretable deep learning models developed in the past several years. Um, so there is, a, a, I think, a, a uh, bridge filled in the gap between deep learning and computational geometry. For example, one of the very first few work uh, is um, that was published in SAML in 2017 is about the expressive power of uh, deep neural network. So in that work, they, they study the three layer um, neural network and they try to study what is happening in the feature space. So it finds out uh, each layer will try to separate the feature space um, into um, convex polytopes. So, um, and after that layer, the next layer is also going to divide the feature space into different regions. 
And after that, uh, in 2019, people found out, found out that um, the feature space it was um, subdivided actually into a power diagram. And we will discover what is power diagram later. So based on this insight and quite a lot of other um, the geometry based models have been developed, developed, for example, they can try to find uh, either several uh, examples in a nearest space, nearest neighbor based uh, method, and also they can do classification based on, for example, this Bernal diagram of the feature space. So um, then another question, a little bit background about um, the problem is what is the Bernal diagram? Um, and so the Bernal diagram is trying to separate uh, a space based on a few centers. So for example, the center provided here uh, using C, C1 to CK. Uh, so the Werner diagram will separate the space um, into um, different uh, subdivisions and each one of them, they belong to um, uh, one center or centroid uh, based on the distance. So the distance is measured uh, in many cases just by the Euclidean distance. Um, Power diagram is an extension of this Werner diagram and is trying to uh, associate each cell with a weight. So we still have the centroid from C1 to CK, but here we also have some weight. And the distance from every point in the space to the centroid also, you need to take care of this uh, uh, weight associated. It's also called the radius of, of each cell. So this one was, uh, was actually proposed in uh, many, many years ago. So our work, uh, we know that the deep neural network, it was uh, demonstrated that it was actually a power diagram subdivision uh, in the feature space. Uh, so we propose that we, we actually, we can see the power diagram, we can reduce that to a Werner diagram by introduce uh, one little um, condition um, on the neural network during the neural network optimization. So the benefit of this Werner diagram is we can explain um, the, the how, how the neural network um, partition the feature space and also we want to leverage this property in our few shots learning. And also we um, will leverage another um, uh, theorem which is called cluster induced neural diagram. So uh, in this cluster induced neural diagram, we are not going to use just one single point. We are also going to use uh, a set of points, which means a cluster of points other than just one point. Um, and also the distance will be replaced by an influence uh, function to determine the boundaries. Um, so the formal definition of this cluster-induced Werner diagram is given below. Um, actually, it's not just uh, um, a predefined points in that we can, can be used or in a density-based um, cluster-induced uh, Werner diagram. So um, based on those insights uh, we have gathered and we want to see how we can look at few shot learning. Um, so few shot learning is about how can we leverage the model that is trained with abundant data. Uh, for example, in our Texas Ray classification, we have some labels, they have quite a lot of uh, training data for that. Um, but for other cases, we only have a few uh, samples. So how can we leverage the information from this uh, abandoned data? So quite a lot of classical metric-based future learning method is actually we can see their geometric interpretation. For example, the prototypical network and the simple short future learning method is actually, um, so if you have only, say in this case, we only have five novel uh, samples for uh, the novel classes, and we, we based on these samples, we want to uh, calculate a prototype for each novel class. And then a new testing sample comes in, we want to see where is the uh, nearest the prototype uh, in the novel class. And based on that, we can do the classification for the novel classes. And another algorithm, which is called S2, M2, uh, which is um, semi uh, self supervised uh, manifold mix algorithm. So, in this algorithm, they, they use cosine similarity for the cost function. So, we actually we can see some property of this algorithm. Another method is this is called distribution calibration. So, we can see uh, the distribution for the novel classes is very difficult to calibrate because of the insufficient training data for novel classes. And uh, we found out that each one of them is actually um, corresponding to 
one type of um, Wormel diagram uh, in the feature space, for example, the prototypical network, which is actually a Wormel diagram in the feature space. S2M2, which is a Wormel diagram in our sphere, and the distribution calibration, which is actually trying to do a power diagram in, in the feature space. Uh, so based on those um, uh, geometric interpretation of those algorithms, so we design another set of algorithms to unify um, the existing metric-based uh, few shot learning method. So if not all of this metric-based few shot learning method uh, is, a, I think most of this few shot learning um, uh, method can be unified into a uh, geometric interpretation um, uh, algorithm. And also we want to extend that as a cluster-induced Voron diagram. So how can we construct a cluster uh, we want to construct a cluster on both sides of the uh, one side is for the data side, the other side is for uh, the algorithm side. So for uh, one shot, for the few shot learning cases, especially for the one shot learning um, and extreme case, we only have one single point. Um, so how can we construct a cluster based on that? And also due to the extreme data efficiency, um, few shot learning is vulnerable to the hetero uh, genity in future of the learning process. So what we propose to do is we propose this uh, cluster to cluster Vernal diagram and we, we, we build cluster. Uh, one is uh, on the data uh, perspective uh, is we build the feature level, geometry level, transformation level. Uh, we build a cluster based on the training data for the normal classes. And also on the algorithm side, uh, we would say each metric based field of learning method will be able to uh, uh, construct a cluster for the algorithm. So here in this figure, we can see how the base class of Wernal diagram was constructed. Uh, so this way is uh, the experiment was done on multi-digit amnest data set. You can see how uh, each label is able to be clustered uh, during the uh, neural network optimization to form a Wernal diagram. And also the novel classes, uh, you can see the novel classes only with a few samples are also going to form a Wernal diagram, borrow uh, the information from the base classes. So our result um, on uh, few shot learning method, let's take a look at uh, the few shot classification. Um, 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 uh, a few like natural image classification uh, problems, for example, the mini image net, uh, the COB data set, and a few others. Uh, so we only show a few examples here. Uh, uh, we call our algorithm is deep Voronoi Voro diagram, deep Voro. So our algorithm is able to combine um, lots of uh, metric-based uh, classification, few shot learning, and is able to get better uh, result. Um, and also is going to, it, it is able to improve this cross-domain uh, few shot learning and with different architectures, with different losses, and is also resilient uh, to uh, outliers. So um, how about the, the result of uh, the few shot uh, learning on the Texas ray classification? So also our algorithm is able to unify um, the other few shot learning method and also get better result. So we did our experiment on the mimic data set in the base classes. Uh, is able to achieve uh, average AUC around um, 78. Uh, so you can see our novel um, um, classes, we uh, selected a few novel classes, which is actually not really rare diseases in this case, uh, but that's different uh, from these 14 base classes. Um, so the result we can see that um, is, um, is able to um, improve by uh, unifying uh, a few other few shot learning method. And also we can also observe that when we have more uh, training samples in novel classes, we will, we will be able to get better results. So uh, we really hope um, uh, our algorithm will be able to work well for the re really rare disease um, scenarios. And also uh, the benefit of this geometric interpretable model is we can realize um, the classification result uh, in a Wernal diagram. So this case is trying to realize uh, the base classes and also the novel classes um, about this checks and three classification. Uh, we realize only seven uh, base classes and four novel 
um, uh, uh, for novel uh, classes, for novel uh, labels. Um, but you can see the, the, the realization is not that good also because of the, the, the result uh, is um, still a little bit far away from perfect. It's not like the MNIST data set where the accuracy is pretty high, like 99%. Uh, um, and also uh, based on um, what we have done, uh, we want to say we have proposed a general geometric framework uh, that is able to uh, unify few shot learning uh, classifiers. And we are able to unify the metric based few shot learning classification. There are also quite a lot of other few shot learning classifications. For example, um, this uh, semi supervised, which is actually this transductive way of doing few shot learning. Uh, but our method right now is only able to unify um, the, the metric based few shot learner because we are able to see their performance, um, their property in the feature space. So I think this is a very good property. Uh, we can leverage how we can provide interpretability for our model. And also in the future, we want to see how can we integrate this geometric interpretation for lots of other tasks. Uh, for example, this representation learning, we know that quite a lot of methods, especially few shot learning methods, we rely, rely on solid representation learning. Um, and essentially deep learning methods rely on solid representation learning. Um, so we would be able to see how uh, the represent the, how representation learning actually do uh, in the feature space. So for example, how can we get smoother decision boundaries, uh, which would be beneficial to a lot of learning algorithms. Um, so recently also this mix up uh, data augmentation uh, algorithms have um, uh, improved performance a lot. And also we, I hope this geometric interpretation will also be able to uh, help with that. And also another area our lab is quite interesting is about this lifelong learning. We know that we can transfer the information from uh, base classes to novel classes, but also when we have a population shift, for example, if you have this model trained in one region in one country, or uh, if you want to deploy the model in another country, you really will see quite a lot of problems because of this population shift, uh, because of the difficulty, um, the data quality, uh, or um, different machines used in different regions or the population differences. We see uh, it is difficult to deploy the model to another area. And also if we retrain model using new data, uh, it is um, sometimes the model forgets the old knowledge it learns. Um, so that is the catastrophe forgetting. Um, so how can we do this incremental learning? Well, we learn new no knowledge, but not forgetting the old knowledge um, uh, in, the, in the past. And also we're interested in, for example, this federated learning uh, scenario where we have um, data collected from different areas and how can we uh, integrate that also do personalized uh, uh, prediction uh, for patients at different um, uh, regions. So um, that's, I would like to conclude my talk and I would like to thank all my uh, students. Um, so this paper, uh, the main um, component of my talk is going to appear in iClear uh, 2022. And also I would like to thank all my other students who contributed to this project and also all my collaborators. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, next up, uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Fei Wong. Uh, Dr. Fei Wong is an associate professor at Weill Cornell Medicine and member of the member of the Fellows of the American Medical Informatics Association. Dr. Wong obtained his PhD in data mining and machine learning from Tsinghua University. Dr. Wong's work at Weill Cornell Medicine has received many awards, including the 2021 uh, Sanofi Idea Award the 2020 Google Faculty Research Award, and the 2019 inaugural ICHI Research Leadership Award, and the 2019 AWS Machine Learning Research Award. The Wong Lab focuses on the use of data mining and machine learning approaches, approaches uh, for health data analysis. So with that, I'll let you take it away, Dr. Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, Justin, for the introduction. So can people hear me and see my screen? Yes, I can hear you great and see your screen. Okay, great. So uh, uh, thank you everyone. It's uh, 
um, my great pleasure to uh, talk about some of my, uh, really about my thought on um, uh, like uh, model explanations in medicine. Um, it's, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the, the, the techniques, but really uh, because uh, I have been studying this for uh, uh, several years and there are, I'm going to uh, walk you through some of the involvement on the thoughts like uh, uh, Paul said, uh, since uh, 20, uh, I think for, for him since 2018, for me, it's really since like 2015, 2016. So, uh, I mean, the change of people's thoughts on, on these and uh, uh, what I'm thinking that would be uh, critical to address uh, next. So I have some uh, uh, transition slides. I don't think I need to spend too much of a time. So machine learning, of course, I think uh, for this audience, everybody know and the basic setups of uh, machine learning. And we like machine learning because of the recent advance and the uh, successes in uh, a lot of different areas from AlphaGo to autonomous driving to uh, uh, Alexa and to GPT-3 or all, 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 uh, we see a great advancement with uh, especially uh, 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 you know, the, the success of uh, uh, deep learning models. And then, so uh, why people are thinking about, I, I still remember when uh, I began to work on, I, I, by the way, I have been working on uh, various kinds of healthcare data analysis, but uh, when I started, because I'm trained as a machine learning scientist, but when I started working on uh, 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 health data analysis and mostly focused on electronic health records, and uh, that was back to 12 years ago, uh, so at that time, I mean, you know, 12 years ago, even CNN, I mean, ha hasn't won the ImageNet challenge yet. So um, when we talk about machine learning for EHR analysis, actually nobody buys in the idea. And typically it's a, it's a very challenging to talk to the clinicians or the experts on why do we need machine learning uh, for uh, uh, the healthcare data. Um, so, so, but with a uh, time evolving, I mean, we clearly, see, I mean, the potential because there are more and more information accumulated from all aspects of the patients and uh, with a lot of these great initiatives such as this precision medicine. So we really want to uh, uh, develop uh, a tailored or customized medicine and uh, uh, really uh, uh, kinds of like integrating all kinds of information around the patient to uh, understand the disease. And in, 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 in this context, it is really a challenging for a lot of the conventional or computational algorithms. Uh, I mean, a lot of uh, which are uh, hypothesis driven and uh, based on the assumption that uh, we don't have too much uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say covariates or, or um, uh, the problem setting is, is very clear. Um, I mean, this, uh, this uh, certainly introduces a lot of challenges we have here. Uh, we have heard a lot from yesterday's session and uh, uh, today's session. So, so that's why uh, uh, machine learning uh, 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 seems to be promising based on what we have seen uh, their successes in these, uh, in these other uh, complicated application scenarios. Uh, and then I just want to give you some of the uh, 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 examples on like uh, uh, what people have tried on uh, 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 applying machine learning in clinical medicine. I'm going to particularly uh, uh, focus on some of the examples in COVID-19 because it is still ongoing and we see all these different waves and different variants and different treatment and a lot of different stories about, uh, you know, all, all, all kinds of things. Um, so this is, I mean, I, I just want to list the two of the uh, 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 papers that um, appears at the early stage that was in uh, early 2020 when uh, COVID-19 just hit uh, the U.S. And as uh, I think most of you know, uh, we, uh, I mean, at Wild Cornell, at, at, at the epicenter, which, New, which is New York City at that time. So, I mean, we uh, at that time, there are lots of research still uh, like uh, emerging and uh, I'm trying to see, I mean, with uh, uh, a lot of the patient data and available information, whether we can uh, leverage them to, de uh, to uh, derive some insights to combat with the uh, 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 pandemic, right? So one of this work is published on Nature Machine Intelligence, where the authors uh, tries to develop a, a really interpretable mortality prediction model for COVID patients. And this model is really interpretable because it just includes uh, three lab tests of variables and the decision tree. Uh, they just use a decision tree to make the decision. And uh, you can see this is a decision tree and you can see this is a performance they got 
uh, on their patient population, which is uh, amazing. And um, that's why it uh, uh, attracted a lot of attentions all over the world. Um, and another uh, example is this work where the, the folks tries to combine, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the long CT scans, which is uh, an important uh, information source to characterize, especially the severity of uh, 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 the SARS-CoV-2 infection and combined with some, some other uh, variables to also uh, uh, predict uh, uh, some of the clinical outcomes of COVID-19. I mean, although, I mean, they combine with some non-image information, but uh, the, the, the critical information in this pipeline is those uh, long CT scans. And of course, they do some interpretations uh, that the model to show that the model can correctly, number one, segment uh, the region of interest out and highlight the necessary uh, uh, information that is needed for uh, the later on prediction. Uh, so these are excellent works uh, published on uh, excellent journals. But later on, so for the first work, so of course, as I said, it is highly interpretable model and it is very straightforward so people can easily re-implement that or replicate that at different places. But uh, um, then people find some problems. So there are, if, if, you, if you look at uh, uh, that article, so there are uh, five uh, like uh, matters of arising uh, right below it. So people from Europe, uh, I mean, the first three, I mean, the people from Europe try to replicate that, but they find a significant performance discrepancy when applying that model to European uh, uh, patient population, of course, in different countries. And uh, uh, the, the right two pieces are uh, domain expert, uh, so uh, uh, lab medicine um, professionals, they also uh, try to give some, uh, you know, domain uh, knowledge-based interpretations on why uh, this, this simple model may fail when applied that to uh, uh, different places. So uh, this raises some, some concerns. And later on, there's another article, uh, which is uh, more of like a review or, or, or survey that uh, reviewed a lot of uh, uh, studies to try to analyze as uh, you know, uh, images to, to do uh, predictions or or uh, extracting insights on, on the clinical outcomes of COVID, but they found, I mean, none of these models are potentially uh, clinically usable because uh, of what they, what they call either methodological flaws or uh, underlying biases. And then and, and, uh, uh, something nice is in, in that paper is these uh, authors also made some recommendations on these different aspects. I'm, I, I'm trying to uh, read them out because I thought the, these were uh, really interesting recommendations. Number one is, on the data, so I mean, as a, this is a triple W conference where uh, most of the uh, audience are from computer science. So in computer science, especially in machine learning, we are a fan of benchmarking and open science and and, and you know making the data public. But but uh, what these authors uh, recommend is we have to be cautious when uh, you know uh, evaluating your algorithm with public repositories uh, and uh, on the evaluation and, and of course external validation is really important I'm going to emphasize this at the end and again uh, during the rest of this talk so we can talk about more about that later on and uh, um, uh, replicability so put your code or whatever to some publicly available uh, available repositories like github I think this is a, a pretty good practice a lot of us has already done this so this is definitely a going to improve the reproducibility and replication of uh, the models we develop and also from uh, the authors where we, we should try to uh, you know uh, read all those reporting guidelines like uh, what Paul showed like uh, is there any model uh, uh, facts or uh, I mean people have uh, you know made a lot of reporting guidelines for uh, like medical AI or some other things to so try to <coughs> try to follow that. So these are definitely a good set of uh, recommendations. And then, so this, uh, uh, with these uh, uh, like prom potential promises and also the real uh, like uh, roadblocks uh, or challenges we saw. Uh, so this brings me uh, thinking about like uh, uh, what, what should we consider uh, for uh, like uh, 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 mach building machine learning models in medicine, right? So actually uh, before COVID, I uh, together with my colleague, I, I have this piece on JAMA internal medicine. And, and I talked about because that, at that time, deep learning was at the beginning, still booming uh, in medicine. So I talk about there are uh, uh, several potential aspects we should consider. So uh, 
it has a data quantity, data quality, so uh, uh, the bias and the fairness, the model security, uh, and also regulations. And, and, and if you look at uh, the, the papers published in this field in recent years, it actually touches all, uh, I mean, every single aspect of these, uh, 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 you know, different directions uh, we should consider. Um, but of course, uh, I mean, all of them are inter, uh, interrelated to each other. For example, the data quantity the data quality, a bias and interpretability. So what is the root cause for this? This is because number one, so, so medicine is really, really complicated. It's much more complicated than computer vision, image recognition, or voice recognition, or natural, or even natural language processing. And number two is we wouldn't have the luxury to have um, like a huge or easily uh, uh, Obtainable a uh, large sample size uh, uh, data to train your, uh, you know, uh, huge size uh, uh, model. So, in, in other words, we are in uh, uh, a lot of the times we are in a scenario where we have a, a much limited. Uh, uh, sample size, but with a much larger or complex a uh, problem space. So in this case, all these problems are not surprising. So 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 I mean, uh, uh, the, the, then then I mean, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the question is, what should we do to? Uh, I still believe machine learning is useful and important. And what should we do to make machine learning models? Uh, you know, uh, 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 really useful and uh, hopefully can alleviate or uh, mitigate some of these challenges or problems. Um, so then a, 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 a core question is, uh, because this is uh, talking about model explainability. So, so should we explain the models? Let me show you some, walk you through some of the involvement on, uh, uh, on the uh, 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 opinions and, and thoughts from different people. Of course, this is the, uh, the intense discussion about uh, uh, model explainability comes from this GDPR, uh, uh, you know, published out in 2016, which requires all the models to be explainable. And right after that, so uh, uh, Jeff Hinton, who is a, a guru or the godfather of deep learning, immediately said, "I mean, uh, I mean, I am a computer scientist. I mean, I, I'm. Uh, I mean, if you ask everybody to explain everything, it's just going to be a disaster. So people uh, can't even." Explain explain a lot of the things they think we we don't understand how brain works for now so why should we sh uh, should we care explanation so much and right after that there is an article on Forbes actually line by line paragraph by paragraph uh, kinds of like uh, uh, discuss what is wrong about uh, 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 Jeeves uh, 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 statement uh, which is uh, this is back to uh, 20 2016 2018 and then later on, we see a lot of research articles or perspectives like uh, Cynthia Rudin's perspective. Uh, uh, I mean, don't, don't uh, in high stakes scenario in, in, in like in medicine. So don't even bother uh, 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 explaining black box models. So don't even build black box models. So we, we can just uh, build really transparent and interpretable models. So stop explaining black box models uh, uh, from the beginning. And then there's uh, uh, Hannah Wallach from uh, uh, Microsoft, I mean, they did some uh, uh, user study, did some experiments showing that. So when you can't explain the model well, you, pre you present the explanation, both the explanation and the model to the users. I mean, the users tends to over rely on the model and cannot really spot as a, 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 you know, large size mistakes that made by the model because they trust the model too much. And uh, uh, also there is another recent study from Neil's Peak. Um, so they also did this kind of like a, 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 a two citizens jurist experiments, but essentially what they, uh, their conclusion is uh, um, like uh, for uh, healthcare workers, actually they, they, they trusted the model performance more than the explainability compared to uh, other professionals, which is a, a pretty counterintuitive. So, but this kind of uh, aligns with what, uh, what has, has been claimed in uh, Hannah's paper. Uh, and actually I also, uh, with my colleagues, and uh, uh, this is in, uh, I think I, I wrote this piece in 2018, but the paper was published in uh, early 2020. So, I, I mean, I emphasize that uh, it is not black or white, a question, so we have to really uh, like uh, 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 justify uh, what kind of model explanation is needed. 
depends on really the context. And recently, uh, Nigam Shah from Stanford also have this piece talking about this, uh, 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 you know, uh, opinion as well. So it really depends. So it is not like you should explain or not explain. Uh, and then, so there is another, I think, a very, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 impactful uh, article from Michigan where they kind of like uh, 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 look at the performance of a sepsis risk prediction model integrated in EPIC, uh, look at their performance in um, uh, U Michigan's patient population, and they, they discovered a drastically decreased performance uh, uh, compared to what has been claimed by uh, 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 the model it, uh, itself in EPIC. And of course, uh, there is uh, uh, some follow up discussion like this New England Journal of Medicine piece talking about, uh, I mean, the potential uh, population drift uh, as uh, has also been mentioned in some of the uh, prior works uh, in this workshop. And uh, there is also a recent blog discussion talking about that this is not just a, a, a distribution drift, but there could also be uh, temporal changes, which I'm going to touch later on. And uh, Marzia, who is our invited speaker, uh, 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 yesterday also had this nice piece talking about, so what should we do? I mean, with all these challenges and uh, uh, debates and the uh, controversies. Um, so uh, what she emphasized is we have to do rigorous validations or evaluations. And uh, uh, how should we do that? So look at RCTs. So randomized controlled trials, right? So, I mean, uh, uh, maybe we should do something similar. So so what is the RCTs? So RCTs is, uh, 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 I think now perhaps still the gold standard to uh, evaluate uh, the effect of an intervention or treatment. So essentially for the patient who are eligible, they blindly randomize them into a treatment arm or a control arm or two different uh, treatment arms and then give them the drugs or placebos and then look at, uh, I mean, over a certain period of time for certain uh, clinical outcome, if uh, the treatment arm getting better uh, or worse to uh, judge if the, uh, the drug effectiveness. And then let's look at if we want to perform RCTs for um, uh, 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 AI models. So what are the challenges there? So I'm just trying to think of one, uh, the, the next step. So RCT idea is good, but what should we do? I mean, how should we do RCTs on AI models? So uh, first, I mean, the first step for uh, uh, RCTs is, uh, I'm just trying to show uh, uh, a lot of the challenges we criticize about explainable AI also existing in RCT designs. So number one is eligibility criteria design. So one of the headache, if you talk to the pharma folks, so this EC design is really uh, de uh, determines um, who are eligible to participate in my RCT, okay? But, uh, you know, if you talk to the pharma folks, one of the big headache they have currently is they have two strict ECs and they cannot, or they can hardly find any eligible patients to participate in a trial. So uh, limited sample size or lack of inclusiveness is uh, actually a challenge, which means that the RCTs could also facing with a bias problem as well. It depends on what is the population, uh, I mean, uh, that is participating in your trial. Okay, so we have done some 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 works on using EHRs to hopefully improve the inclusiveness. Um, uh, but but uh, these are just some uh, explorations on how this is going to impact the the, the uh, uh, AI uh, RCT for AI. Uh, I, I'm not sure yet, but it is worthy of thinking about that. And number two is randomization. So uh, the the reason why people believe this RCT or why it is uh, uh, treated as a golden standard is because really the randomization. So initially we really want the people they really look look uh, similar or the same from each other. One take the drug, one don't take the drug, and then you can fairly compare the outcomes. Um, but there are still a lot of challenges. I mean, there are propensity score or, or inverse weighting. I wouldn't mention that. And actually recently there are people thinking about being a more complicated scenario or data set. You can use complicated method to calculate a propensity score. But actually we have done some investigations. Uh, I mean, the paper is currently under review. Uh, I mean, it is not the case. Uh, I mean deep learning model does not uh, always uh, can, can beat uh, traditional logistic regression in this case. Um, 
And, and, and then the question is how, I mean, if, if we talk about RCTs for AI model, so what can you do about randomization? Uh, number three is outcome evaluation. So this one is also challenging. So after we do the randomization, so you you you, you are at the randomization point, it is, a, it is a snapshot. So at that time, all the patient, let's say if you do the randomization uh, perfectly, so all the patient looks the same, right? But then the problem is over the time, some of them progressing fast, so some of them progressing slow as I show here for COVID patients. Initially when they were admitted to the hospital or in this case is when they were on mechanical ventilation. So they, I mean, if you look at their, their organ dysfunction scores, they look the same or in this Parkinson's disease uh, uh, case. So over the time you see the, the, the curves diverge which indicates their progression trajectories are, 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 are different and then and this, this is also a big concern for, um, uh, I mean, attributing to the failure of a lot of the uh, like uh, Alzheimer's disease trials. So then what should we do if we want to consider RCTs for AI models? That is another thing we have to consider. And the last thing I want to uh, mention is this adaptation. So especially with the AI models, the diseases are progressing over time. Like in this case, we build a model to predict the SARS-CoV-2 infection status. And we build our model using March and April data from New York City, uh, where you see the red are the are the uh, 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 COVID negative, I mean, non SARS CoV 2 infected patients, and blue are the infected patients. We do the UMAP plot, so you can see we use their lab profiles and you can see their distribution in two dimensional space. But you can see if in May and June, I mean, you see a drastically change. Uh, distribution for uh, uh, the positives and the negatives, so you cannot expect your model train in March and April to work in May and June. So in this case, so how, how are you going to consider the adaptations? How are you going to regulate that? How are you going to audit um, the model performance over time? That's another challenge that may not exist for a uh, conventional, let's say we talk a lot about software as a device for FDA regulations, but in this case, we definitely have to consider these adaptations, but how? So all these are questions we have to consider. So, but uh, uh, let's go back to our questions. So with all these questions, uh, so uh, we want to design RCTs. We want to have more uh, uh, rigorous validations of the performance of the model. But that's all true. That's all good uh, uh, points. But in order to design that RCTs for AI model, do we need model explanations? I, I think for, for me, the answer is definitely yes. I, because I don't see without a, ex, a proper explanation or interpretation or with a, just a black box model, how can you conquer all those questions, overcome all those challenges and design appropriate trials? But how uh, is, a, is a question I hope our community can, can think of more and hopefully we can uh, really work out uh, like like real RCTs. I mean, how should we uh, design RCTs for AI models? I mean, with all those considerations. And uh, lastly, of course, some some sh uh, shameless plugins. I mean, my lab has been working on a lot of these uh, uh, theoretical works, not just those uh, uh, perspectives or uh, clinical papers, but also the theoretical works about amount of explanations uh, as well. And hopefully, we can get closer and closer to uh, like a, a really building a deployable and explainable machine learning models that is really helpful for medicine. And uh, this is my uh, uh, the acknowledgement to uh, the, the uh, uh, fundings and also my group members. And uh, these are some of the works uh, that is currently ongoing in my lab. And uh, if you're interested, uh, please contact me and we are actually uh, uh, recruiting uh, uh, members in our lab. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. Uh, at this point, uh, just another reminder, if you have any questions to put them in the chat. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Pritwish Chakraborty from IBM. Uh, Dr. Chakraborty is currently a research staff member and global sub theme lead at the IBM Research Center of Computational Health at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center in New York. His work focuses on applications of data science towards patient health characterization and risk modeling. And broadly, his research interests are temporal data mining, machine learning, and causal inference. He received his PhD in computer science on applications of data science to public health forecasting from Virginia Tech. 
He has received manager choice and excellence awards at IBM, as well as leading a team that won the first biobank disease challenge organized by Partners Healthcare. He has published 30 papers with over 750 citations to premier journals and conferences such as KDD, SDM, uh, AAAI, and TBME. He co-organized uh, DS Health uh, in, from 2019 to 2021. Um, and also uh, MLMH workshops as part of the Knowledge Discovery and Data Mining Conference at KDD. He has also helped facilitate KDD Health Day uh, from 2018 to 2021, and he serves on the as a regular reviewer for venues such as IJCAI, AAAI, NeurIPS, ICML, ECML, PKDD, TNNLS, and NSR. He also mentors multiple PhD and undergraduate students and acts as a guest editor for AIIM. With that, uh, Dr. Chakraborty, are you able to share your screen? Thanks, Ian. Let me try that. Uh, can you see my screen? Awesome, yes. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, and I think like, you know, my talk perfectly sits from what we have learned throughout from yesterday. And what I'm gonna talk about a little bit is on human-centered explainability for healthcare. Um, I'm going to, you know, like, you know, modify the slide pace based on like something that we have already heard, but just a, a brief overview. You know, we have talked, we have heard a lot about like, you know, AI in healthcare and just wanted to mention like there are various um, aspects of healthcare. And if you really think uh, ML and AI can, uh, like really play an important part in all of these facets from payers to providers to pharma and patients and so on. Uh, but even with all of these, uh, we haven't really seen the adoption that we would like. I think various speakers have touched upon different aspects and on, your, on the slide here, uh, you can see like some of the main points such as trust, explainability, bias, robustness, data, and also alignment with existing clinical workflows. But for this uh, particular uh, workshop, let's focus a little bit on this aspect of explainability. So before we go into explainability for health, one thing we should kind of try to think about is like the methods for explainable AI is a rapidly growing field. Uh, it's very diverse and there are various ways of looking at it, various ontologies. This is one ontology uh, which is adapted from the AIX360 um, uh, framework. Uh, and where we can think of explainability either in the data or the model side, whether you need static or interactive explanations, are you working with a uh, like self-interpretable model or you are trying to do a black box model and so on. And really, this is one way of looking at the problem because depending on the data and the types of models that you have, you may follow along one of these branches and pick your explainability method. And you can then take this and adapt that to various healthcare problems. So on your screen, you see four types of different problems that where we have applied these different methods. Uh, and you know, for each of them, like for example, in the top, we are looking at, uh, uh, it's this a multimodal model combining both genomic and EHR factors. We are trying to figure out COVID severity and uh, there we have applied line. You can another for different problems, uh, sex, you can have applied SHAP uh, for uh, trying to variously look at what are the like the most positive as well as the most negative factors. We have used contrastive explanation methods. And on a very different scale to all of that, just to identify like what are the most important data points to really understand your data set, you have applied Protodash. And there are various other models for all of these. And again, similarly following the tragic, like the previous graph, you can go and pick the right model for your use case. But as we have heard just right now and from before, we have a lot of the methods which are uh, evolving as much, but there are a lot of controversies and contrasting viewpoints. Uh, we have heard a little bit about, you know, some of these uh, things that we just, uh, like, you know, Dr. Wang touched upon. Uh, they can be tampered with, uh, there are adversarial attacks, uh, like they may really not be uh, like, you know, explaining the model that you are looking at. But even with all of that, there are arguments for XAI, especially in health. So various viewpoints are there as, as usual. So for example, Michael Hind states, had the impact, there is a need for explanations. 
And on the other hand, uh, Dr. Rudin and others argues for favor of simpler models in uh, you know, high stakes situations. But if we go one step deeper and try to understand like, you know, one viewpoint, like why is there so much controversies regarding explanations? And we can try to think of this coming from this idea of like, what is explainability? And, and really, you know, explainability is not a well-defined problem. Uh, you can think of explanation as a conversation. And if you think of a conversation from person A to person B, that is that has been studied in social sciences, but when you actually have a good conversation, it's not really formally defined. And then when you try to superpose that to a human and computer interaction, the problem just gets harder. So, I mean, as you know, as we have just heard, uh, like XAI may not be feasible, right? Uh, but again, there are works and like I am like in a personal opinion, I'm hopeful we'll get to the stage where even if you are not able to solve every aspect of explainability, we'll at least be able to say, you know, what it is that we are explaining and, you know, like where it can be used. Um, so again, we have heard a lot about these problems. So what's another uh, take? Like how can we approach explainability in our current situation in an applied field? And something that we came up with is this idea of personas. And really this idea comes from uh, the seminal work from Michael Hine, where uh, the author claims like, while we don't really uh, cannot formally define explanations, what we can do is for each of your problem, try to identify who your end users are and then work bottom up, try to figure out what are the requirements uh, why do they need explanation? So it's not a one size uh, fits all approach. It's more like for each of your different consumers of system, try to understand who they are. So we followed this methodology and we proposed what we called a health XAI persona continuum. Some of the thing that I want to stress here is while we have these three distinct personas, they are not the most comprehensive ones. So for example, you don't see patients on this persona spectrum. Also, when we talk about personas, they're really a characterization of your end users. So a single person can be wearing the hat of a particular persona if they're working on some separate problem, right? So with that understanding, we can think of these three distinct personas for most of the problems that we kind of work on. Uh, one is a data scientist who is more closer to the model building, speaks AI, ML, and stats. The other is the clinical researcher who's almost like the translational role and they translate what is being you know, provided as this like you know, different uh, models and apply that to uh, the final clinical setting. And then you have the bedside clinicians who's more focused on how do I take all of these tools and provide the best care for my patient. And depending on that, their you know, requirements may be different. For example, the clinician uh, may be really focused on uh, this patient-centric approach. Like, is this model right for this particular patient? What do I know about this patient's condition more uh, with this um, like knowledge that I have? So ever since we first kind of you know, put this forward, we kind of followed it up and we looked at how can you take this idea of personas for one specific problem. And in this case, we kind of looked at this idea of a disease progression modeling. Um, and at a very high level in disease progression modeling, we try to characterize the states of the patient as they go through, uh, in most cases for the problem that we work with, progressive diseases and how better we can identify when the patient switches states so that the best care can be provided. And um, again, we followed the previous methodology and then we broke it down and tried to identify what can be useful for each of these personas. And again, focusing on like, let's say the clinician, uh, like one of the main thing that does comes up and this is again, based on some user studies that we did, uh, they try to relate this kind of DPM to uh, generate evidence-based medicine. We just heard uh, from Dr. Wang, this idea of evaluations in, in the clinical setting, and that's kind of really being the gold mark for most of these. Um, so let's take this one step forward, and I'm just being cognizant of the time here. Uh, we can 
drill down into this idea and then try to look at with this kind of knowledge how can we then build uh, systems for these different personas so on the first hand for example a data scientist may be looking to understand more the boundary conditions of the model and that is to do two things one they're try trying to identify uh, like kind of debug their model and see how robust the model is but also generate these high level insights that they can communicate with the other personas so that they can try to bring it back and try to improve their models so a lot of these you know for example in this case we use this idea of partial dependence plots and a combination of uh, contrastive explanations and proto dash in the second stage when we take this forward and put this into a, a like you know a, a kind of like a system to so that the clinical researcher can ingest that and like in this case uh, figure out like the right kind of trial strategies and so on there they try we, it's kind of like elevating these highlights into things that are more useful to them so in this case we go deeper into each of the state transitions trying to characterize those states and this is almost like you know post hoc analysis where we are trying to identify what the model has learned try to communicate that with the clinical researchers and so on and finally you see like one more example where for the clinicians uh, this is a, a based on rnn based model and there we try to provide like treatment pathways for a single patients and let them do conduct what if analysis for that particular patient so these are you know one way of looking at it and we we talk about the side of personas but one thing to also note in here is what are other things being worked on so um in like other sister fields like uh, you know uh, hci and so on people have been looking at explainability from a very different viewpoint uh, like you know you see on the left hand side some ways of trying to exactly classify what explanation is and how do this uh, correlate in a kind of a system form on the other hand side you you see like some efforts being done in trying to identify uh, in this kind of a user centric uh, per, like in a phenomena what is the right kind of xi questions to ask how to ask them and how to you know map them uh, back to the models and so on so this is uh, this is useful this is hopeful right uh, and we took this forward and we kind of combined them and we try to do a couple of user studies to see if we can uh, merge this idea of personas along with this uh, this kind of like formalism that is trying to come up with respect to user centric explainability from our sister fields so this uh, uh, problem that we are looking at right now it's a t2dm risk prediction use case a very classical uh, i would say application of ai for health where we are uh, trying to identify among type 2 diabetic patients what are their complications uh, what are the risk of different complications as they progress through their uh, health journey and what we did like you know the cohorting and the other parts can be standard but what we did in here is we actually did a small user study with uh, experts to try try to identify how such models can be used in practice and something that really kind of you know motivated us to find out is if we really do this conversations we we see this distinct scenarios and these scenarios uh, are not only just as i mentioned previously it's not just methods but how they also integrate with their general um, workflow workflow right so for example in here uh, if the patient is new the the thing that the pcp is interested in the the insights that the pcp wants from this kind of risk tools are vastly different then if they are looking at this patient for the second time and so on like for example uh, for the returning patient they are more interested in understanding is the patient still managed like in this case of type 2 diabetes are the risk increasing or decreasing and in an ideal setting we really want like you know while the physician's current mental model um, like uh, informs how they look at and you know analyzes this new risk tools really if it's a, a good explaining ai that should contribute back and somehow enrich the physician's mental model and that's the workflow that is uh, that we think is ideal in this kind of a scenario 
So with this, uh, we went forward and tried to again merge these two different ideas. And uh, if we took look at the left hand side, one way to look at uh, explanations is this idea of uh, uh, like you know how do you characterize the different types of explanations? So on one hand side, you have things such as case based. And this is very intuitive to like a lot of doctors. So for example, you may want to say what kind of, like for this patient that you're seeing, who is the other patient that I have seen before or in my EHR who have somewhat of a similar trajectory, right? On the other hand, like, you know, we talked about this kind of evaluation based and you can classify that with respect to statistical uh, evaluation. We haven't, uh, you know, maybe touched upon a lot of this, but there's a lot of also work in biology on based on simulation based, where we try to simulate what happens in a synthetic population if you are particularly given this drug and so on. And one thing that we can do is based on these explanations, we can try to identify the types of questions that be, can be asked for each of these different explanations type, right? And on the bottom, we kind of look, take that, and again, in this is T2DM use case, and we try with this first initial uh, formalism as to map that for each particular user question and try to figure out how such answers can be constructed from different parts of the explanations. So for example, uh, in this use case, we are combining uh, things such as, you know, uh, feature importances, but coming from this idea of a fact and files, this is coming from pertinent positives, uh, but we are also including things such as contextual knowledge, and that is coming from uh, domain knowledge such as CCI calculators and so on. And using that, we try to provide the answers that, let's say, this person is interested in uh, simulation-based inference, and we try to provide them the right kind of answers. So, Moving forward, uh, we continued this use case and uh, we tried to then kind of create this end-to-end -end system, right? And what we understood is uh, like for our end users, in this case, there were various, uh, you know, uh, classifications of PCPs. Uh, they, we wanted to provide them risk prediction models, um, but we also wanted to provide them in, uh, as, as not to replace their current workflow, but something to augment their workflow. And so we created this kind of a clinician friendly dashboard that is meant to be used along with their EHR. And we used different kinds of domain knowledge as well. And so that doesn't mean just patient data. We also looked at different ontologies and guidelines. And we came up with this idea of contextual explanations uh, that is meant to provide more information around what the model is uh, generating. And, um, Again, not going to too much details of that, but you know, really this is kind of, you can think of like this idea of a multimodal uh, method and various stages where we are contextualizing the post-hoc explanations, we are contextualizing the patient and the risk prediction and also contextualizing uh, like the final, like what happens if like, you know, let's say this risk is there. So what happens to this patient if you think this risk is there? And we, um, heavily leverage this idea of clinical guidelines. And uh, again, so we were working with type 2 diabetes. So we were looking at some of these ADA guidelines and you know, similar guidelines are uh, available for other kinds of diseases. And what we really found is a very interesting problem uh, where we have to actually do a combination of symbolic learning and uh, deep learning models where, uh, to extract information from chapters, extract what are the different recommendation groups, and also extract you know, what is recommended for each of these uh, different, um, you know, like let's say we say like the risk prediction model identifies this one particular drug. So we can go back and see what does the guideline say about this drug and what are the following studies that both support and uh, not support this drug. And using that, uh, we, uh, we did like, you know, for the user studies and we, this is just an example and we, the, the full paper we, um, we further did like more analysis into like you know four different categories which i and you know happy to go in uh, later during the uh, panel and so on but we came up with this different kinds of question that we asked that we can answer for example uh, through this kind of system and as you can see like they are a combination of different modalities so uh, like if it's just like with the patient data or from the guidelines plus patient data, they can be combining different kinds of models. 
and they can be also contextualizing different aspects. And in our final uh, journal, uh, we actually report that that um, leads to it being more useful to our end clinicians and uh, you know, further points to the areas that where they need more support. So we just you know, talked about this idea of personas and different um, explanation types. Uh, I just want to, you know, in a concluding part, just want to uh, focus on this person of clinicians. And there has been a lot of studies we heard a lot during this workshop as well, but wanted to highlight uh, a, a, a couple of these studies where uh, people try to uh, you know, find out these formalisms, like what do you need for clinicians, right? And um, similar to like what you have heard before, uh, like some of the things that we uh, figured out is we need to find out where the model may fall short, uh, know the variable that have derived the decision of the model. Similarly, you know, what the, the different design, right? So uh, a, a good design should enable the clinician to gain the trust on model prediction rather than just, you know, the, like in a way of fooling the trust. Um, and that involves things such as transparency, uh, task specific actions, and so on. Feature importances, as we mentioned, were very important, but typically for uh, a clinician looking at a patient, instance level explanations were some of the most important uh, attributes. And finally, uh, for a good model, we need to have good ideas of uncertainty, uh, temporal explanations, as you know, uh, Dr. Wang was uh, mentioning before, and different transparent design. And so with all of these cases, I want to kind of go to the takeaway. And so, you know, kind of what we have heard throughout the uh, workshop. So we, we do desire XAI in health, but it is challenging because it's ill-defined and, you know, it, it is getting there, but it's not, you know, and there are a lot of critiques which will help us get there, right? But what we kind of try to say here is, you know, looking at this personas, looking at this, you know, let's say this one particular clinician, XAI at this current stage should not be thought of as a, a thing by itself, right? So it should be considered as a part of whole. Uh, and then that includes all this analysis like robustness, system processes, uncertainty and fairness. And one way we are approaching this is, uh, it's not that scalable approach, but from like current application, start from a bottom, a bottom up methods. There's a lot of work done on user centric methods and try to combine them to present some explanations. And so with that, I just want to uh, thank, uh, you know, our collaborators across different universities who are working on this. And I just want to mention three students in particular who worked a lot on these different problems. And with that, I'm probably going to stop and uh, give the time back to you, Ian. Thank you so much, Dr. Chakraborty. And uh, also we'll have the video interview published soon. So thank you so much for that as well. Um, okay, moving you. on to our next speakers. Um, we actually have two speakers um, at the same time, and that is um, Dr. Pranav Rajprakar from uh, Harvard and Angel Saporta from Healthy Eye at Apple. Dr. Pranav Rajprakar is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, leading a research lab working on developing artificial intelligence technologies for medical applications. His lab has developed label efficient deep learning algorithms that can read medical images at the level of experts, built large scale open medical data sets and demonstrated the positive and negative effects of AI on medical decision making. Dr. Raj Perkar uh, co-hosts the AI Health podcast and co-edits the Dr. Penguin AI Health newsletter, which are both really awesome resources. He instructed the Coursera course series on AI for medicine and leads the medical AI bootcamp program. Previously, Dr. Raj Perkar received his BS, uh, his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees, all in computer science from Stanford University. Um, presenting alongside him is Adriel Saporta. Uh, Adriel is a research engineer on Apple's health AI team and also co-hosts the AI Health Podcast, uh, which you all should definitely check out after this conference. She recently completed her master's in computer science at Stanford, where she conducted research at the intersection of AI and healthcare in Dr. Andrew Ng's Stanford Machine Learning Group. She has held engineering and product roles across both big tech and startups. Uh, Adriel began her career as an, excessive, and as an executive assistant at Vogue. And she also spent time working in the theater industry in New York City. She holds an MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business and a Bachelor's of Arts in Comparative Literature from Yale University. And with that, um, Adriel or uh, Dr. Rushpakar, are you able to share your screen? Yes, I'll do it. Uh, thanks for the kind intro, Ian. 
Um, I'll get started. So delighted to be here today and presenting with Adriel. Um, as I thought about what I'd share with you today, I thought we could break our time together into two parts. The first in which I want to talk about three key downstream uses of exp explainable AI and walk through a few examples and then want to do one deep dive into a research project. So that's our goal for the next 20 minutes here. Um, so I want to start by sharing a little bit of these three directions, which I believe are useful uh, applications of explainable AI. Um, just a little bit to motivate these three directions, our mission in the lab is to safely automate medical decision-making tasks and improve patient outcomes. And um, three goals towards the three of the most important challenges that a lot of us in the field are considering are how we go from label intensive algorithms that take a lot of label data to label efficient algorithms using techniques like self-supervised and multimodal learning, looking at open benchmark curation and how we transition from having these private data sets all across healthcare to really diverse public data sets, and how we enable clinicians and AI to collaborate with each other and measure the validity of that collaboration in studies. And our lab works on this, we look at imaging and sensors, and we look at uh, translating with hospitals and industry partners to, uh, to answer these questions. And so I want to give you a few examples. So as you're well aware, there have been plenty of applications which show that models perform as well as experts when you give them a lot of training examples. But what happens when you don't have a lot of training examples and a lot of resources to collect that data? How can we use a small number of labeled examples and one emerging direction has been self-supervised learning methods which allow us to leverage unlabeled data. Here we use some unlabeled data to show that with a small fraction of training examples we're able to do chest x-ray classification well we can put some physiological signal insights to be able to model ECGs better and learn better from unlabeled data. We're able to combine the use of images with other modalities like reports to be able to do uh, classification or report generation. And we're able to apply these same techniques across a wide variety of modalities. Now, the key question here is how are self-supervised models learning differently? And this is what I believe are one of the key questions that um, explainable AI techniques will be able to help us answer. Um, I wanna talk next about open benchmark curation. So open benchmarks have been widely useful uh, for the field um, of AI, and then specifically for uh, the field of medical AI have enabled a lot of progress to happen. And one of the big challenges for the field is how do we now measure how models are generalizing to new geographies, new patient populations, new clinical settings, and how can we enable this measurement to happen? Towards this front, we've looked at what happens when you apply models to uh, chest x-ray films instead of digital chest x-rays. What happens if you take large language models and apply them uh, to uh, patients of different demographics? What happens if you're trying to extract all of the content from a radiology report and represent it as a graph? And work that we'll deep dive into later uh, in this session where Adriel uh, led some work uh, that we'll share shortly. But one key use here of explainable AI is can we predict generalizations to new settings? And towards this front, one of our current projects is looking at how we can go from a handful of hospitals that have been used to evaluate AI algorithms to about a 50 to 100 hospitals across the globe, which will allow us to measure how well models generalize to external sites and diverse patient population, and then assess what factors are associated with those performance drop, and then say, okay, can we use domain adaptation to be able to fix this gap? The final front I wanna talk about is clinician AI collaboration. As we know, one of the key um, challenges to fill is going from measuring how models perform by themselves to how they perform in the hands of clinicians. And we've been conducting studies that allow us to get closer and closer to these questions in different settings, like for chest X-ray interpretation, uh, when looking at whether patients have active TB or not, or even something like looking at um, uh, uh, patient records and seeing if we can optimize clinician time when looking at those patient records. And one key use of explainable AI is can we predict when and who to assist 
um, using these tools that we're developing. And these are some questions I'm very excited about. I just want to end before handing it off to Adriel on a few efforts that we're um, leading to be able to engage the community more in our efforts. There's a Coursera course on AI for Medicine that I helped develop with Adriel, who will shortly speak. Uh, we run the AI Health podcast and we talk to uh, entrepreneurs and scientists uh, who are leading um, in the space, not just from an academic angle, but also from an industry angle. And there's a Dr. Penguin newsletter where we highlight the latest AI health advances. We also have a training program at Harvard Stanford uh, for being able to train students at this intersection of AI and medicine. So I'll stop there uh, and hand it off to Adriel. Thanks for having us. Great. Thanks, Pranav. All right, let me share my screen here. All right, cool. Is everyone seeing this? Pranav, are you seeing this? Cool. All right. Um, so thanks again for having us. Um, as Pranav mentioned, deep learning has, has enabled uh, the automated chest X-ray interpretation at a level often surpassing that of practicing radiologists. And so um, in general, the potential benefits of automated diagnostic models are numerous, uh, including workflow prioritization, clinical decision support, large scale screening. Um, but many clinicians, very understandably, have been hesitant to adopt what they see as these sort of black box deep learning uh, models into their clinical workflows because of lack of model interpretability. Um, and that's pretty reasonable, right? Like without being able to understand why a model is making the prediction that it is, there's a risk that the model may perpetuate social biases or, or generalize poorly across different contexts. Um, and so one type of interpretation solution that's widely used in the context of medical imaging are saliency methods. And since saliency methods provide post hoc interpretability of, of um, models that are never exposed to bounding box annotations or pixel level segmentations during training, they're particularly useful in the context of medical imaging where these ground truth segmentations can be especially time consuming and, and expensive to obtain. And these methods essentially produce heat maps that, that highlight the area of, of a medical image that most influenced the model's prediction. So in a medical context, they help us visualize whether or not a neural network is concentrating on maybe like the same regions of a chest X-ray that um, a radiologist would focus on when making a diagnosis. And so the question that we set out to answer in this paper that, that I'm gonna to present today was, are these saliency methods any good? You know, should we be trusting them? Um, there have been studies that have shown that saliency methods are not particularly robust in general and, and can even be misleading and instill a false sense of confidence in a model, which in the medical context could have potentially dangerous implications for patient care. And so the purpose of our work was to perform a systematic evaluation of seven of the most common saliency methods, including GradCam, GradCam++, and integrated gradients um, in a multi-label classification setup for chest X-ray interpretation. So to start our data set, um, we use Chexpert, which is a large publicly available data set of chest X-rays labeled for the presence of 14 observations. Um, <clears throat> we decided to focus on only 10 of the 14 observations. We excluded no finding, fracture, plural other, and pneumonia, um, either because they had low prevalence or, or sort of ill-defined boundaries, like no finding is, is hard to segment. Um, that didn't really make sense for segmentation. And this is our framework. So I'll walk you through this now. Um, we use this to evaluate saliency method localization performance. So starting with the top row, uh, we passed each of the chest X-rays in the test set into a trained ensemble model and then got out image level predictions or probabilities for the 10 pathologies of interest. And then we use the saliency method to create a saliency map for each of the 10 classes that we were interested in. And then if you apply some fun coloring and opacity to those saliency maps and overlay them on to the original chest X-ray, these are the heat maps that you see here in the middle. I don't have, I'm not sure if I, you guys can see my cursor, but in the middle there. Um, and the goal is to be able to compare these heat maps with segmentations that are drawn by human radiologists. And so to be able to do that, we applied a threshold to the heat maps to produce binary segmentations, which is what, what you see on the far right. In the second row, we went out and collected ground truth segmentations for these same chest X-rays from radiologists, which you see in blue. But taking a step back, you know, if you were to take two radiologists and ask them to segment atelectasis on a chest X-ray, there's actually fairly high variability in what those segmentations would look like. 
So to understand what the human benchmark looked like, we collected a second set of expert segmentations from a separate group of radiologists, which you see in green on the bottom. And you'll see that, you know, if you compare actually those two segmentations, there's, there's certainly some overlap in how they segmented those pathologies on the chest X-ray, but it's far from perfect, like in the, in the middle. And again, I wish I had my, my cursor, but, you know, we know that the patient has pleural effusion, but the ground truth radiologist seems to feel that it's bilateral pleural effusion. So you see two segmentations in the middle in blue, but the benchmark radiologists seem to think that the pleural effusion is only on one side of the chest um, on, the, on the bottom in green. And so we wanted to look at how the saliency method segmentations compare to the ground truth segmentations, but also how the benchmark segmentations compare to the ground truth segmentations. Um, I also want to mention we're, we're making our data set of expert segmentations publicly available to encourage further development and evaluation of chest X-ray interpretation models. Um, we'll be setting up a competition soon and we're really excited about that. Okay, cool. So how did we actually compare these three sets of segmentations? Uh, we used two evaluation metrics. The first one, uh, intersection over union, or IOU, is a fairly standard method when evaluating semantic segmentation outputs. It measures the overlap of two sets of segmentations. Um, so here on the right, we have two example chest x-rays. In the first one, um, there's a fairly low overlap between the two segmentations, so the IOU is only 0 0.078. The second chest x-ray has a much higher overlap between the two segmentations, so it has an IOU of 0 0.682. But again, looking at the first chest x-ray, you know, one could argue that the saliency method, which is in purple, actually did do a pretty good job of localizing that pathology, but the IOU is low because we only have this small overlap. And so you can see that there, there could be times in which the saliency method or even the benchmark radiologist actually localizes a pathology fairly well, but IOU as an evaluation metric can sort of unfairly penalize their segmentations. And so we sought to address this by using a second evaluation metric that's called pointing game. And the idea behind the pointing game is to highlight when two segmentations share the same diagnostic intention. So even if the exact boundaries of the segmentations aren't perfectly aligned. And the way that pointing game accuracy or what we call hit rate uh, works is that we take the pixel with the largest value from each sal saliency map. And then we determine whether or not that single pixel fell within the bounds of the ground truth segmentation. So in the first chest X-ray, the purple dot represents the pixel that the saliency method felt was most indicative of the pathology. And because that pixel falls within the blue ground truth segmentation, it would be considered a hit. Whereas on the right, the second chest X-ray, we see that the highest value pixel is not within the blue ground truth segmentation. And so that would be considered a miss. And now, of course, the benchmark radiologists don't give values to every single pixel in their segmentation. Um, so in order to replicate the pointing game set up with them, in addition to asking them to draw segmentations for each pathology, we also ask them to identify the single most representative point for that pathology on the chest X-ray. So in order to actually compare the localization performance of the saliency methods um, with the human benchmark, uh, we ran a whole bunch of experiments using uh, the seven saliency methods that you see across the top there. Um, we used two about the two evaluation metrics that we discussed, so IOU and hit rate, and also three different CNN architectures. So we tried DensNet 121, ResNet 152, and Inception v4. Ultimately, we found that GradCam with DensNet 121 generally demonstrated better localization performance across pathologies and evaluation metrics. Um, and so for the rest of this work, we really focused on comparing the human benchmark with GradCam run on DensNet 121, which is from now on, we'll call that the saliency method pipeline. So first we compared <clears throat> the saliency method and human benchmark localization performances using the overlap evaluation scheme, so that's MIOU. Um, so on the y-axis, we have MIOU, which is just the mean IOU of all the test set images for that pathology. And you'll notice that five of the 10 pathologies, um, the saliency method pipeline had a significantly lower MIOU than the human benchmark. Um, so for example, on the, on the left here, even though saliency method pipeline had one of the highest AUROC scores for support devices, 0.969, it had among the worst localization performances when using MIOU as an evaluation metric. We did the same comparison using hit rate as our evaluation metric, where hit rate is just the percentage of all segmentations that were hits as opposed to misses. And you'll see that now for, the, for seven of the 10 pathologies, the saliency method pipeline had a significantly lower hit rate than the human benchmark. And in fact, the hit rate saliency method pipeline did not significantly outperform the human benchmark on any of the 10 pathologies. So generally speaking, regardless of which evaluation metric was being used, the saliency method pipeline significantly underperformed the human benchmark. 
So the next question we wanted to answer was why does the saliency method pipeline tend to perform better or worse on certain pathologies? You know, does it have to do with the pathology itself? Does it have to do with how the model performs on that pathology? And so we conducted a quantitative analysis using four geometric features. Um, the first characteristic we looked at was the number of instances. The second, which is the first two boxes there on the top. Uh, the second characteristic we looked at was size. So just the area of the pathology with respect to the area of the whole chest X-ray. And then the last two pathological characteristics that we looked at were elongation and rectangularity. And they try to capture the complexity of a pathology shape. Um, just, so they were sort of designed to capture what, what radiologists usually describe as uh, focal or diffuse. Um, and so for both characteristics, we fitted a rectangle of minimum area enclosing the binary mask, which is those yellow boxes that you see there. And then for each evaluation scheme, so overlap and hit rate, we ran eight simple linear regressions, four with the evaluation metric of the saliency method pipeline as a dependent variable, and then four with the difference between the evaluation metrics of the saliency method pipeline and the human benchmark as a, de as a dependent variable. And each regression used one of the four geometric features as a single independent variable. And the idea for doing that was that each regression coefficient could be interpreted as the effect of that pathological characteristic on the evaluation metric at hand. And we found that regardless of evaluation metric, saliency method localization performance suffered in the presence of pathologies that were small in size and complex in shape. However, we also found that the gap in hit rate localization performance was characterized by number of instances. So as the number of instances of a pathology increases, like so the number of segmentations, despite no significant change in hit rate localization performance itself, the gap in hit rate localization performance increased. Um, so that suggested to us that the saliency method performs poorly in the face of multi-instance diagnoses, um, which we were able to confirm with the qualitative analysis as well. Finally, uh, we wanted to see whether there was any correlation between the model's confidence in its prediction and localization performance. So we first ran a simple regression for each pathology using the model's probability output for the pathology as a single independent variable, and then using the saliency method IOU as a dependent variable. And then for this last row here in the table, we ran another simple regression using the same setup, but this time combining all 10 pathologies. And we found that for all pathologies, model confidence was positively correlated with MIOU saliency method pipeline performance. The p-values for all of the coefficients were below 0 0.001, except for pneumothorax and lung lesion, which are the two pathologies for which we had the fewest positive examples. And of all the pathologies, model confidence for positive predictions of enlarged cardiomediastinum had the largest linear regression coefficient. Model confidence for positive predictions of pneumothorax had the largest Spearman correlation coefficient, um, although the coefficient admittedly wasn't as statistically significant as the Spearman correlation coefficient for pleural effusion. Um, we also performed analogous experiments using hit rate as a response variable and found comparable results. And so just general takeaways, you know, we did establish the first human benchmark for chest X-ray segmentation in a multi-label classification setup. Um, we were able to demonstrate that saliency maps are consistently worse than expert radiologists, regardless of model classification, AUROC. Um, and that's concerning in a clinical setting. If, if saliency maps inaccurately highlight a pathology, it could easily cause a clinician to lose trust in a model's predictive ability, even if the model's output prediction is correct. Um, we use qualitative and quantitative analyses to establish that saliency method localization performance is most inferior to human benchmark localization performance when a pathology has multiple instances, is smaller in size, or has shapes that are more complex, um, which could suggest that deep learning explainability as a clinical interface may be less reliable and less useful when used for pathologies with those characteristics. Um, we also showed that model assurance um, is positively correlated with saliency method localization performance, which could indicate that saliency methods are safer to use as a decision aid to clinicians when the model has made a positive prediction with high confidence. And then ultimately, you know, we, we concluded that the pitfalls of saliency maps for medical imaging interpretation really need to be addressed before these explanations are used towards increasing trust in, in clinical workflows. Cool. And thank you guys for, for taking the time to listen. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, we're uh, 
we will be heading into our last keynote uh, of the session. Um, and uh, please note, uh, if you have any questions, please post them in chat and we will address them during the, uh, during the panel at the end. Um, but lastly, uh, and not leastly, I'd like to welcome uh, Shamim Namadi uh, from UC San Diego. Uh, Dr. Namadi is the Director of Predictive Health Analytics and Assistant Professor of Biomedical Informatics at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Namadi obtained his PhD degree in electrical engineering and computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2013. While at MIT, he was a member of the Laboratory of Computational Physiology and the Laboratory for Computational Physiology and Clinical Inference, and a research fellow at the Brigham Women's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School, where he held a National Research Service Award. Upon completion of his PhD degree, Dr. Damati joined the Harvard Intelligent Probabilistic Systems Group and as a James S. McDonald Foundation postdoctoral fellow in complex systems. His postdoctoral work was focused on development of deep learning algorithms for pattern discovery in, mass in massive longitudinal biomedical data sets. He was a recipient of a Mentored Career Development Award, a KO1 in Biomedical data, Big Data Science uh, through the NIH Big Data to Knowledge Initiative from 2016 to 2020. And uh, the lead PI on a multi-center BARDA funded study, Dr. Namadi was involved in retrospective validation, prospective implementation, and FDA clearance of a sepsis prediction algorithm that was developed as part of his KO1 award. Namadi Lab's focus on critical care machine learning is supported via multiple awards from the NIH. So Dr. Namadi, uh, are you able to share your screen? Yes. One second here. All right. There we go, and I can see it well. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm Shamim Namati. When I received the email from Professor Ding to give a talk uh, at this workshop, I responded saying that I'm not an uh, expert in uh, AI you know, explanations, but I will sh share my uh, uh, experience interacting with clinicians over the past 10 years. Um, so um, most of my work uh, has been focused in, in critical care. In particular, um, uh, I've been focusing on early recognition of sepsis in hospitalized patients. So, um, Moving forward, um, uh, in 2018, we published a paper, ironically, it has a title of Interpretable Machine Learning. Uh, in, um, and we, we, we said that um, uh, using data from electronic health record, as well as um, higher resolution data from bedside monitors, we can predict sepsis early <clears throat> in, in hospitalized patients. I think one area that uh, attracted attention was this notion that not only we can predict um, uh, sepsis early, but at every point in time, we can also tell the clinician what are the top factors contributing to the risk. And this model was actually a very simple model. It was a, a Cox regression model. Uh, as you know, you know, it's a linear type of model. And all we did was to calculate the relevance scores of a, uh, of a linear model and rank the importance of different factors. Uh, over the past uh, four or five years, we have been working on implementing these type of models in, in clinical setting. So just to give you a bit of background, um, as you know, most model, uh, modern EHR systems, uh, now they have a, this layer of interoperability built on the top, which is called FHIR FHIR. So uh, our, our current system essentially talks to electronic health record uh, on an hourly basis, pulls the data that we need for, for predictions, it uh, performs some feature cur curations and then makes a prediction and then pushes the data back into electronic health record uh, for clinicians to view. We have also been building um, user interfaces for clinicians so that they can look at the risk scores. Yeah, here is the example of a user interface that we built a few years back while I was at the Emory University that you know sorts uh, the, the sort of in the patient list according to the risk for sepsis. And then uh, we added these features that if you click on one of these panels, it flips over and it is showing the top factors and why the algorithm thinks that this patient is becoming septic. In this case, you see things like temperature, heart rate, you know, platelet count. So more recently, um, we, we published a paper in Nature Digital Medicine 
showing uh, ways to make these type of models more generalizable. This particular uh, paper was uh, based on data from half a million patients across two different uh, institutions, uh, uh, two, uh, two different care settings in the ED and the ICU. And we, we you know, initially really struggled with notion of generalizability in this multi-institutional setting. But uh, we, when we started thinking about what are the reasons for lack of um, generalizability, we realized that it's really multifactorial. A uh, big part of that had to do with data harmonization af across different institutions. Uh, once you resolve that issue, you still have things like data distribution shifts and drifts. And so we propose this notion of conformal prediction where uh, every time you make a prediction, uh, you uh, compare the representations that you, you get from your encoders here against a bag of examples that you uh, accumulate during the training uh, period to, to say that, have I seen a patient like this in the past? And if the answer is yes, then you make a prediction. Otherwise, um, you withhold from uh, making prediction and you say, I don't know. So, um, you know, when I talk about interpretability as well as sort of uncertainty estimation is the context of this type of models that have multiple layers. We also have like conformal prediction going on and uh, we have shown in general good generalizability with this type of models. <clears throat> so moving forward, um, about a year ago, we managed to get this uh, particular algorithm that was deployed, that uh, was published at Nature Digital Medicine at UC San Diego in 12 our hospitals. So while uh, we have been working on uh, implementing uh, best practice advisories within our EPIC EHR so that we can conduct a, a proper prospective uh, clinical study, we, we built this very simple Tableau user interface and we have been sitting with our clinicians on a weekly basis, going to patient cases in a, in a sort of live setting and asking them about their opinions. Uh, whether when the machine says, you know, this patient is likely to develop sepsis, how likely is that this patient actually has sepsis, not other conditions. Also looking at some of the contextual information, you know, some of these uh, notions of relevance scores and interpretability and, you know, see if they find um, this type of information useful. So Dr. Wardy is actually, he's the chair of our sepsis committee and he wears a couple of different hats. He's, a, he's dual cert certified in emergency and critical care, but also he's the chair of our sepsis committee. And I'm mentioning that is because we often think about clinicians as somewhat similar, but depending on what role they have within the hospital, they actually care about vastly different things. Uh, while you know, a clinician at the bedside mostly cares about uh, their, their, the patient that is in front of them, once they have more administrative position within the hospital, you are having a more global view and, and their notion of you know, what is useful, uh, et cetera, it, you know, it changes considerably. And I, I will get into that in a bit. But as we conducted some of these uh, structured interviews with our clinicians, in this case, Dr. Wardy with, uh, with his uh, one-year-old uh, daughter, he says that it's never uh, too early to start AI education, and that's why you know, he has a daughter here. So as, as we conducted some of these structured interviews, um, we, we realized that there is really fundamental differences be between the way that computer scientists, AI practitioners, they think about uh, healthcare data versus the way clinicians they think. You know, in our case, with many of these AI algorithms, we are looking at correlations and the relationship between those with, with outcomes. We, we, we look at average accuracy. We look at model, model parsimony. Uh, we looked at this notion of generalizability versus clinicians, they are very much focused on, you know, mechanistic, causal. They care about rare cases because often in the clinic, they are dealing with certain patients in front of them. And then there is this notion of availability bias. Those rare cases really sticks. And they, they keep talking about those. In fact, they have ground rounds in which they go over those rare, rare cases and present it to, to, as a part of the medical education. And then they also really care about completeness of explanations. Uh, this turns out to be very, very important uh, and is in somewhat in contrast to this notion of model parsimony. 
because even when when we talk to you know electronic health record we get the data we might have a thousands of different variables available but at the end of the day we focus on a number of them that has high you know gives us high average accuracy versus when it comes to explanations often some of those variables that may not add so much to the average accuracy are important for clinicians so that they understand the context of the patient okay so with that, I'd like to step back for a second and say, you know, how did we get to this point, to, to, to a point that we have now black box models and this sort of ad hoc, you know, post hoc uh, explanation method, methods that, that we are using. So it turns out that classic medical training emphasizes really mechanistic understanding. Anybody who has uh, sat down in, um, you know, medical education class, they, they know that there is a lot of studies of sort of physiology involved, even though in practice, in the clinic, they may not um, think that way, but during the medical education, clinicians, they get a lot of exposure to just basics of physiology. Here is an example of experiment that uh, we worked on back in 2011. This is data from uh, animal that uh, what you see here are the breathing patterns of, of the animal. So during the initial phase, the animal was breathing. And then at one point in time, they introduced what is called hyperventilation. They make the animal using the CPAP machine to, to breathe at a very high rate. And then at, at one point in time, they stop and they observe what happens to the breathing pattern of this animal. In the case of the control case, after a little cycling, the breathing pattern back goes back to normal. Whereas in the case of a drug, which is called Dompredon, the animal's breathing pattern starts cycling. You may ask, you know, uh, you know, can you explain this? You know, can you predict the cycle duration? Can you say for how long you're going to cycle? And, you know, going back into, again, uh, you know, respiratory 101, uh, uh, you know, those physicians and clinicians, they, they often have, are very, very hands-on doing experimentations with them, this type of animals, doing uh, detailed studies, they map out the various components of the human physiology, you know, the lungs, gas exchange happens here, you have um, chemoreceptors, you have in the medulla, you have the respiratory pattern generators, and based on the knowledge of physiology, what they do is they, they, they have been doing so, sort of what is called the um, experimental um, uh, reductionist uh, experiments. Uh, as an example of that, when I started working with uh, physiologists, I came across this notion of isoxic hypercapnic response, which was essentially the idea that when you're looking at somebody's response to uh, ventilatory response, uh, and you want to know how that changes as a function of amount of carbon dioxide in their arterial blood, the clinicians, because they were thinking in two dimensional, they had to keep the oxygen level always constant. So you end up with uh, figures like this where on one axis you have ventilation, on another axis you have PaCO2, and really since they can't really think in three dimensions, so they had to keep the oxygen level constant. And then once they do that, then they look at the effect of, let's say, drugs, uh, wakefulness, pain, emotional factors, et cetera. I'm mentioning this because, you know, a lot of what is happening in basic physiology is based on very simple experiments where you keep everything constant and you're changing one or two variables at a time. And clinicians, they are used to this type of training. So when we talk about mechanistic models, many of those models were, were constructed in the context of this type of experimentations. So when in 2011, we started looking at this type of models, we said, well, this is nothing more than a feedback loop. You can think about the lungs as a place where there's a gas exchange in the language of control theory. This is just a plant. And then you have these chemoreceptors that sense the concentration of carbon dioxide, oxygen in your arterial, arterial blood. That's just your controller. And then it takes some time for the blood to get into the uh, sensors. So there's a circular delay. So this is your classic feedback loop system with delays and oscillations emerge in this type of feedback loop systems. So we, we performed some um, you know, machine learning to do system identification and we were able to use uh, the description of the system to make predictions. So this is your example of a mechanistic model that is inspired by physiology. We even took it to the next step and we said, well, this type of feedback loop systems, they are nothing more than just a, a state of space models. In fact, any type of uh, you know, feedback loop system can be described in the language of you know, Bayesian networks. 
And as you know, Bayesian networks, um, the way you learn them is sort of un unsupervised, but we said you can even take them to the next step and you can make them supervised by unrolling these Bayesian networks in time, you end up actually with a neural network. And you can, you can actually put a classification layer on top of that and then use these marginals, which tell you, you know, what are the dynamics that the uh, patient is exhibiting to make predictions. So, you know, this was really, uh, for me at the time, was the best way of incorporating knowledge of physiology into this, this type of models. Uh, but it turns out that many of those reductionist, uh, you know, models of physiology, they, were, they are not really that accurate when you look into uh, complex patients in a critical care settings. Moreover, uh, there are often many types of variable involved in a real world data. You have categorical data, you have irregularly a space under sample type of data and sort of our cl classical tools for building these type of models, they can't really handle those. In particular, when the data is severely under sampled, so you, you are not able to capture the actual dynamic of the system. So with that, we ended up with sort of this black box type of models with, with shafts that they have predictive abilities that often surpass our physiological models. And you know, in order to get some explanations, we went to start looking at relevance scores, Shapley values, et cetera. But I always, you know, when I look at these models in the context of time series, in the context of physiology, I scratch my head and I say, you know, how does it even make sense? Because, you know, most of these models, they make an assumption that you can tweak one of the fe input features independently of the other features. In fact, the classic SHAP, you know, makes this assumption about independence of the input features. There are, uh, you know, variations of SHAP that looks at uh, correlation between the input features, but it turns out actually because of the undersampling that happens, you know, most of this physiology that I'm describing happens at the, as, at the level of seconds to minutes, but most of the EHR data is at the level of several minutes to, to hours. And because of the undersampling, we can't even properly uh, construct the underlying correlation among the input features. So you end up with generating samples for sharp calculations that are really not realistic because you don't quite understand the input feature correlations. Having said that, you know, they are cute and they make for great uh, publications and that's why we have been you know, holding on to, to these type of models. So I wanted to briefly talk about uh, you know, a few key issues that I think they remain somewhat um, not, not quite discussed. The first one is this no notion of explanation at a conceptual level. Uh, there's a very nice paper by uh, Vimla Patel and coworkers that they basically say medical knowledge is um, organized in a hierarchy. Our, at the very low level, we have these basic observations. Then we have findings, then we have clinical constructs and diagnostic hypotheses. Most of, uh, at least in my world, most of our models, they operate at the level of basic concepts. Uh, things like heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, lactate, you know, creatinine. And so when we provide explanation to clinicians, you also provide it at this level. Whereas clinicians in their thinking, they often, they, they are used to higher level type of explanation. So I think that's one area that re requires uh, some work. The next problem uh, that we encountered quite a lot in our chart reviews with clinicians is notion of broken leg problem, where, you know, you can predict that Tom can, uh, you know, which days of week, week time uh, Tom goes and watches a movie, but you just don't know that Tom has a broken leg. Similarly, when we make our predictions, we know everything about the patient's ab abnormal heart rate, white blood count, et cetera, but we just don't know that this was a bone marrow transplant patient. And you know, in that case, because of the transplant, it turns out their white blood counts are all over the place and that, that's why the algorithm picks up on those patients. So understanding that is super important. Then there's this notion of uh, you know, mechanism versus actionability. Um, there was a very nice paper just came out uh, in 2020 in critical care explorations from the Mayo Clinic folks. They described a directed aseptic graph that describes sort of the pathophysiology uh, dur during sepsis. And so we ran an experiment with our clinicians. We said, you know, if you are putting somebody on mechanical ventilation and you have the choice of three drugs and you have a model like this, that tells you, allows you to do simulation of drug effects. Let's say with propofol, systemic uh, vascular resistance goes down, cardiac output goes down, and you know, this patient is at risk for hypotension. And this particular model might have accuracy of 78%, versus you have a black box type of model that 
plugs in your three drugs and tells you exactly which drug is likely to benefit this patient. And it, this one has an accuracy of 90%, which one would you go with? And the clinicians, they say, well, we actually know the physiology, but it's really complicated and it's really hard for us to make the prediction. So if you have a very, very accurate model, we prefer to go with that. And this is an example where maybe these type of models are not that useful in practice. The next topic is really context matters, depending on whether you're in the emergency department, intensive care, or telemedicine. Uh, there are different levels of explanation are, are necessary. In the emergency department, clinicians actually, they don't really care much about uh, explanations. In intensive care unit, where they are stabilizing and treating patients, and patients are there for a much longer period of time, they do care about this stuff. Versus in a tele-ICU setting, you know, they're just providing a second pair of eyes and calling the bedside nurse to check on a patient. Again, you know, they may or may not care about explanations. And then, you know, this type of explanation, it ha they have to be understood in the context of the whole healthcare ecosystem. Because, you know, an algorithm never operates in isolation. There is always these policy layers that are sitting on top of the algorithms. I, I provide you with simple ex uh, example here. Uh, this is a case of predicting need for mechanical ventilation in the patient. And it turns out that depending on whether the septic patients with mechanical ventilation, it stays on mechanical ventilation for larger than 96 hours or less than 96 hours, the payments are so different. So if you have a model and you are you know, saying that this patient needs to get off of mechanical ventilation before that 96 hours, you might actually cause significant damages to your hospital's you know, baseline. Again, this is just a very hypothetical situation, but understanding all the incentives really, really does matter when you're building these type of models. And then finally, uh, we often talk about personalization. You know, doctors, they love to think about patients. I actually challenge that notion. Many times what we need in healthcare are not sort of personalized treatments. They are very well-defined evidence-based protocols. In fact, there was this paper by Atul Gwande that looked, you know, uh, talked about the cheesecake factory. The idea that restaurants and chains they have managed to combine quality control, you know, cost control and innovation through a standardization. And so maybe just if we have the right protocols in place that tell clinicians to do ABC, that's really what is needed. In fact, uh, as you talk to clinicians versus C-suite people. You see that the clinicians, they do care about autonomy by CC uh, peoples who pay for AI tools. They often care about protocols and standardization. And in fact, if you can standardize things, maybe you can actually reduce legal liability and improve adoption of these type of tools. So, so with that, um, I think I, I like to uh, advocate for going beyond just AI systems in isolation, think about AI system in the context of an entire healthcare system with the implementation log logic and protocol, everything built on the top of that. And then uh, looking at some of these other topics that I, I mentioned. And with that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the um, organizers for, for organizing this uh, workshop and for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Namadi. And so that, uh, that does it for all of our keynote speakers. And so now I'd like to invite uh, all the speakers uh, who are still with us uh, to uh, turn on your videos uh, so that uh, we can all have uh, visibility of you. And, and um, then I, if anyone has any questions, uh, I didn't see any accumulate in the chat throughout the, throughout the keynotes. Um, so I do have, uh, some prepared as well, but if anyone has any questions, uh, you can also uh, hit the reaction button uh, to raise your hand, and and we can also uh, call out on you to um, uh, to ask the question. So let me see here. Uh, I think we uh, we did lose uh, Pranav and Adriel, uh, but uh, let's see here. We do have Doctors Madi, Verghese, Gao, Chakraborty. And Glicksburg. Okay, and uh, to start us off too, this is something that we did yesterday. Uh, for those who uh, who weren't here for your talks, if uh, if we could uh, go around to each of you and just give like a two sentence uh, summary of of uh, your area of work, um, and and then we'll get into the questions. Uh, so. 
Um, Dr. Namadi, uh, just having presented, uh, I don't think that there's uh, a need for you to, uh, uh, to summarize, but I'll, I'll go over to Dr. Verghese. Uh, yeah, my, my talk was really about the downstream uh, uh, context for any deployment in a commercial way uh, for these types of algorithms. Awesome, and Dr. Gao? Right. Um, my, my talk is about uh, geometric interpretation of um, some deep learning models and with application of label um, um, efficient uh, algorithms. Okay, and Dr. Shakraberti? Yeah, my talk was mainly about uh, user-centric explainability, very similar to what we just heard from Dr. Namadi and on ideas of personas and how we can use that for uh, user-driven explanations. Great, and Dr. Glicksberg. Hey, Justin, thanks so much for uh, for hosting this. Uh, great to see uh, everyone. Uh, my my um, work is on uh, basically coupling multiple modalities of uh, real world uh, health data um, and fusing them to get some kind of explainable uh, insights for uh, quicker and, and, and faster uh, screening and diagnostic. Awesome. And um, so we, we don't have Dr. Mahmoud uh, as well as uh, Dr. Wong. Um, and so I'll, I'll jump into questions, uh, not seeing uh, anyone with a hand raised or uh, or anything in the chat. Uh, I thought this was a, a fabulous, uh, diverse group of speakers uh, coming from uh, academia and industry, as well as uh, working with different methods in AI and, and explainability uh, methods. Um, as well as uh, multiple different areas of application. So that uh, today's uh, uh, today's whole focus was on like um, you know different applications of explainability in AI. Um, and so we've got uh, clinical, ICU, imaging, pathology, uh, genomics, and also uh, use of AI and prognostication. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, get your perspectives. Um, on what are, what are the risks and the benefits of explainable AI applied in your specific areas? I, I can briefly uh, talk about some of our experience with, with our clinicians. Um, so, you know, often in our, in our sessions where we have been going you know, through, through patient cases, they, they do ask about, okay, what are the top reasons the algorithm thinks this patient is, is becoming septic? So these type of things are, are, are useful and uh, it provides a bit of context, but I can tell you that probably only 10% um, of the discussion was around that. It's, it's mostly about you know, what, what are the other contextual information? What, you know, what was the history of this patient? Where did the patient come from? Uh, you know, did the patient have surgery? Was a transplant patient? A lot of factors that we don't typically actually, um, you know, incorporate into our models for various reasons. Some of the reasons, as I mentioned, had to do with parsimony of the models. Some of the uh, reasons actually had to do with very sort of practical notions of, um, you know, you want to use fire to get data in real time, and sometimes not everything is available through through a fire fire protocol. Um, so I, you know. I think our clinicians, they wanted to understand uh, uh, the, the context. They wanted to know uh, what the performance of the algorithm uh, was, and they wanted to know when the algorithm uh, fails. They wanted to have a notion of uncertainty of the algorithm so that, you know, if needed in those cases, they can, they can look into the, the charts and do a uh, you know, deeper, deeper dive. Yeah, I'll just uh, add to that. I think that was a very, very thorough response. Uh, I just want to echo on that uh, this idea of uncertainty as as a as a metric to be to be provided with the model uh, has always, at least in my limited experience, been met with enthusiasm. Uh, in, in some ways, uh, may, maybe even uh, relief in in having something else to go on except a uh, Accept the score. So I, I 
I, I definitely um, uh, view that you know in in audits or, or what have you or implementation that it, that it would be a, a very good thing to um, include a, a, as as part of the uh, development and, and implementation process. Yeah, just want to add to that. I mean, great responses and feel so much close to one of the things, you know, challenging things we have actually found is to also how to present these uh, information like uncertainty and, you know, also this contextual explanations to our end users uh, who are clinicians and doctors. And it's, it's partly computer science problem. It's partly also like a UI problem at the layers of complexity that needs to be presented. And one thing we have learned is to not push the clinicians too far from their clinical workflow. So an understanding of their workflow was also very important. I, I just wanted to brief, briefly add to that, that again, uh, when you are pragmatic about this stuff, you know, in a real world, you have to deal with, you know, epic and cerners of the world, at least in, in, you know, in my world. And, you know, you can, you can have really fantastic user interfaces, but you're stuck with what they have in their systems with their BPAs, et cetera. So um, there, there's like so much that we focus on on the academic side, but in a real world, you know, our hands are often tight and we just have to go with what is available. I, I, I would like to, go ahead. Yeah, I would like to add a few more points, I think from um, academic point of view, um, uh, the interpretability of machine learning is very interesting because we, we have the curiosity to know why deep learning models work so well, not just in healthcare, um, but it's a fundamental machine learning problem. Uh, so regarding the healthcare application, we can't wait until we fully understand why deep learning works so well uh, for the deployment. So I think we have to go forward with rigorous evaluation, as we have mentioned in some of the talks, probably to randomize the clinical trial. And also we need to pay attention to the risks of the uh, deep learning models, for example, um, as some of you has mentioned, the context of the patients, the history of the patients, not just imaging, not just uh, one uh, uh, like clinical result. And also how about the clinician AI collaboration? How can we provide the result back to clinician or to the end user, to the patient. Um, so how can we communicate this knowledge uh, to different levels So, end users? So clinicians, they may have the domain knowledge, they can understand uh, their clinical flow, but how can we communicate this result to patient? That's another question. Um, and also how can we ensure the fairness? Um, I think it, it's probably not really necessary to have interpretability to ensure the fairness. Um, um, there are many other ways to uh, boost the trust of um, of the end users, the clinicians and the patients. Um, but I think interpretability is probably one of the, the component to achieve that. Yeah. That, 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 that's a wonderful point. And, and just to um, uh, add some, some more support for it, I, I always am reminded of the, of the field of um, uh, genetics uh, return of results um, involving trained uh, genetic counselors uh, to be the responsible ones of uh, delivering um, of information uh, back to the patient. So I think uh, you hit the nail on the head that, you know, this can't be done irresponsibly. And there's uh, a lot of work that, that needs to be, uh, uh, studies that need to be designed to really almost like a human-centered uh, design approach. Yeah, that, uh, that's something that uh, both uh, Dr. Chakraborty and Namadi, uh, as well as others have commented on is knowing your audience and, and knowing the consumers of, uh, of the AI models uh, or the explanations. Um, and so that, that's a great example, uh, Dr. Glicksberg, on, um, on what you would include in the, in the loop and the workflow of delivering this. And it, uh, I wonder uh, in the era of you know um, open notes where where more and more information is available to patients, uh, how uh, without having uh, or before a clinician is able to get in the loop, uh, 
what are we doing to um, to consider uh, all the end users or all the end consumers of of these models or or of the data? And I want to uh, you know some add something to it. It's you know I like so much like you know have this passion for how do we actually you know provide this for the patients, right? And I want to add two more question points to that topic that you just preached. So we see this more and more FDA approved uh, health, uh, like, you know, wearable devices. So for recently, one of the wearables got FDA approval for AFib detection. So how do the patients kind of self kind of regulate that? Like do like what, what do, what kind of performance guarantees or things the patient needs to uh, use it? It's, it's probably not just enough to say that don't use it as your, uh, you know, not a, it doesn't take it as a medical advice. I mean, we are still providing some uh, insights from it, right? And somewhat more recently, you know, we, with this new stage of COVID, we are seeing so much of rapid tests and, you know, there are performance guarantees and so on, which, you know, if you are on the top of the field, you have more knowledge, but, you know, for a common person, how do you kind of self-regulate your things? So I think uh, just no, no answers there, just some more talking points, I guess. Dr. Ding, you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, uh, I think I think today we have a great talk and combined with yesterday, together there are different things about explainability. So yeah, uh, we are in computer science. Uh, we are constantly developing more and more complicated uh, data model, deep learning model, plus explainability uh, model to try to explain things. But those complicated data model and complicated uh, explainability model has some issues to apply to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, med to medicine. Even we use very simple model, like what Wang said, what Fei says, it's just very simple tree. It's just only three layer decision tree. Even this, we have a semantic, uh, dramatic problem on different hospitals to explain different things because some works, some doesn't work. So, and I think it's like, we are facing like yes or no in this uh, field, um, uh, like uh, Dr. Sham, uh, Dr. Uh, Nimati said, uh, there are, you know, what, what, what people really care as a physician or, 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 or the manager of the hospital, uh, they care. And sometimes they care explanation, sometimes they don't care, depends on the situation. And also for hospital manager, they care about the protocol. So what I learned today, uh, as this is exactly the same thing, like uh, maybe many, many years ago, uh, people facing uh, with a new drug. Like uh, if we don't have FDA clinical trial, yeah? People think this the same thing. We have the new drug, when should we use it? How we should we use this? Uh, how do you explain this? And do we really understand? We don't understand. So should we use this or we don't use this? In the end, we use some drugs we even don't understand them, right? We treat some disease, we don't understand their, uh, their mechanic. So I was thinking about this experimental era it has to go somewhere in the healthcare industry, uh, right? Maybe. Like a, a clinical trial, I really like the uh, random uh, trial, uh, uh, random um, control trial, this idea. Uh, will this idea of, because even clinical trial is actually goes uh, to use digital twins. So we will no longer test on the real patient, actually test on certain digital uh, version of the patient to do the clinical trial to speed up. I was thinking about, is there any way I ask the panelists, anyway, think about the, the uh, random uh, clinical trial on this explainable AI, but I mean random clinical trial is not on patient because everything on patient is so expensive and it's hard to even meet the eligible criteria is take forever because when drug take like $2 billion and 10 to 15 years to, to develop and the 97 failure rate, we don't want this to happen to explain the AI model, 2 billion money and doing so on. So I was thinking about, can we using existing data we already have, have millions of trillions of EHR data and sensor data, everything over there. Can we use data-driven uh, clinical trial, like random control trial, to actually run ex explainability? Some of the uh, presentation actually show a little bit here and there talking about, hey, we can using existing uh, data set that divide them based, based on age difference, gender difference, racial difference, or preclinical condition difference. And then we run several kind of different algorithms when can linear, uh, you know, uh, back propagation, linear back propagation, and uh, line all these uh, fancy algorithms. And they, we, we see, we compare, like even we use IOU or we use heat 
uh, different measures, can we actually have those things that to say, oh, in this case, for this patient at this, you know, 12 to uh, 36 years old, on um, this patient with this condition, with this situation, maybe this kind of uh, method work well than others. So do, I just want to think, uh, is that possible uh, for, for this kind of testing in, in reality? Looks like uh, Paul has his hand raised. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just uh, to follow on uh, to the themes that several people have brought up. Uh, one, uh, early on, we, the, the theme of interoperability was uh, flagged as uh, important for generalizability. I think it ties also into what people have talked about, supplying that contextual information. Um, you can't ask people to sort of ignore the information systems they have in front of them, the discerners, the ethics. But with more standards like Smart on Fire, that gives options to sort of present your signal, the signal from the output from the algorithm with the contextual information. So there is a, a, a path to sort of doing the, the right thing by the person by um, embedding this all into the workflow. The second thing is that uh, I think the device, uh, hardware device analogy is a good one or a good predicate. Um, it is a model for uh, how do you surface a signal that can be used um, both by a clinician and a patient? But the model I had immediately in my head was a CGM. Uh, we've sort of grown used to the fact that people can get access to CGMs, and it really represents a, a, a dual-facing signal that can be consumed uh, by a clinician and by a patient. But the really critical thing that we all have to ask ourselves is, what are the decisions that we expect people to do with this? It's a lot more clear on the clinical side to sort of map out what kind of clinical decisions would we expect uh, a learned intermediary, somebody with training to do. But I think the, the area that also requires some discipline and rigor is what would we want or expect a patient with less uh, sort of fund of knowledge or experience, where are the reasonable set of decisions that have to happen there? And that really will help um, sort of set the parameters of what other information um, and what we, the, the level of performance that we would want from that signal. I do have a, a general question for all of you. Uh, uh, Paul posed in, uh, in his talk about uh, you know, uh, training clinicians uh, on on using AI and even on the on uh, the fundamentals of epidemiology and biostatistics and uh, how can we best equip healthcare uh, to manage and and interface with these AI models uh, and then explanations that that come from them and uh, and do we need new levels of prerequisites for medical school or, uh, or some re requirements for, uh, for additional training uh, in this area. Uh, I envision like a continuing maintenance of certification in, in AI interpretation or, uh, or even in basic statistical and, and epidemiological uh, methods. What do you all think? Uh, so I'm going to be a little unfair to, to you, Justin and, and Yang, um, because I, I look at what you both are doing and where you both sit, and I'd love to hear your thoughts or get your sort of insights on, on how your, what avenues do you have? Um, you, you both represent sort of the, the complete package of, of knowledge of the quantitative side of things, as well as the clinical side of things. Um, do you have any insights or things that you're currently investigating um, in your, your educational um, responsibilities sort of bring that sort of one baseline uh, fund of knowledge, but then also to sort of think about what happens um, over time with more advanced training? Paul, you're talking, should I answer the question? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was going to turn it over to both of you. Yeah. 
I mean, I can yeah, I can I, share. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Justin. Oh well, uh, you know, it's it's interesting at the at our medical school, uh, they've compressed the um, the preclinical uh, years into. Uh, uh, so what's what's normally two years into a, a year in a summer, and so uh, it's a for to do that they had to cut out uh, you know what had traditionally been part of uh, part of preclinical training, and so you know we joke about the uh, who really needs to know the Krebs cycle, uh, but um, uh, mm. with that though there's there's just less time uh, if you're uh, if you're thinking about uh, adding in uh, some additional training, if it's in uh, if it's in evidence-based care or uh, biostatistics, uh, and then getting into uh, AI and machine learning, um, and and so there there are some elective courses uh, uh, in biomedical informatics at our medical school, and uh, where we can at least introduce the the medical students to uh, to what's available there. That uh, they also have a, a training EHR that uh, that was developed for the medical students uh, to learn about how, how to even find data in the in the EHR and um, and so I, I could see uh, that at least being a, a platform on which you could start to introduce. Well, how how do you then engage with with a decision support tool or uh, or an AI model that uh, that's giving you a predictive score on a patient. Um, in the in the clinical setting, uh, where I, I do clinical training uh, in the on the hospital wards, uh, it, it, it's kind of a um, you know if you happen to be on my service, then then we get to talk about uh, all the additional components of well what you know what goes into that uh, that risk score that you're seeing in the EHR. Uh, but there, I'm not seeing a, um, a standardized approach, uh, at least locally, uh, towards um, towards integrating uh, this type of training in the uh, in the residency level uh, uh, clinical training. Although uh, we do see uh, rapid growth of of clinical informatics fellowships, I think there's still not not very many people are are going into those. Mm -hmm. yeah, I see it. Ben. Ben, you want to chime me? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, I mean, I, I realize I'm, I'm, you know, as not not a clin not a clinician, I realize I'm purely speaking through observation. But um, uh, I just like to echo. Funny that right at the end, Justin, you mentioned the clinical informatics fellowships because I was going to uh, mention that as probably the the probably initial avenue that I see is you kind of have specialists, if you will. Um, who are kind of what I envision as like the 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 first uh, you know the first explorers, um, uh, but I but I also do want to um, say that you know at, at Mount Sinai we actually are um, uh, which I'm involved in is a um, seminar series for residents that is simply just how to read a paper that includes machine learning. It's not meant to really teach anything beyond very basic theory and like how to spot egregious uh, uh, red flags. Um, and I could see, you know, that being a, a another kind of slow uh, immersion uh, uh, into the into the world and, and, you know, not not too overwhelming. And that that coupled with more governance boards and more interest panels, I, uh, I think that it's going to be a slow burn uh, from, from my outside point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think what I just, what I agree with uh, Justin and Ben said, it's like the biology in 1980s. So biologists doesn't, you know, biologists understand statistics, but not much on computer science. But you see now we have a computational biologist. They are way on in demand than pure biologists. So same thing in, in medicine. Medicine happened always like 20 years behind everything, I tell you. So now you will see MD and HD, uh, MD PhD in computer science or MD uh, computational Clinician in the very in the near future will be there. Be, you know they, they are they, they have to read some some like if you're doing robotic surgery you you have to yeah of course it's like a driving car 
uh, you don't need to really assemble the engine to drive a car. You, as long as you can drive the car. The machine learning is the same thing. We have a core machine learning area, like a Dr. Doss paper. It's a really mathematic. It's like a, you build the engine. Like our group, we cannot build the engine, but we can apply the engine to, to assemble a different car and drive. So there will be more and more this package, like Python package, so easy to, to explore. And uh, in the near future, there will be some training, definitely. And I think that five to, uh, back to seven years ago, NSF organized a workshop talk about uh, rethinking of uh, about, uh, computational, even uh, biology uh, training in master degree. So basically they propose, they should add one year of data science into the master degree. So basically they need to take three years, uh, get a master degree in biology, basically including data science. And, and the panel actually fully agree. And this will happen very soon in, in, in clinical. This already happened in, uh, in biology, in chemistry and, and others. I want to also po pose the, the other side of this, which is how can we get you know, computer scientists to you know, get more medical education? Uh, I, I feel like you know everybody is focused on AI, but there is a huge gap on the implementation side. This is the logic of implementation. What in the epic language they call it best practice advisories, and there is a huge gap there because our AI people they, they are not familiar with implementation science, clinicians are not familiar with with AI, and so that that part remained uh, completely un untouched. Yeah, I agree. I agree with this is precisely the effort of this workshop. So this workshop is the pure core computer science community and we bring the healthcare there. And we have several speakers yesterday and they're all from Howard Computer Science and Medical School. So they are, some of them actually by training is PhD in computer science. They are learning medicine and work very well in drug discovery and the clinical and explanation. So these two words are meeting. You know, so for instance, we'll work, organize the web conference next year in 2023 in Austin. We'll have the health day. The health day will definitely, you know, bring all this community here, computer science and healthcare, really talk about all these fancy, nice, interesting things. So you will see more and more effort. Also, in, uh, in like in medical domain, you have some workshop organized by computer scientists. In computer science domain, you have some people organize workshop related to health. But I, I fully agree that the education should be on the both sides. Now the training clinician using AI also in computer science will have health, for instance, my school has health informatics. In computer science, they have some people also work on the health. But yes. Oh, I'll just add one other thing that, that we see uh, on both sides when people come into industry is uh, uh, having to get them up to speed on sort of the regulatory implications. And I, I know that there's a, a lot of uh, attention paid to the role of explainable AI when it comes to satisfying regulatory uh, policy um, uh, edicts. Um, but when it comes to actually building, uh, it's really helpful for people to understand like what are the consequences of building a regulated software um, uh, tool um, and also to understand what are the sort of downstream consequences that. There's often a, a view that since software doesn't actually touch a patient, it's harder to envision adverse outcomes. But I think all of you who have been working in clinical institutions can almost instinctively see the, the, the linear narrative there that can happen. But I, I would sort of say as when we think about educating both clinicians and um, computer scientists, data scientists, uh, one other component is uh, where everyone will benefit is for people understanding uh, a little bit more about the regulated space. I think that, that's a very good point. And um, I think um, in academia, we are not very used to thinking about, you know, quality management systems and, you know, uh, how, how to build a, a clinical grade software that uh, you know, meet certain expectations in terms of performance, et cetera. But I wanted to also um, push back a little bit and say that I think, at least from my point of view, the community of computer scientists working in this domain, they are just so critical of themselves. I think the reality is, if you look at what is happening in the clinic, there are 250,000 Americans every year dying because of medical errors. 
just think about that. We, we think about, you know, hospitals as, you know, and physicians at, 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 you know, these people who are, you know, highly, highly trained and they are, they never make mistakes, but that's not the case. So just having AI as a second pair of eyes uh, so that you can minimize some of those mistakes, I think is just super, super important. Um, just give you a quick, very quick example. The other way we were looking at patient charts, our system came up and said, oh, you know, we think that this patient needs to be on antibiotics. The clinician said, but this patient is on antibiotics. Here's a patient chart. And then he realized, oops, it was all copy, copy and paste from the previous uh, clinical notes. So, you know, if you have the AI system in place that, you know, can, can provide a second pair of eyes, I think we can reduce some of that errors. I mean, that, that by itself is, it can save a lot of lives. Yeah, I fully agree. So for radiologists, the 30% of them make a, uh, make a mistake. So 30% of uh, male practice uh, lawsuit uh, in, in, in healthcare is actually from radiologists. So because of course, they can only read 50, 50 to 100 slides every day. So we have only like 300,000 radiologists. So we have like a six billion image you need to read. And especially in FC, uh, uh, ICU, the, it's time really demanding. So if machine can do the first screen and actually share something, they can actually speed up their process. There's a paper just published this year at uh, JAMA and talk about compare uh, the, the, the check uh, with the uh, with the AI support and the, the, uh, the doctor together, they actually can improve their accuracy rather than just based them purely on the doctor uh, uh, himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I just want to also add to that, uh, really like this aspect of you know also educating the computer scientist something that i have also personally found is not all data is recorded in the for the same purpose so also understanding the data is very important like you know if you look at a claims data even the codes that are given that i have a very different incentive than you know maybe what's in the notes and that's something a computer scientist also really wants to like need to know like even if you know it needs to be a second pair of eyes like some I mean, it is in statistical, uh, you know, parlance, like some are systematic noise and some are random noises. And so it's very in important to actually know the system to identify those two things. Yeah, I, I really like the second eye idea, but I think the second eye idea, how do you implement the people adoption is really a design problem. It's not a technical problem. It's not, it's a design and trust. So like as, uh, as, as Samin said, oh, design, you know, all this epic system is horrible no matter their interface is horrible, but, but you know, the wearable device, everything is through the web, through the web application is actually uh, on the design side, how you adopt the social determinant. This is one thing. Second, even on the epic side, and this kind of design, it looks ugly and uh, more like, so how we can use even ugly design to really sneak into our, you know, AI support, actually can the doctor trust? I think that's the design innovation. My school, it's actually on the design. So we train the student doing all this user inter inter interview, but all their design are fancy, like, oh, so cool. It's like picture, color, blah. Never people think about how I can actually design in the trustable way, actually adopt to the existing system. But I think that's a great I direction to go. And also the another other problem, the Epic is like commercial controlled. It's very hard to add in to new things. That's a, like the VA system, the VA system, they build their own uh, uh, clinical EHR system and that more has more space to innovate. And we are at 11.31. Uh, I did want to acknowledge Ian, uh, he had his hand up. Uh, if he had a quick last question. Yeah, uh, just quickly, you know, there's a health day and there's a computer science component. I was wondering if we'd ever consider a legal day and bringing on like law experts and law professors on like AI malpractice or uh, like the FDA regulatory policy. That's a great idea. We need to all bring them yeah. together. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, definitely uh, highlights the need for interdisciplinary yeah, teams. Definitely. Yeah, we're organizing this next year. So if you're interested, happy, I mean, happy, I look for volunteer and happy. It's a will be hybrid. And we already reserved at and Center for physical. It's an in-person location. So yeah, we talk about this health day. I'm happy to invite the lawyers and the you know, clinical doctors and the AI. All these people, they should meet together and 
have fun and drink and talk and chat and and the even design the design the design people also yes I, I congratulate everyone. You basically just spread my cross functional team. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank uh, Ian and Madeline who, who uh, put in a lot of work and uh, and help, helping to make this happen and, and a lot of work behind the scenes of making the the day the days flow very well. Uh, and then I want to thank uh, all of our speakers as well as the organizers. This has been an amazing two days. Yeah. Thank you guys. So, Thank you so all. much.